Uh, the message that we've heard from those folks was very clear. They need the government to work for them, not against them. These men and women have struggled with fractured supply chains, considerable input costs, uh, relentless inflation, natural disasters, volatile markets, and labor shortages, each consistently worsened by ill-conceived, half-baked executive action. In what seemingly is a daily occurrence, taxpayer dollars are being sent to every corner of the country, yet nothing has changed. We're not producing more fertilizer. We're not reducing the cost of production. We're not making food more affordable. However, we are burdening the taxpayer. We're losing ground on the world stage, and we are a net agricultural importer. We are less independent, less resilient, and less competitive. Now, Farm Bill is the best opportunity that exists to course correct. Now, I've been clear in my intent, Congress can and must craft a bipartisan Farm Bill that aligns the farm safety net with the needs of the producers, expands market access and trade promotion opportunities, strengthens program operations to demand transparency and accountability to the taxpayers, and helping our neighbors in need, but doing so without indiscriminate expansion of our nutri nutrition safety net. However, there remain significant headwinds to Congress's success. It is virtually impossible to create a robust and resilient farm safety net without significant investment. Considerable opportunities exist within our jurisdiction to not only fund the safety net, but fund a substantial number of shared bipartisan priorities. And I continue to implore my Democrat colleagues to think in earnest about these priorities, priorities that can be funded without cutting SNAP, a SNAP benefit or eliminating the important conservation programs that we've all come to appreciate. Washington, D.C. is filled with rhetoric and armchair pundits. People go out of their way to work against you. Folks think a farm bill is impossible. The politics will prevail, that politics will prevail over good policy, that the dysfunction surrounding us has consumed us. Every comment intensifies my commitment to the American farmer. I'm on your side. I'm your champion, and I will never stop fighting for you. And with that, I yield to my good friend and distinguished ranking member, Mr. Scott. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing today. And I certainly welcome our distinguished Secretary Vilsack. The very last time that Secretary Vilsack sat before this committee as a witness in March of last year, I spoke of beginning the farm bill process in earnest. Now, nearly a year later, we are still working towards our shared goal of passing a strong, effective, and bipartisan farm bill. And I hope that the testimony of Secretary Vilsack will provide our committee with the help in getting us closer to that shared goal. Changes in Republican leadership, potential government shutdowns, and the inability in past the Agriculture Appropriations Bill have each injected uncertainty into this process and unfortunately uh, slowed our work. I do not envy you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Chairman, you are doing what you can to navigate these turbulent waters. And uh, I want to give you credit. You've continued to meet and discuss policy priorities with me, with our House Agriculture Democrats, and our staff. And we appreciate that. To aid these efforts and reinforce that House Democrats want to get a farm bill done, we publish our farm bill priorities and our principles last week. Our principles should not surprise anyone who has been following the work of this committee. Our principles are this. We want to reduce hunger. Hunger is a serious problem in our nation. And we 
want to strengthen our American farmers. We're losing farms, particularly family farms, at a staggering rate. We want to invest in sustainable agriculture, revitalize rural America, lower costs for farmers and families, and improve equity. I know we can do this by working together because I know, uh, Chairman, we've been together for quite a while on this committee. And I know you care just as much as I do about our nation's farmers. And we work together on that, have been working together on that for many years. And I know we can do this by working together. So let's put aside, first and foremost, this proposal to cut SNAP benefits. Whether you call it a cut or a reduction of future benefits, Democrats oppose it. We will not cut SNAP. Now, I understand that my Republican colleagues are concerned about spending. Let me make a few points here. At least you are concerned about spending when it comes to SNAP. But because the economy has improved, benefits and need for the program has de Increased. The CBO is now expecting SNAP to cost $67 billion less over the next decade than originally expected. That's important as we go into this negotiation. Let's also put aside the proposal to take IRA conservation or energy funding away from its intended purpose. Robbing Peter to pay Paul is not going to result in an effective farm bill. These IRA programs are oversubscribed, so we should not take funding from them to pay for other farm bill priorities. We Democrats feel strongly about this. So let me close by saying that we do want a bipartisan bill. We want to see our bipartisan priorities funded, but we need to continue the funding process. We in agriculture, need more funding, but we need also to continue to work together to find that funding. Over the past 20 years, bipartisan farm bills have succeeded when Republicans and Democratic leadership made the farm bill a priority and provided outside resources to the Agriculture Committee. I think I look forward to hearing from you, Mr. Secretary, and to working with my colleagues and my good friend, <clears throat> Chairman Thompson, on building a bipartisan bill that strengthens our safety net programs for our farmers and the hungry families they feed. It's a tall task, but we're up to accomplishing it and we can do it together. And please pardon my call. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair would request that other members submit their opening statements for the record so our witness can begin his testimony and to ensure that there's ample time for questions. I'm very, <coughs> very pleased to welcome back to the committee our witness for today, USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack. Mr. Secretary, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're now going to proceed your testimony. You'll have 
five minutes, the timer in front of you will count down to zero, at which point your time has expired. Secretary Vilsack, please begin when you're ready. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much uh, to you and to the ranking member, uh, Representative Scott. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And thanks to all members of this committee for their service. Mr. Chairman, I read with interest a recent article that you published in AgriPulse entitled, It's Time to Get Serious About Revitalizing Rural America. Your opening comments today summarize that article. I thought it would be helpful uh, to perhaps put in context some of the information that I have that suggests that we are, in fact, serious about revitalizing rural America. First of all, let me begin by indicating that the last three years of net cash farm income were record setting. The best three years in the last 50 years in this country, this year's income projected at just below historical norms will make it the best four years in recent history. It's also allowed for our farmers to have significant liquidity uh, as they deal with challenging times. Our rural unemployment uh, rate is now at a lowest rate in 35 years. Our rural employment has returned to pre-pandemic levels uh, and the clean energy jobs are helping to lead the way. Rural poverty is down. And in fact, in 55 counties that historically were persistently poor are no longer in that category because of activities and work being done in those counties to improve economic opportunity. For the first time in 10 years, rural uh, populations have grown, more people coming into rural America than leaving. Real wage growth in 2023 exceeds inflation by nearly 2%. And speaking of inflation and food inflation, it's headed down. Grocery store price inflation year over year is at 1.3 percent, the lowest it's been since 2021. And our Economic Research Service predicts that food at home prices will, in fact, decrease in 2024. I have several concerns that I want to share with the, with the committee. They have to do with the loss of farmers and farms, the loss of farm land, and the heavy concentration of farm income. In 1981, then Senator, uh, uh, Secretary Bob Berglund raised concerns about the efforts and focus on production and its impact on the number of farms in this country. Since he raised that warning in 1981, we have lost 536,543 farms. We have lost over 165 million acres of farm land. Now to give you a sense of how many farmers that is, that's every farmer today in South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Iowa, North, uh, Nebraska, Colorado, and Oklahoma and Missouri. The farmland represents all the line mass of Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Maryland, and almost all of Virginia. Farm income has been extraordinarily concentrated with the top 7% of farms, those who generate more than $500,000 in sales on an annual basis over the last five years, getting 85% of the income, which meant that 93% of farms, nearly 2 million farms, had to share 15%. These are serious issues, and I think it's important for us to reset the notion that the only option in American agriculture is to get big or get out. It's time for us to do better for our small and mid-sized farming operations, those 93 percent that share 15 percent of income, that are surviving for the most part by taking a second job. I think we need to create for our farm families ways in which the farm, not the farmer, can create additional income. More new and better market opportunities and more income streams is a strategy that we are investing in at USDA. Climate smart agriculture and forestry commodities providing a value added opportunity as well as participation in ecosystem markets, a new income stream for farms. Sustainable aviation fuel and other bioproduct manufacturing from agricultural waste, creating another commodity opportunity. Renewable energy production, not only to lower costs, but also uh, to, uh, to assist rural electric cooperatives as they transition from fossil fuel based generation. New competitive meat and poultry markets with over 400 uh, investments already being made. And speaking of fertilizer, as you did in your comments, Mr. Sec uh, Mr. Chairman, I need to tell you that in four states we are in fact producing more fertilizer. Uh, in Florida, Missouri, Alabama, and Montana, there are four or 40 projects that we've invested in, construction underway in the other 36, and there'll be more coming. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, I acknowledge the importance of the Farm Bill, but I think we also need a budget. We need uh, the ability to utilize the Commodity Credit Corporation with flexibility, and we need to preserve the Inflation Reduction Act conservation funding. 
All of these are valuable tools in order to continue the momentum that's been building for markets, jobs, and better income for rural Americans and for our farm families. Secretary Vilsack, thank you for your important testimony today. At this time, members will be recognized for questions in the order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority members, and, <coughs> and in order of arrival for those who joined us after the hearing convened. Uh, you'll be recognized for five minutes each in order to allow us to get to as many questions as possible. And I will uh, recognize myself for five minutes. Um, <coughs> Mr. Secretary, um, I wanted to talk on a specific issue, a question, a specific issue to begin with um, that uh, fits in the topic of regulations and, and the costs that they impose on both farmers and consumers. So let's talk about Prop 12. Mr. Sec Secretary, you and I have discussed this issue. Preliminary data from a pending study at USDA's Office of the Chief Economist shows that prices of certain pork products have risen as much as 41% since the implementation of Proposition 12. A 2023 study found that the costs associated with Prop 12 are, quote, widespread and extensive, end quote. That same study expressed that, that um, quote, these costs have a more severe impact on smaller independent operations and that the stresses placed upon the entire production and marketing chain will lead to ever increasing consolidation and concentration of the industry, end quotes. Now, we appreciate that the Biden administration sided with the industry during the Supreme Court case. As we all know, the Supreme Court has weighed in on this matter and asked Congress to act. Uh, when thinking about the stated goals of this administration and your very own testimony to serve small producers, can you speak to the economic harms from Proposition 12? And quite frankly, if pork prices are going up for consumers and costs are going up for producers, who's winning here? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't want to take you all the way back in our history, but I'm going to uh, in response to your question to the Articles of Confederation. If you remember when we began as a republic, uh, we had basically a, a theory and, and structure that states would basically govern their own activities within their borders. Uh, what we found after uh, several years of that experiment was chaos. Uh, and I think, frankly, uh, that's where we are potentially headed. Uh, the reality is this, that w when each in a, uh, state has the ability to define for itself and for its consumers exactly what farming techniques or practices uh, are appropriate, it does create the possibility of 50 different sets of rules and regulations, uh, which obviously creates serious concerns for producers because they have no stability and they have no certainty. Uh, I'm not sure that this Congress uh, is going to be able to pass legislation um, with due respect, uh, but I would suggest that if we don't take this thing, uh, this issue seriously, we're going to have chaos in the marketplace uh, because there's nothing preventing any state from doing what California did. Now, why did the Supreme Court decide what they decided? They decided it because they they believed that each and every producer had its had their own uh, choice to participate in this market. Uh, they basically said it didn't uh, violate the Commerce Clause because it didn't discriminate against any particular producer. Well, the problem, I think, is that it didn't anticipate the, uh, the, uh, the impact of 12% of, of the market changing the rules on the entire market. And I think that there's, there's uh, risk of that occurring uh, all across the country. Uh, having said that, it is a little bit difficult, however, to, to create consistency within this Congress and within this country on this issue of states' rights. Because if you apply this standard, then you're going to have to, to discuss some of the more difficult issues, social issues, guns, abortion, et cetera. So I don't envy the Congress trying to figure this out. Uh, I will tell you, though, that if it doesn't figure it out, there's going to be chaos. Yeah, and I'm hearing from smaller producers, uh, larger producers who are prepared to go into that market have found that um, the volume that they prepared for uh, is not there in California. So they're dumping product into other states, crowding out small producers. There's a lot of implications. Mr. Secretary, in your testimony and comments around the country, you often lament about farms getting larger, about how many are forced to get big or get out. And I, I'll be frank, I too share this concern. 
but not because of the concentration of farm income amongst these operations, but because of the concentration of risk borne by these full-time family farms. They have been forced into achieving economies of scale to be able to survive or to grow large enough <coughs> for the next generation to have room to return to the family farm. Now, these farms might have more to gain when times are good, but they also have more to lose when times are bad, which is why we need to make sure the safety net works for them too. Unfortunately, you've taken upon yourself to utilize USDA to transform American agriculture through the unfettered use of the CCC or rewriting the rules on disaster aid programs to reorient assistance to small and part-time farmers at the expense of the full-time family farms. Truth is, much of the consolidation you lament is a direct result of costs that are constantly rising amid softening commodity prices, putting the squeeze on margins. And when I travel the country and talk to producers, many of the additional costs they are bearing are a direct result of the actions taken by this administration. Between Department of Labor rules that have made the H-2A program almost unworkable and driven up the cost of labor to EPA's war on crop protection tolls, or even the threat of financial regulations that will increase cost of banking, as the Biden administration is contributing to the expansion of these farming operations. Um, many decisions with the aim of transforming any sector of the American economy is not the role of unelected bureaucrats, Mr. Secretary, but rather those ideas should be debated in Congress and no amount of uh, tinkering around the edges at USDA will stop that. Seeing that my time has expired, um, uh, now recognize uh, Mr. Chairman, can I have a minute to respond to that? Uh, yes, sir. Please? First of all, you mentioned the CCC. I just want you to know that we have basically followed the charter that was established by Congress and the establishment of the CCC, and we have not, as it was the case the previous administration, jeopardized the capacity of that fund to be able to do its farm bill uh, payments. Secondly, you mentioned the uh, disaster assistance program. I would just simply say when we advised Congress that there was a 10 to $12 billion bill due to assist producers across the board for disasters in 2022, Congress appropriated $3 billion. You, you gave us 30 percent of what we needed. So we had a, a choice of basically doing it the way we did before when we had all the money and the resources to be able to cover all of the producers or provide an opportunity for 80 percent of the producers to receive slightly more. This included those family farmers you just talked about. So uh, if I had to do it over again, I would do it the same way because I think it's helpful to help those smaller producers. Why? Because they didn't receive the lion's share of the $19 billion of identification that was paid through crop insurance and other, other mechanisms. So uh, with all due respect, if you want the disaster programs to work, then we have to have the resources to be able to do what you want us to do, which is to keep make everybody whole. And Mr. Secretary, I appreciate that. And as of, in our, you know, the great times that we've spent meeting together, um, I'll just reinforce what I've said before, work with us on those issues. I can't control what happened uh, in the past. I couldn't even control what happened in 2022, uh, but I did have more, more opportunity today as chairman. So um, with that, I recognize the ranking member for his questions. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Thompson. I really appreciate that. Um, Secretary Vilsack, uh, both my Democratic and Republican colleagues certainly want to pass a bipartisan farm bill. Um, and the year's extension is giving us more time to work out our differences, and we are negotiating through those now. But uh, I know that Chairman Thompson and I feel the same about this. We definitely want a bipartisan farm bill. I hear from my nation's farmers quite regularly that they want and need certainty. They want and they need new markets. And in that regard, I want to thank you for creating RAP. And RAP means regional, agricultural, promotion programs. It helps our commodities farmers, um, um, and certainly it helps um, groups like our soybean farmers and others to be able to navigate the challenges we are facing today. 
And for those of you who may be listening to this hearing across the nation, Secretary Vilsack, could you share with us and the nation your thoughts on this? Why a bipartisan bill passed this year is very vital and very important and why it's got to be done. Uh, well, Representative Scott, uh, I think it's fair to say that every farmer, every rancher, and, and everyone who lives in rural America uh, depends in large part on uh, uh, the Farm Bill programs. Uh, a Farm Bill is more than that. Uh, it's a rural development bill. It's a conservation bill. It's a nutrition bill. It's a research bill. Uh, it's a trade bill. Uh, it's a risk management bill. Uh, it is a broad uh, opportunity to say to rural America and to the, uh, American agriculture uh, that we care, uh, that we're investing in their future, and we're providing stability. The failure to have a farm bill uh, creates uncertainty, and that uncertainty makes it very difficult for producers to make decisions about their operations, to decide whether or not they're going to diversify their crop, to decide whether or not they're going to take advantage of new crop insurance. By the way, we've had uh, 12 new policies and 50 new modifications to crop insurance just in the last three years. Um, do they take advantage of those or not? Uh, it's very difficult for land-grant universities, minority-serving institutions that rely uh, on the direction of the Farm Bill and the research title to know whether or not uh, they can move forward with critical research, which obviously will impact and affect mm -hmm. things. Uh, it's difficult for those in the Chamber of Commerce and Economic Development uh, uh, offices across the counties uh, to know whether or not they need to plan for new opportunities. I mean, it, the bottom line is right. you've got to get it done. Let me uh, uh, get to another question that's very important. Mr. Vilsack, I know you testified to your commitment to getting IRA dollars out the door so our farmers in rural communities can benefit from these investments. And I want to applaud you for those efforts and dedication. But can you give us an update on where things stand? 99.8% of the money obligated, uh, that was set out in the IRA for 2023 was obligated. Uh, EQIP, uh, 2,812 landowners received contracts, nearly 8,000 applications. Uh, the research or the easement program, uh, 69 producers received assistance, 250 applications. Yeah, my uh, time is getting a bit short here. Let me also ask you, did you meet your spending goals last year? Absolutely, because the goal was to get the money out the door. And uh, are you on target to spend all you have planned for this year? Yes, because the demand is there. And are you still hiring more staff, or has a hiring a plateaued? plateaued? Be because of the money and resources in the IRA, we're able to continue to uh, increase NRCS, over 1,500 new people working at NRCS, and we've expanded through technical assistance, cooperative agreements, additional help, help and assistance. Thank you, and I just want to personally thank you for the great work you've done with me and many other members on this committee in making sure our 1890s student scholarship program is now permanent and it passed in a very strong bipartisan way into the Farm Bill and we're making that scholarship permanent. Hopefully that addresses some of the concerns that you expressed about making sure that we have farmers for generations to come. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Now recognize the distinguished gentleman, uh, the chairman emeritus from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, for five minutes. Which is a polite way of saying the old guy. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Secretary. And kind of in that role, you've had an outstanding career too. You've been secretary, what, 10 of the last 14 years? Going That's on 11. Going on 11, that's pretty amazing to have been around that long in what sometimes is a challenging agency, uh, directing policy. So your imprint is in a lot of places, and I'm impressed and I congratulate you for that. 
And I know that every administration is different. The Obama administration is certainly different than the Trump administration. And in some ways, the Biden administration is different even than the Obama or Trump administration. But that said, Mr. Secretary, it's always been clear to me that the strongest policies that come out of this committee and the most important programs administered by USDA are built on the belief that support and relief programs must be tied to crop production. When this committee uh, or your agency stray from that principle, we begin to walk down an unsustainable and a very concerning path. When you last appeared before this committee, I raised concerns about your agency's design and implementation of phase two of the emergency relief program for 2021 crop year and called for a return to the EP ERP phase one mythology. You said that your agency would learn from their experiences during the first iteration of ERP and would factor it into the administration of the next. Well, based on the reports that I'm hearing from my producers in Oklahoma, ERP 2022 has proven to be no better than its predecessor at delivering support to those who suffered the greatest crop losses. So my question to you today is exactly where those lessons your agency learned from the administration of 2021 ERP program uh, what were those lessons, and how did it change the approach in 2022? And while you're thinking about that as a follow-up, uh, what has your agency learned from ERP 2022 rollout, and what are some of the changes that we can expect to see in future programs administered? Well, one change would be for Congress to give us the resources we asked for. I mean, when you give us 30 percent of what we asked for, when we tell you that the, the damages are 10 to 12 billion dollars, and you basically appropriate $3 billion, you put us in a tough spot. But, Mr. Secretary, when you change the program so that you screw up the delivery and screw up the 30 percent, it, it makes it difficult it, to come it, back and ask for the other 70. It, it didn't screw up uh, at all. In fact, 82 percent of producers received more assistance and help than they would have based on what uh, you've articulated. But my producers back home who actually raise the food and fiber that feed the country, who put the resources on the shelf that the federal credit cards, the SNAP program benefits by tell me the resources are not going to production it's where the losses were. That's not true. That is not true. In fact, I, I'll be happy to provide you the specific numbers of, per, uh, of producers in your state that received benefits in major commodity production. But Mr. Secretary, is the goal to give resources to address the disasters by following production or is the goal to pick out who's actually farming so that those of a preferred uh, category in the rules benefit more from disaster relief than others? Well, Representative, you can't basically cherry pick one program. You have to look at it in the totality. When you look at all of the resources that your producers received, including the crop insurance payments, the majority of which went to the people you're talking about, which is a very small subset of the producers that we're talking about. So I'm, I know, I'm, Mr. I Secretary, we, what my producers are telling me. Let's change subjects for just a moment. I uh, understand that there's discussion about USDA's direct and guaranteed loan programs, so that there's been some discussion that Congress should, for the first time, authorize the conversion of guaranteed loans to direct loans based primarily on a decision by the Secretary that such loans are distressed. What would your approach be to ensuring that such conversions would be, I'll say, rare and limited? Well, I can assure you that we're going to, whatever we do with this uh, effort will, will not jeopardize the, the financial stability of, uh, of our loan portfolio. But the tradition of this committee and policy has been that the guaranteed loans caused financial uh, institutions to put skin in the game, that there was potentially a higher standard and a greater degree of, of potential success in the programs by going the guaranteed route as opposed to direct loans. If we simply shift bad direct loans, or, sorry, bad guaranteed loans over direct loans, one, we're bailing out banks, and two, uh, we're disincentivizing being cautious and prudent loan officers. Well, I think the goal of any effort would be to try to keep farm, farmers on the land. I think that's the key here. We're not trying to kick folks off the land. We want to keep them on the land, if we'd all possible. But Mr. Secretary, we should not create situations where people will not be able to succeed and fail. That's a terrible thing fair, to do to fair, folks. Fair enough, but, I, but that's not who we're talking about. Yield back, Mr. Sec Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Costa, for five minutes questioning. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, um, ranking member and uh, members of the committee. Uh, Mr. Secretary, it's always good to have you here. Um, and uh, clearly, uh, 
we're focused on the reauthorization of the Farm Bill we do every five years. Um, it equals uh, a reestablishment of our priorities uh, in terms of ensuring that uh, America's safety net for the production of food and fiber with farmers, ranchers, dairymen, and women, and our farm workers, as well as those who are food insecure, uh, benefit from that safety net. Um, let me just speak that in California, obviously, a large, the largest agricultural state, where over half the nation's of fruits and nuts and vegetables are produced, 20% of the dairy products, 400 different commodities, this farm bill is critical and it's important. We must get this done this year. Investments made, though, uh, in the previous uh, Congress, I think, are critical to note. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Inflation Reduction Act are all key funding methodologies that help America's agriculture economy. In California, uh, as an example, over $1.15 billion for improved water storage. Uh, in the San Joaquin Valley, $500 million to prepare aging dams and ensure safety. $1 billion for rural, rural water projects. $56 million for regional conservation partnership programs. But I want to talk about uh, specifically, Mr. Secretary, the importance of these investments. Um, uh, I've heard that uh, the previous president, who's running uh, again, uh, if reelected, wants to impose 10 percent tariffs across the board and 60 percent tariffs on Chinese goods. Uh, given our importance of exporting pro uh, agricultural products, I think this will just go back to resulting in a, a trade war. I, would you care to comment on this? and the impending impacts? Well, I don't think there's any question that uh, the last time tariffs were assessed and the way they were assessed, it caused great stress in the countryside, uh, significant impact on the market. 30% uh, of our uh, product is, is uh, sold, sold in exports, and a significant percentage of that goes to China. Well, and everybody has leverage when you start a tariff war. I'm sorry, what? Everybody has leverage when you start a tariff war. Well, and absolutely, and that's one of the reasons why the CCC was drained. Right. You basically $45 billion under the previous administration. I think you've spent $15 billion by comparison. Right? Correct. That's correct. Let me move on to the disaster relief. You talked about 30 percent and the supplemental appropriations. Um, what would you like us to do going forward? Because the $2.8 billion, or you said $3 billion in disaster aid, obviously didn't uh, cover the disasters in 2023. What recommendation uh, would you make uh, for the future budget and the reauthorization of the Farm Bill? Uh, two recommendations. One, adequately and fully fund uh, disaster assistance if it's ad hoc. Two, I, I think- That's the bottom line, isn't it? Well, it's a lot of money, but it's, 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 it's important to but me. But if you want to provide the disaster relief, you've got to provide the funding. That's correct. That's correct. You have to, you have to provide the full, force, the full money. And then secondly, I think it is important to have a conversation about how to create a, a structure and system that is more, uh, less ad hoc and more permanent uh, from a disaster assistance program. I think, that, Mr. Chairman, I think you are interested in doing that, and I think there is some uh, logic and some reason for, uh, for, for that discussion. And the Inflation Reduction Act, and I believe that those uh, monies have gone for good purposes uh, under the Natural Resources Conservation Services, as you pointed out, to a number of programs that, frankly, are oversubscribed. But there is some talk about taking those funds and putting them for other purposes. Uh, what would uh, the administration's view be on that, uh, on the farm reauthorization measure? We feel very strongly that you've got to maintain those resources because of the demand and because the, the resources that are available to all farms not to a subset of our, uh, American agriculture. It's important for us to continue to invest in conservation, and it's very, very uh, evident that the uh, countryside wants these resources because, as you indicated, they are significantly oversubscribed. Uh, you know, oftentimes under the USDA, the uh, forest title gets, I think, overlooked with climate change and the impacts of fires throughout uh, the West. Uh, the importance of reauthorization of the Farm Bill and addressing the hazardous fuels reduction, um, and we have a bipartisan bill uh, that would, uh, would save our sequoias. Uh, what, what's your focus on how we uh, deal with this challenge that we have in forests across the country? The Congress made a good down payment in the bipartisan infrastructure law, which is allowing us to focus on hazardous fuel reduction in the West in particular. But we need to but do it's more. A down payment, you need, to, you need to continue to fund that effort. Okay, my time's expired. There's an issue on climate smart partnerships, and I want you to continue to focus on that. It benefits a lot of individual uh, folks that are participating in that climate smart effort. 
I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. Now recognize Mr. Austin Scott from Georgia for five minutes questioning. Secretary Vilsack, uh, you were the secretary in 2010, correct? Yes, sir. And in 2010, SNAP was approximately 67% of USDA funding and 33% of USDA funding went to other sources, whether it be farming, commodity production, or conservation. Is that correct? I don't have those specific numbers, but I'm sure that you, you do, Congressman, so I'll acknowledge well, you. Well, thank you. And so, as I understand it today, and I expect you will have these numbers, that approximately 80% would go to SNAP and approximately 20% would go to all of the other expenditures of the USDA. Is that correct? I, I don't know whether that's correct or not, Congressman, but I'll- You're I'll kidding me. The sake of this conversation- You're the Secretary of Agriculture and you don't know what the pie chart of your budget I, looks like? I don't know like? specific, I know that there is a significant percentage of our budget is focused on, on nutrition assistance of a multitude of different programs. It's not just SNAP, it's also WIC, it's, it's the school lunch program, it's the assistance to food banks. I, I'm talking about food and nutritional programs being 80%. Okay, well that's more than SNAP. And food and nutritional programs were included in the 67% before. Okay. Okay, but you understand what I'm getting at? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So, so that leaves 20% instead of 33% for conservation, production, agriculture, all of the other things that the USDA does. Just simple math. Less than 10%, of your total USDA funding now is gonna to go to production agriculture. Is that correct? Uh, Congressman, I don't know if that's correct or not. What's the point? What do you, what, 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 just get to your Well, my question for you is, what, do you, what percentage of what you receive at the USDA should actually go to production agriculture? My, my point is, you talk about the loss of the family farm. Well, starving farmers don't get to plant the food to feed hungry people. Well, the reality is uh, it's not about planting food. We, we are doing a great job of that. American farms, uh, farmers are the best in the world at that. We've seen a remarkable increase in productivity with inputs basically maintaining, uh, and actually there's a well, wonderful Secretary, chart. Let me, let me read, let me read right something here. to you from a- It shows a, productivity. Uh, well, let me, it's my time, so let me read this to you from a good, good farmer. This isn't someone that inherited. This is someone who built their own family farm. This year reminds me a lot of the early 1980s. I had a bit more optimism in my 20s than in my 60s, making plans on which piece of land to sell off and get stable for the bumpy ride for agriculture. We had record this income the last three years, Congressman. We had record income, and but the problem no, is sir, you did the not. income was concentrated. 21 and 22 were good, but 23 was bad. You no, lost it, over it, the 23 was, number. No, 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 it was not bad. It was actually above the historic average. The three it years was a significant total, fall best, off. Best three years in 50 years, for sure. Best, I think the best years from a net cash income ever. So, Secretary Vilsack, have you talked to any farmers I about how much fertilizer costs, have, about how much sir. diesel costs, about the, the cost of land rent because of net what you've done with solar subsidies and everything farm else? income, highest ever. Highest ever. The problem is it's concentrated in the hands of the large operators. And I've got nothing against production agriculture and large operators. We need them. The question is, what are we doing about Secretary the other percent Secretary Vilsack, approximately 90% of the food supply comes from, from about 10% of the farms uh, in this country. I don't country. think that's quite accurate, but go ahead. Well, what would you say was accurate with it? Uh, I think it's uh, in the neighborhood of 85% or so. 85% then comes from 10% 10, 10 of the farms. That's 85% of the food supply for the American citizens. And they now, now you're... Your president and your vice president don't seem to mind being dependent on foreign sources of energy, but I can assure you the American citizens don't want to be dependent on foreign sources of food. Congressman, we don't. President and and we're importing president. more wow. food than we ever have in this country. We're producing, more, <laughs> we're producing more oil than any other country in the world. What are you talking about? We're importing more food. We're oh, importing you, no, more no, no, food. No, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Than we let's ever be, have in this let's country. Let's be clear about this. Let's be clear about what we're importing, okay? The major driver of the imports, horticulture. Horticulture, okay? We're importing more food than we ever have in the We're importing it because we like to have choice all year long. It's not that we are importing it because we need it to feed ourselves. Secretary Vilsack, you can justify the actions it's all you true. want to. It's have you been to the grocery store lately? Absolutely. 
what does food cost today versus, versus what it did before the American Rescue Plan and the Inflation Reduction Act, as you call it? Well, the, the good news is, and I, I, I alluded to it. There is no good news there. It's uh, food inflation is down. Grocery store price inflation year over year is 1.3 percent, the lowest it's been in tw since 2021. And ERS predicts that it's going to be uh, decreased this year. In if it falls another 25 percent, it'll be back where it was before y'all got there. The gentleman's time has expired. Now, please recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. McGovern. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. You know, I don't think it's a radical idea to want a farm bill that uh, supports small and medium-sized farms, that supports conservation. Uh, and I don't think it's a radical idea to insist on a farm bill uh, that doesn't increase hunger uh, in America. And let me just say to the gentleman who just spoke, we can support our farmers and hungry families at the same time. This is not an either-or situation. Uh, and I'm grateful, Mr. Secretary, to you and to Deputy Under Undersecretary Dean for all that you have done to improve food security in this country, especially when it comes to improving food security for kids over summer months and making school meals healthier and more accessible, which is good for our kids and is good for our farmers. And by the way, will save us a lot of money in health care costs down the road. My Republican friends complain about the cost of some of these programs. They don't talk about the savings and avoidable health care costs that result uh, by investing in these nutrition programs. So we can save money uh, by doing this. Uh, I also uh, want to um, associate myself with the remarks of the ranking member, uh, Mr. Scott, uh, and his comments uh, on SNAP. The bottom line is the benefit, let's be honest, is inadequate. Um, you know, and, and, and in the, we want a bipartisan farm bill, but what my, my Republican friends are proposing would cut SNAP by $30 billion and then prevent future increases. You know, let me, a little bit of a history lesson here. Before the pandemic, SNAP on average was about $1.40 per person per meal. Then the pandemic came and Mr. Secretary, you, thankfully, using your authority that Congress asked you to use, uh, and plus some emergency benefits, it was bumped up to about $2.40 on average per person per meal. Then some of these emergency benefits uh, expired and now it's down to about $2.08 uh, per person per meal. You know, everywhere I go, uh, I am told uh, by organizations that deal with people who are food insecure, it is not enough. It's not enough to be able to put healthy food, nutritious food on the table. And yet my friends here are advocating not only a cut, but preventing any future updates in terms of increases. It doesn't make any sense to me. You know, I would say to my Republican friends that you are barely hanging on to your majority by your fingernails. Um, you know, look at the results of last night's election in New York. Your majority has been ineffective, uh, and what you are doing and what you are advocating is highly unpopular. Uh, people do not want you to follow uh, MAGA extremists off a cliff. They want to, you to focus on helping struggling families uh, instead to be able to put nutritious food on the table. They want us to work together on a farm bill that supports our farmers and supports struggling families. And yet what we are seeing here is what we have seen on almost every piece of legislation that has come before this House, uh, a, a, a move to the extreme when it comes to programs that benefit the most vulnerable. Now, Mr. Secretary, um, some on this committee complained uh, that you increased uh, SNAP benefits during the pandemic. Um, I, I don't think anyone uh, here, I don't think, truly believes that SNAP benefits should be based on the cost of a food plan that would now be 50 years old. Can you explain why you reevaluated the thrifty food plan? Did you just decide that on your own, or did Republicans and Democrats in Congress tell you to do that? Uh, in the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, the direction from Congress was uh, that USDA was to consider uh, cost-conscious, healthy diets uh, for families on low and moderate income. They specifically directed us to use the following. Current dietary guidance, consumption patterns, food composition data, and current food prices. Uh, we essentially followed that to the T. We used a scientific process in calculating the impact and effect on the Thrifty Food Plan base foundation for SNAP, and we concluded that it required an increase. And, and, and what would the theoretical impacts be to holding the thrifty food plan to the cost of the, 21, uh, the 2021 plan for another 20, 30, 40 years? You'd eventually have a food plan that did, did not adequately meet the need of 
families who are struggling yeah. financially. I mean, my, my friends complain about the cost of groceries uh, at, the, at the supermarket, and yet they are advocating policies that will make it more difficult for people to be able to afford those groceries. This doesn't make sense. Uh, investing in these programs, and again, I, I applaud you for your leadership on this, investing in these nutrition programs are not only the right thing to do because we should care about people, all people, not just those with deep pockets, uh, but it will also save our healthcare system a boatload of money uh, uh, in, the, in the future, also help our farmers. And I, I thank you for your leadership and I yield back my time. I thank the gentleman from Massachusetts. I, uh, before I recognize uh, Ms. Crawford, I do want to submit for the record um, a document that uses the CBO scores on exactly what's being proposed with providing uh, Article I um, direction in terms of uh, completing a thrifty food plan evaluation consistent with, with how it's been done in the past except for this, this past time. Um, and this CBO's records, it shows the benefits level. Um, it, quite frankly, uh, there is no intent to cut current benefits and this talks about uh, if that proposal would go forward, what the benefits would be in the future. Well, Mr. Now, Chairman, we should do a whole hearing on that because we respectfully disagree with your conclusion. Well, uh, this is CBO's yeah. oh, conclusion. Yeah. Um, I'm not, uh, I, you know, I'm not making things up. Um, you know, uh, you, uh, the facts are the facts. Um, and so I'll submit this, be willing to share this with any member that would like to have a personal copy of it as well. And now please recognize the gentleman from Arkansas, the land of rice and ducks, <laughs> Mr. Crawford for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. How often do you interact with the President's Council of Economic Advisors? I'm sorry, how often? How often do you interact with that council? Uh, I actually, I interacted with the chair yesterday. Really? Yes. I, I would suggest that y'all probably aren't singing from the same hymnal because you just said that inflation was on a downward trajectory when in fact the Council of Economic Advisors just said that grocery stores are actually causing inflation to increase and that, that, that was a statement that as recently as uh, February 1st. In fact, here's an article I'm happy to share with you. Biden takes aim at <laughs> grocery chains over food prices. So it says here, President Biden has begun to accuse stores of overcharging shoppers as food costs remain a burden for consumers and a political problem for the president. He coined the phrase, I don't know that he coined it, but he used the phrase shrinkflation to describe how packaging um, basically smaller portions in a bag charging the same price for uh, is, is having an impact on prices at the grocery store as well. So, uh, you know, these, these, these accusations and charges and things of this nature about the evil Republicans just don't hold water. I think probably you should go revisit the Council of Economic Advisors and maybe I'll get on the same page because we're hearing mixed messages now from you and we're, from the Council of Economic Advisors. There wasn't a question there, Secretary. Um, <clears throat> last year when you testified before the committee, I asked you about the adverse effect wage rate. And you mentioned at the time that you preferred a solution for the AEWR was to pass the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. And we all know that the bill had significant issues that were unrelated to the, ag, uh, to the adverse effect wage rate that are that kept it from becoming law. So I don't think that was necessarily the answer to the problem. So since you were here last year, my friend Mr. Davis and I have been uh, uh, leading the Agriculture Labor Working Group. Um, we've been hearing from everyone and everyone has, has talked about, I'm talking, when I say everyone, I'm talking about stakeholder groups, ag employers across the country that have come in to, to share their concerns. And the prevailing sentiment was that the adverse effect wage rate continues to be a huge problem. It's an impediment to the efficient functioning of the H-2A program. Georgia, for example, has seen a more than 20% increase in the uh, AEWR in the last two years, completely unsustainable. So do you agree that Congress needs to reform AEWR in such a way as to ensure predictable and sensible, wa sensible wage levels for H-2A employers? I think it makes sense for Congress to, if there are problems with the Farm Worker Modernization Act, to, do, to fix that and pass it because it would create stability, it would create a range, it would create a predictability in the system. Um, let me ask you this, I'm changing subject real quick here. As you know, in many USDA programs, especially in rural development, there are costly and time-consuming environmental processes that ultimately end in the project being a categorical exclusion from NEPA. The current system is a barrier to entry to potential borrowers, lenders, and grantees to participate in the system. And when they do, they often spend much time and money to meet paperwork requirements. All of it keeps funds from being deployed in rural America. 
Um, the Department of Energy has already issued rules to make charging stations and solar projects categorically excluded within the DOT and the Department of Homeland Security then adopted for their departments. My question is what, what steps is USDA taking to implement the statutory categorical exclusions listed in the Fiscal Responsibility Act, specifically loan guarantees, and if no action has been taken yet, when can we expect actions to be taken by USDA to implement those provisions? We use categorical uh, exclusions uh, on a regular basis in our programs. When there's an opportunity to use it, we do use it. I'm particularly uh, aware of how often we use it in the Forest Service in order to move processes along. Okay. Eighty-five percent of the activities that we've done in our Forest Service the last three years have used CE. So we're not um, opposed to using it. We actually look for opportunities to use it. Oh, I hope that's true because I have some um, constituents that are highly concerned with that. Let me shift gears again. Hopefully um, I can get an answer on this question. Uh, your comments last month, you said, quote, here's the problem. Reference prices help a subset of farmers, end quote. These comments worry many of farmers across the district, across my district and across the country at uh, putting in the hard work of feeding and clothing the world. And to be clear, when I say farmers in this context, I mean those who are producing our food and fiber at scale. You focused a lot of your attention on climate. But, but when you talk about farmers, you, you often talk about USDA's role in protecting what I would call more hobby farmers. These are folks I certainly care about, and I don't believe they should be completely ignored by USDA programs, but many of them are not full-time farmers or truly dependent on income from the farm to keep them financially afloat. And alone, our country and the world can't be dependent on their output, which is less than 20% of all agriculture production. You acknowledged that earlier in your statement. So my time's run out, but um, I, I will yield back. Gentleman's time's expired. Now I recognize the gentlelady from Virginia, Mrs. Bamberger, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for being here. I come from Virginia, where our number one private industry is agriculture. Um, and I had a bit of a visceral reaction when the gentleman talked about hobby farmers and those who don't make farming their full-time income, um, because I represent so many of those farmers, and the reason that farming may not be their full-time income is because they can't afford to do it. We have small generational family farms that frankly, many of the conservation programs have helped the farmers I represent save and make more productive. And I'll give a specific example. I was out visiting a farm in Caroline County and a farmer said he has a thousand acres of cereal rye and he did a test dig, this is last year, and they found rye roots seven feet deep. And that was after 34 days without rain. He said that cover crop usage and their use of no-till practices, the cover crop land never gave up an inch. His soil is rich. His ability to produce on that land is made possible, according to the farmer, by his usage of conservation programs that are made possible because of these federal programs. So I'm grateful that you are here to speak to a whole variety of issues, um, and I am proud that we were able to invest in conservation programs at USDA through the Inflation Reduction Act, because in fact we know that there are so many more farmers like the one I just mentioned who want to participate in these programs that lower input costs, increase their bottom line, and make farming possible in communities like those that I represent, uh, but so many are turned away because of lack of funding. So I'm pleased to see that according to new USDA report on funding uh, on IRA implementation, Virginia has already received nearly $8 million in funding that goes directly to farmers across our Commonwealth who want them to cre increase their productivity, improve wildlife habitats, improve air and water quality, and help farmers stay farmers. So could you please elaborate on USDA's progress in getting IRA conservation dollars to farmers and producers, and specifically, has the law helped these programs meet, reach more producers? Well, clearly, uh, the answer to your question is yes. It's obviously increased uh, uh, the reach of the programs. Uh, there is still great, a great deal to do. We've increased the number of people working at NRCS. We've entered into cooperative agreements so that we have a broader reach so that uh, uh, those who, who might not be able to understand their uh, qualify for the program are finding out about the program, we're assisting and guiding them into participating. 
And let me just simply say that roughly 85 to 88 percent of farmers in this country today require off-farm income mm -hmm. to be able to keep the farm. So with all due respect, it's not about hobby farmers. It's about folks who love what they're doing and frankly would like to be able to do more of it, but they don't have the income streams that support it. So they have to have an off-farm job. And to me, the key here is creating opportunities for that farm to generate more revenue. You mentioned cover crops. That's an opportunity potentially for that farm to qualify for ecosystem service market payments. Yes. So now instead of just a crop, they're going to get an environmental payment. There are a multitude of other strategies here that we're investing in, and conservation and investments in conservation are critically important to allowing those income streams to, uh, to occur. And that's what I hear time and time again from the producers I represent. Um, so in that vein, how can Congress continue supporting USDA whether through statutory flexibility, you mentioned additional staffing. What else needs to happen to expedite these funds getting out the door? Well, first, a budget that doesn't require us to cut staff. Secondly, maintaining the IRA funding. And, and sir, you said it before, but could you just remind everyone, how much staff does it, do you have to cut because of the budget challenges? Well, the House budget uh, appropriation, ag, ag appropriations talked about an 18% cut to our budget, so you can do the math. Yes, thank you. Please continue. Yeah. So maintain the IRA funding. Let's have, get a budget, pass a farm bill, so there's certainty in, in terms of the programs. Um, and, you know, I think to a certain extent, continue to support our efforts on the Climate Smarts because that's also tied to the conservation uh, activities and programs. We saw tremendous demand for that and tremendous interest in it. And just in closing, uh, related to some of the challenges at the grocery store, I received a message uh, from a, a darling constituent who's speaking of our extraordinary country said, I for one still find it amazing that you can buy a pineapple in January for $1.29 on sale at the grocery store. Truly an incredible country. Thank you for serving this incredible country. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. General Lay yields back. Now I'll recognize Dr. Desjardins from Tennessee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Secretary Vilsack. Thank you for always coming and, and visiting with us. Um, with the record influx of illegal crossings at the southern border, I was wondering what steps you're uh, taking to mitigate a potential strain on the SNAP program. Well, people coming across the border aren't qualified for SNAP and aren't participating in SNAP. Uh, from the USDA Food Nutrition Service SNAP policy on non-citizen eligibility, uh, it says non-citizens eligible with no waiting period. And there's about 13, but I'll just read a few. Qualified alien children under 18 years of age. So anyone under 18 qualifies without a waiting period. Refugees admitted under Section 207. Victims of trafficking and uh, trafficking victims under the Act of 2000, and unfortunately there's a lot of them. Asylees under Section 208. And I mean, you'd have to agree that almost everyone coming into the country is either seeking refugee status, asylum status, or under 18. So how can you say that this is not going to put a, st a strain because, on the SNAP program? Because the fact that they're seeking asylum doesn't mean that they qualify. They have to be granted asylum. We have 42 million people on SNAP. Now we've had roughly 10 million crossing over, most of them seeking asylum. That will come due. So as we plan a five-year farm bill, we need transparency in order to make sure people are taken care of. The, there, there's the been a shortfall this down, year sir. in in uh, in funding for the SNAP program. The there's been fraud that if you if you go to social media, you gotta love social media. I did it this morning. I said, what is the fraud rate uh, in the SNAP program? And the very first thing that pops up says 1.5 percent. Then I go to the past year, and I'd like to introduce this into the record uh, as unanimous consent. This article from The Hill in September of uh, 23 says, fraud is gobbling up one-fifth of SNAP benefits. Congress must act to stop it. That 1.5% is 11.5%, 10% or 10 times more than what we're led to believe if you read social media. So I'm not trying to be confrontational, Mr. Secretary, and we've had lively discussions in this committee that you know Republicans apparently don't care about people who care about food hungry. We do. I'm just saying that to plan this effectively, we need to address these issues. They're real. You can say that people don't receive SNAP benefits, but your own uh, 
USDA says that they do, and you can say the fraud is low, but those numbers are not correct, and that was exposed I, I, this year. I, I, I'm not, no, uh, let, let's be clear about this. Uh, I am saying that people who are not here legally are not allowed to or participating in SNAP. I will acknowledge that we have work to do on fraud, but I will tell you, it is our partners who have work to do. It's the states who administer these programs. It's the states that we're encouraging them to get back uh, to, in, uh, to interviewing folks. States are resisting that. I just sent, recently sent a letter to a number of governors encouraging them to do a better job of overseeing this program. So I agree with you that we need to make sure that we're keeping an eye uh, on, on fraudulent activities. I'm, I'm just afraid hungry Americans are are not going to receive the benefits they need if we don't address this issue. It's real. I've been imploring different agencies, including USDA, to get real numbers and transparency. I hope that some of my letters and questions will be answered. kind of want to finish on a funner note. Um, we, we've talked about walking horse industry in Tennessee before, you and I, and, and uh, it's my understanding that the, you know, the, the, there is a proposed rule that's uh, currently being reviewed uh, by OMB. and. Uh, you know, we'd hope that the past tax supporters and the industry could come to agreement on how to best move forward, but now, you know, uh, that's not really the impact. I'm curious, have you ever been to the Walking Horse Celebration in Shelbyville? I've not been to the... To okay. The um, th this summer, Chairman Thompson and uh, he's left Rep. Jonathan Jackson joined John Rose and I at the stable, and, and I think it's fair to say not to put words in the Chairman's mouth. He was a skeptic, probably a past tax supporter, or maybe Jonathan too. But uh, they had a really great experience, and uh, they inspected for themselves. They both rode walking horses, and uh, the walking horses could handle both of these guys, and, and uh, they're pretty big fellows. So I would love to invite you down, let you go for a ride. It's really smooth. I, th I think you'll smile as big as the chairman did. And I, I know that uh, the celebration will be coming this summer, so I'd like to give you a standing invitation to join us. Come look at it for yourself. Uh, you know, thoroughbreds were dropping dead on the tracks at all three major races at the, the Preakness, the Belmont, and the Kentucky Derby. I've never seen a walking horse drop dead, and the past act is just that. It's living in the past. There was problems years ago. They've been corrected, and I'd love for you to come and see it and see what a wonderful industry this is. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and I'd have to say it's a pretty smooth ride, actually. Large animal with little intimidating to crawl on, but it was a good ride. Uh, now, uh, please to recognize Dr. Carveo from Colorado for five minutes questioning. Uh, thank you, Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Scott uh, for hosting today's hearing. Um, in particular, given that it's been, I think, six months since we were in this room, um, six months of delay because of the dysfunction um, and Congress's inability to do its very basic jobs um, and that interfering with incredibly important discussions um, that producers and consumers and I think all of our districts have been waiting for us to have, in particular around the uh, Farm Bill. And so thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here this morning. As you know, Congress did make incredible investments. Um, in the Inflation Reduction Act before the 118th to expand uh, clean energy in rural America. We appreciate your work um, and your listening to rural Americans when designing the USDA programs. I know in Colorado, I have heard overwhelming interest in the IRA rural energy programs, which include REAP, PACE, and the Empowering Rural America Program, or New Era. These grant programs represent jobs and economic growth in my district, um, and I was very uh, pleased to see recently projects in Platteville and Longmont selected uh, for the um, New Era program. Because of the popularity of these programs, the reality is that they are dramatically oversubscribed, as we've heard today. New Era, for example, is four times oversubscribed, which I believe shows how important this program is to electric cooperatives across the country country, regardless of politics, and how important it is for our cooperatives to see this kind of long overdue investment. Um, it's great to see uh, the, the, this and to highlight the excitement of rural co-ops co across the country. So Mr. Secretary, for New Era, can you share an update on how we might see applications start to move forward in the process? Uh, we're in the process of uh, completing the uh, evaluation of uh, approximately 70 projects of the number that was submitted. As you indicated, it was uh, a very popular program and oversubscribed uh, in an effort to try to determine uh, which of these programs are, are feasible from a technical standpoint and from a financial standpoint. Once those uh, evaluations are done, uh, those projects will be ranked, uh, and then we'll basically compare those rankings to the resources that are available 
uh, and begin a more detailed uh, conversation uh, to, to uh, assert whether or not, in fact, the, the project is, is, is worthy of, of commitment. I think our goal is to try to get awards sometime later this year. In the meantime, we're aggressively promoting the REAP program, uh, over 5,000 REAP grants already awarded. We're going to see awards on a quarterly basis, and uh, you will see PACE uh, awards here uh, sometime this spring. I really appreciate um, that update. It's clear that USDA agency staff and officials have expended a huge amount of effort and time to get these uh, programs up and running. And program applicants have spent a lot of time and capital to write and submit applications. Um, considering that, could you estimate the implications and costs for USDA and the applicants of reopening and amending these programs um, at this stage where USDA has already received and begun to review applications? Well, I don't think we, we, we're not in a circumstance, I think, where you reopen unless there's additional resources that become available. Then we'd be happy to take a look at what additional projects could potentially be funded. But we have a limited resource, and we're working within the constraints of those resources. Thank you. I appreciate that. Switching gears, um, I would like to join my colleagues in reiterating the importance of strong nutrition programs at the USDA. Uh, last week, I had county commissioners here from my district who shared the steady increase they've seen since the pandemic um, that is um, unprecedented, with no sign of slowing down. In fact, SNAP applications in um, one of the largest counties in my district are up 26%. They are not down. Um, and so I think it is very important to remember um, the implications of SNAP. And when we talk about um, uh, first of all, who gets SNAP. Um, it is 96% uh, of SNAP participants are U.S. citizens. Only 4% are not citizens, and 3% of those are lawful permanent residents. And most importantly for me as a pediatrician, 42% of SNAP recipients are children. Children, like the ones that I saw in clinic every day where two-thirds of the kids that I saw um, did not have enough to eat and were it uh, not for SNAP, would not have anything to eat. Uh, so can you quickly expand more on the impact of SNAP on families and their, the children that we uh, always purport to care about in this Congress? Well, there's research that indicates that the SNAP program is one of the most, if not the most effective anti-poverty program that we have. There's also research to show that when you essentially provide adequate SNAP benefits, uh, families uh, purchase more nutritious food and have better health outcomes for their children. I thank you for the support that you give um, to those children um, with your work every single day, and thank you once again for answering those questions. Um, I yield back. Dr. Caravello, thank you very much. Now I recognize the General from North Carolina, Mr. Rouser, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a note about large farms versus small farms. It's only the larger farms that can survive the onslaught of the government, federal, state, and local. Uh, so the smaller ones go out of business and the bigger ones get bigger because it's the only way they can survive. Anyhow, that commentary there. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, chicken plants across the country have been operating at higher speeds for more than 25 years through the uh, FSIS line speed waivers, as you know well. Under President Clinton, a study allowed 20 poultry plants to operate evisceration lines up to 175 birds a minute. Plants invested, therefore, millions in technology grew their partner farms to supply the poultry needed and maintain worker safety and inspection standards all the same. Now these uh, positive pilot results led to the new poultry inspection system. Uh, today, 47 plants operate under this system. Farms all across North Carolina have built operations to support increased capacity and plants have designed staffing and facility needs around these speeds. Now OSHA data from 94 to 2019 uh, when substantial line speed increases were put in place, shows illness and injury down 91%, evidence that faster line speeds don't compromise worker safety. Now, a 2020 proposed rule incentivized more plants to adopt these improved processes and new technologies while increasing speeds, but was repealed by this administration. Instead, your agency informed companies with line speed waivers that to keep them, they were required to, quote, opt in to a study on worker safety being conducted outside of the agency. Now, I want to point out to the committee that this was a sole source contract and not a competitive bid, and no member of the study team is from a land-grant institution with knowledge of the chicken industry, but instead are associates of the University of California system. Now, a member of that study team testified in front of OSHA against a company participating in the study and has vocally cri uh, critiqued a number of other plants. Considering the work of other team members and the information requested before each plant visit that far exceeds the scope of the study, 
there's a clear bias against the industry and leads any objective observer to the conclusion this is a gotcha operation. Mr. Secretary, real quickly, can you submit and are you willing to submit in writing how much is being spent for the study, the source of that funding, and how the team mem members were selected? And why are they all uh, associated with the Cal uh, University of California? i uh, be happy to respond to questions, but I think it's a fair to say that there's litigation that's essentially uh, driving a lot of this effort. Uh, raise, uh, issues have raised concerning worker safety as a result of this. Uh, line speed, and, and this is a process of trying to make sure that we get the right data, the, uh, the significant data to be able to support whether line speeds are in fact a result of additional worker injury or not. If they're not, then obviously line speeds are going to continue. If they are, then there's going to have to be some adjustment, and, but we just don't have all of the data we need, uh, and that's the reason why uh, we have entered into an agreement with the producers. This is not a situation where they were, uh, they had the choice. Uh, they had the choice, and these uh, plants chose to participate in this study. Yeah, they, they chose to participate in the study in, in good faith, and, and it's turned into something that, uh, that they didn't anticipate. Aren't you concerned well, about a biased study here, given I, the circumstances? I don't think you should prejudge the study. The study hasn't been included yet. Well, you wait the old adage, the uh, is. pardon me, but the old adage, personnel is policy, certainly applies here. Now, i got to move on quickly to another matter. USDA is currently developing the next set of dietary guidelines, and uh, this is specific uh, to uh, alcohol. Um, federal law requires that scientific and medical knowledge support any changes to the dietary guidelines on the consumption of alcohol. How is the technical committee process ensuring that this mandate is followed? Have you been following that? I have, and it's my understanding that this is outside of the dietary guideline uh, conversation. Well, alcohol has always been included uh, in dietary guidelines, but this takes it outside of the uh, scope of dietary guidelines. That's the issue. Well, I think that in an effort to try to make sure that there's a, a deeper review and dive on this issue, I suspect, for future dietary guidelines. Well, I just mentioned this. There's a lot of growers around the country uh, that uh, produce a product that is used uh, uh, for adult beverages that have a great interest in this, and, and I'd like to uh, follow up with some written questions as well. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields. Now, please recognize Congresswoman from Illinois, uh, Ms. Zinsky, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, Secretary, uh, for joining us here today and engaging with us on a host of really important issues. Um, I want to just take a moment to say again, thank you so much for joining me last summer at the Farm Progress Show in Decatur. I uh, really appreciated you joining me there for that. Um, last fall, as a response to what I had heard from farmers in my district in central and southern Illinois, um, I led a letter with Congresswoman Pingree and Congressman Costa, along with all the Democrats on the committee, outlining our shared priority to protect the Inflation Reduction Act uh, Climate Smart Conservation Funds. These funds as you know, have provided a historic investment into our farms and have already served many rural farmers in my home state of Illinois. I was also very excited to see that 100% of the obligated IRA dollars made it into the hands of farmers in Illinois. And to my colleagues, I would encourage you to explore the new Inflation Reduction Act data visualization tool uh, that the USDA put out yesterday to see the difference that the IRA has made in your home states. I also want to take a moment to celebrate the release of the 2022 Ag Census yesterday. Champaign County uh, in the 13th Congressional District, um, my district, was a top 10 producer of both corn and soybeans in the United States. So number one, a central theme, my question, a central theme of my first term has been creating opportunity. I had bills to improve land access, to increase research funding at USDA, and to expand markets for farmers, all of which I hope will be a part of the Farm Bill base text. Secretary Vilsack, can you speak to how the Inflation Reduction Act funding for climate smart conservation has created opportunities for farmers? Well, I, I, I think it. Uh the bottom line is I think farmers understand what they need to do to improve soil health and water quality. And I, I think they are deeply interested in doing more of this. 
but they need help and assistance. And I think that's why they responded as, as they did to the additional resources of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, oversubscribing all of the programs. We saw a tremendous initiative with our Regional Conservation Partnership Program, which is really large-scale landscape activity, uh, where we saw over a billion dollars of requests uh, for a limited sum, about $400 million. So the farmers are responding by saying, give us more, help us do more of this, we're anxious. And we saw the same uh, reaction to the Climate Smart Agriculture Partnership Initiative, where we can create commodities that are utilizing conservation programs, and the result of that then uh, provides a market opportunity for them, a value-added market opportunity. Thank you. Um, and I just had another question on EQIP. Um, in 2022, almost three out of every four EQIP applications, as you know, across the country were, de were denied. And only about half of all those approved applications got funded. Um, and so I consistently hear from farmers in my district that they want better access to these conservation programs. Is um, farmer demand meeting or even exceeding expected outlays of IRA money to bridge this gap? It, it, it's exceeding the, the resources that are available. I think there are two, two issues here. One is making sure that you have adequate staff uh, to, and to adequate technical assistance to help the farmers mm -hmm. decide what they need to do. And then two uh, is making sure the resources are there. And recently, a, a third issue has cropped up, which is uh, trying to figure out ways in which we can speed up the process. And NRCS has uh, streamlined the process. Mm -hmm. they've, uh, they've looked at ways in which they can have pre-approvals so that resources can get into the field more quickly mm -hmm. uh, than in the past. So I think it's a combination of all three of those things to try to meet the need. But uh, if you take resources away from the IRA, obviously that's going to impact and affect our ability to do more work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. General Lay yields back. Now recognize the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Kelly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, I, I first want to say I concur with uh, almost everything Mr. Rouser said about the poultry. In 2022, at your direction, USDA informed poultry companies with line speed waivers that to continue to reap the benefits of operating at higher speeds, bringing more chicken to the market during historic inflation and record high food prices, they had to opt in to this pulse study, a study being conducted by researchers whose bodies of work evidence significant bias against the chicken industry. Yet when reading from USDA's Food and Safety Inspection Service constituent update of July 29, 2022, it says, establishments with a current line speed waiver must agree to participate in the study and provide worker safety data in order to receive a modified waiver. That update directly contradicts the narrative that plants were allowed to opt into this study on a voluntary basis. USDA demands that they participate in order to keep their higher line speeds. A decision would be hard for plants to make since they place orders months in advance and would risk taking a significant amount of supply offline if they went back down to slower speeds. The companies that have continued with their waivers have since been subject to researchers in their plants who are going far beyond their intended purpose of determining what threat, if any, increased line speeds pose to worker safety. Mr. Secretary, can you explain why your department lauded this waiver participation as voluntary when it clearly is not voluntary? Uh, there's litigation, Congressman, uh, and essentially in an effort to try to avoid uh, a, a complete shutdown by a court order uh, of line speed increases, uh, we basically created the opportunity for folks to continue to convince the court that this was a good faith effort to make a, a determination whether or not there were unsafe practices involved. So if we had done what you are suggesting, uh, essentially what would have happened is judges would have shut us down, and, and the, the, this happened in our, in our pork line speed issue, judges will, will enjoin the use of line speed and everybody would have had to slow their lines down. So you tell me, would you, would you have preferred everybody slowing their lines down, or would you have preferred creating an option for people to continue to at, at the line speeds that they that they had invested in? I would prefer to have a researcher that is not in there to do something opposite of what they are intended to do. Don't don't assume that the don't assume the outcome of this uh, of this study until it occurs. I would just tell you, I spent a lot of years in the Army, and when an inspector comes in, they generally find what they're looking for if they're looking for certain things, whether it's there or not. And I can just say from experience that uh, an IG inspection could be either good or bad, depending on the intent of the inspector. Next question, though. Mr. Secretary, I've heard from many producers about constant challenges with the H-2A program regarding regulations and rules issued by the Department of Labor 
one of which was issued almost a year ago, requiring employers to pay varying wage rates to H-2A workers based on their daily job function. This rule has put the potential to double wage rates for employers, not to mention add a huge regulatory burden to try to track the work of every employee throughout the day through each task that they do. Did the Department of Labor consult with USDA on this rule? We, we have an ongoing conversation about rules relating to, to farm labor, and I think the reason this rule is structured the way it is is because there was a general wage rate being applied to a variety of jobs, some of which were high, required significant uh, uh, qualification uh, and were much more complex. And so I think the, the effort by the Labor Department was to try to respond to the value of that service. Yeah, but they kind of went overboard here. So uh, small farms uh, are at a high disadvantage here. I guess we're trying to put them out of business. You, you're out there and you're uh, picking up potatoes, digging sweet potatoes, or loading them on the truck, and they need you to drive a pickup truck to the store to pick up a part. And all of a sudden, you get classified at the rate of a truck driver at $40 an hour instead of $20 an hour. You see how, and, and driving a pickup truck is not driving a big truck, but they still classify you as a truck driver, and so you have to be paid that wage for the remainder of the day and the remainder of the time that you work there. You do see where this could be very confusing and very hard on small operations. Well, that's one of the reasons why it would have been helpful if you all had passed the Farm Worker Modernization Act, you wouldn't have had to deal with this. But we didn't make this rule. But we didn't make this rule. Well, you did, in a sense. In, in a sense, you made it by not, by not creating the opportunity for a structured, stable, secure, predictable system. I would just say, as the Secretary of Agriculture, it seems to me that anyone with even a layman's understanding of farming would have flagged how problematic and how burdensome this rule is to our small operators. And uh, th they literally cannot compete because we're overburdensome with regulations. When you have to track every task that a worker does every day, we will have more people tracking their tasks than we do actually doing the work. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Now, please to recognize the gentle lady from Maine, Congresswoman Pingree, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Secretary, for being here today. I really appreciate all of the things you've been talking to us about and your very thoughtful answers. And I, uh, as a member of the Appropriations Committee, just want to thank you for reminding everyone in the room that passing an appropriations bill is critically important. Uh, if we're all going to talk about the importance of getting a farm bill done, uh, we have to remember that uh, we need the funding for your agency as well and that the 18% cut that was proposed is ludicrous. So uh, I'm counting on my good friend, Mr. Bishop, for fixing all that before we take it to the floor, but let's just hope we can eventually get that to the floor. Uh, we've been talking a lot about climate change and disaster resilience and really uh, what I see now as this extreme weather that all of us are facing and our farmers are facing. And you were very kind to come and uh, visit us in Maine last month right after we'd had some horrendous storm in December that caught our forestry and farming folks uh, off guard and really uh, impacted our state with the flooding and the high winds. One of the farmers we showed you some pictures of was Chuck Noyes, a dairy farmer in Albion, Maine. He lost two buildings and a roof and his insurance does not cover rebuilding the barn and he's not sure if he's gonna get the roof replacement. But a few days after you visited, we had two more storms back to back that really impacted our coastline. So that was our working waterfronts and our fishing community, more significant damage. And I like to remind people, this wasn't the only bad weather we'd had. We had frost that destroyed our fruit crops in the spring. We had wet weather in the summer that left hay that couldn't be harvested or in such poor condition that our dairy farmers and livestock farmers um, have to supplement the diet this winter with increased grain and corn silage. Uh, this is going to continue to impact our farmers. And I just want to talk a little bit about the tools you're trying to provide uh, to help farmers to be more resilient. You know, we all want to make sure there's disaster relief aid, and we appreciate your request for more of that because it's getting more and more expensive. But so much of what you're doing is to try to prevent uh, the, the disasters that we're facing in terms of how farmers deal with drought and flooding. And so can you talk a little bit about what the work you're doing is uh, to help farmers have more resilient fields and, and to deal with some of this adverse weather? Well, I'd say there are three or four steps that we're taking. First of all, we continue to focus some of our research efforts on figuring out exactly uh, what works and what doesn't work in the field to ba basically create 
uh, a more resilient farming operation uh, and certainly uh, would encourage uh, a continued investment in our research initiatives. Uh, secondly, uh, the Climate Smart Agriculture Commodity Initiative, 141 projects across the United States, all major commodities, uh, looking at 205 different practices uh, to determine uh, the viability of those practices in terms of resiliency and sustainability. Uh, I think we're going to learn a lot from that experience. Uh, we've got nearly 100 universities, minority serving institutions involved and engaged in that effort. Uh, and we're now seeing, beginning to see a, a lot of interest in that. Uh, we've mentioned today a number of times the IRA and the investments in conservation, uh, whether it's uh, the uh, EQIP uh, or CSP, or from a large-scale landscape basis, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. Uh, that, that also is, I think, uh, significant. Uh, we're also using our risk management tools uh, to encourage more cover crop activity uh, by providing incentives uh, for the use of cover crop. And uh, this most recent ag census indicates that that's beginning to work as we see an expansion of cover crop activity. So it's across the board uh, efforts to try to make sure that we're a good partner with farmers, ranchers, and producers. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, I do want to say, uh, I know it comes up often, people criticize your use of the uh, CCC, Community Credit Corporation, and having that flexibility. Sometimes it's talked about like it's a sacred cow, but I, I really appreciate how you're putting it to beneficial use. Um, as you said, doing the kinds of research and the scale, the projects, um, it's at all different scales around the country, so people really have the examples of what to do. So. Um, so thank you for that. Um, one more specific question on the organic market development funding. Uh, I know you've talked a lot about how you get farmers extra income and, and growing organic produce or organic uh, food for the market is often that. I'm really pleased to see that the USDA is providing 10 organic market development grants to address gaps in the organic market like processing, transporting, and consumer markets. Can you tell us a little bit about the demand for the program? where the funding for the program is coming from and how we can support more of that organic market work? Uh, there are, two, I think, two initiatives. The American Rescue Plan provided resources for us uh, to establish an organic uh, marketing assistance program. Uh, the application period for that program is still available, uh, I think, through October of this year. Uh, there's been quite a bit of interest in that uh, to assist uh, farmers in terms of offsetting the cost of marketing. Uh, and then, as you indicated, uh, we really wanted to take a look at um, trying to uh, right-size, if you will, the supply and demand of organic uh, opportunities uh, across the country. And so we've awarded uh, a number of entities research, uh, resources to be able to tell us how do we create demand, how do we make sure that the demand is being created where the supply is, or conversely, how do we create the supply where we already have demand uh, so that we basically right-size. I think uh, we, we've also created a transition program uh, making it easier for people who want to become organic producers to be able to do so with mentoring, with assistance on conservation costs associated with the transition, and with uh, uh, some uh, risk management opportunities as well. So it's a combination. Thank you. I, I, I've gone over my time. Those are great answers, and I appreciate you, Mr. Chair, holding that okay. extra minute. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. No, I thank <clears throat> thank the gentlelady. Now recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Bacon. For five thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome here to Mr. Secretary. Appreciate you being here today. I have two questions, one on cybersecurity and then a follow-up on trade. Uh, first on cybersecurity, there was a recent article published in the Joint Forces Quarterly titled Weaponizing Wheat. It was written by Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Schuerman, and he assesses the security status of America's food supply, and his findings are disturbing. So, Mr. Chairman, if, uh, I'd like to submit that for the record, this article. Without objection. In the article, uh, Kurt, Lieutenant Colonel Sherman identifies agriculture cybersecurity as one of the most pressing threats to our agriculture. Russia is a top cyber adversary known for targeting cloud infrastructure, for example. We've had cyber attacks on industry leaders like JBS. We're seeing state-sponsored attacks have caused real-world effects targeting critical infrastructure like grain storage facilities. So, Mr. Secretary, I've been working on a, on a bill for a couple of years called the American Agriculture Security Act of 2024 and establishes research centers that are American land grant institutions across the nation with the purpose of researching physical, biological, and cyber threats to American agriculture. These centers would be structured and operated like the UARCs that we see uh, used by the DOD, and they've shown a lot of promise with their military. So, Mr. Secretary, what, what's your take? Would this move us in the right direction for helping provide better cyber security, or what else could we be doing to protect our farmers? Well, Representative, it will if it's adequately funded. 
Uh, it's not enough to set up a center unless you have the resources behind it. Uh, but I think, it's, I think you're right to, to put a spotlight on this. Uh, and certainly land-grant universities are already doing some of this, perhaps not as in coordinated a fashion as they need to. Uh, at USDA, we're uh, really focused on making sure that the private sector is hardening, hardening their assets, uh, hardening their, uh, their I IT against these kinds of attacks. Uh, obviously, you mentioned JBS. Uh, when something like that happens, uh, our role and responsibility is to evaluate the impact on the market uh, of a disruption, a significant disruption, which we did in that case, um, and to convene uh, the industry to remind them of the importance of investing uh, in protection. Uh, there is an interagency effort uh, in this administration to sort of focus on cybersecurity and on AI in particular, um, and taking a look at uh, the entirety of our uh, portfolio from food safety to, to SNAP bias to uh, market manipulation to, uh, to trade policy. It's, it's all encompassing. Mm. You know, our DOD runs something similar with the URCs and it's been very successful, but you're right, they have to be funded. Um, my second question is on trade. If I had to provide the number one feedback or maybe criticism of the administration that I hear from Nebraska producers, and I believe it would be in your home state as well in Iowa, is we don't hear much from the administration on trade. In fact, I very seldom hear the president discussing trade at all. And uh, just like Iowa, Nebraska is very dependent on beef, pork, corn, wheat, uh, sorghum exports. So could you tell us what is the administration doing and, and hopefully cl clearing up, clearing up the, the misperception, sure. if anything? Uh, well, first of all, uh, it was mentioned by uh, Representative Scott, the establishment of the uh, Regional Ag Promotion Program. Uh, nearly a billion dollars being invested at the request of Senator Stabenow and Senator Bozeman, a uh, bipartisan request to invest in trade, uh, of focusing on diversification of our market opportunity. Uh, we are over-reliant on our top four markets from an ag perspective, and so we want to put resources to, to increase our presence, our promotions, uh, and our partnerships in uh, a number of countries, particularly in Southeast Asia. Uh, number one. Number two, uh, I, I think sometimes it's, uh, I think the focus people have uh, when they define trade, they talk about it in terms of trade agreements. I mean, the reality is you don't have trade promotion authority, so uh, it's very difficult to imagine a trade agreement being negotiated when uh, the people we're negotiating with realize that there are 535 folks who can negotiate again. So without trade promotion authority, that's the issue. So in the meantime, we're working on trying to reduce barriers. Uh, and I can tell you that roughly $21 billion of uh, trade opportunities have been created or maintained as a result of, of uh, wins uh, looking at tr reducing trade barriers. Uh, the UK and wood pellets and biomass, Canada and a clean fuel regulation, Mexico and potato access, Japan, beef quota, uh, high, higher blend ethanol uh, availability, India, pres preservation of apples, uh, expanded cherry access, the Philippines, expanded access to pork. China, almonds and uh, almond hulls recently. Argentina, apples and pears. Israel, processed meat and eggs. There are a whole series of things that have occurred over the last three years. The cumulative impact and effect of them is to either to protect or to expand trade opportunities. So that's what we're up to. Uh, we're, we're, we're expanding trade missions uh, and considering reverse trade missions where we bring people from other countries here in the U.S. So it's a combination of, uh, of many things that don't necessarily get to headlines, but are particularly effective in terms of trade. Thank you. As you know, the Iowa farmers and Nebraska farmers, we like to feed the world. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman from Nebraska. Now please recognize the gentlelady from Washington State, Congresswoman Glusenkamp Perez. Thank you, minutes. Mr. Chairman. And um, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. We actually just had Undersecretary Torres Small visit our district. And to Representative Bacon's point, we actually had a really productive conversation around um, trade and foreign access to our apple growers. Um, so our, our state, Washington State, particularly on the west side, is dominated by much smaller producers. Right now we only have 5,700 farms. Their average size is about 158 acres, so much smaller. Um, we're losing a lot of our small and medium-sized producers, as you might be familiar with. Um, and uh, at the same time, I'm seeing really troubling reports that it, on average, the American consumer about 40% of the fresh fruits and vegetables they consume are from overseas or from uh, our trade partners here. So this together paints a really troubling picture that our smaller producers are really in, in, in trouble um, and getting squeezed out of the market. And I wanna make sure that we have a farm system that allows the small and medium-sized farms to thrive. 
Uh, they shouldn't have to depend on agro-tourism or um, value-added propositions like a solar farm to survive, in my view. These are really important ventures on their own, in their own merits, but they shouldn't be necessary for farmers that want to continue and pass on their farm to the next generation. So I'm, I'm asking, just what are your thoughts on this? What is the USDA currently doing to support the stability and viability of these small and medium-sized producers, and how can Congress be a better partner in this work? Uh, Congressman, I'd be happy to come to your office and give you a rather extensive uh, discussion about what we're doing. Uh, Climate Smart Agriculture Commodity Initiative, uh, helping smaller size producers get a value-added proposition. Having farmers qualify for ecosystem service markets and when they do the right conservation and there's a conservation benefit and a greenhouse gas reduction or carbon being sequestered, they're getting paid for it. Uh, the use of the Renewable Energy for America program to reduce the cost of electricity and maybe even producing excess electricity which could be combined with their neighbors to provide a transition for the rural electric cooperative creating a new energy commodity. Expanded access to processing, local processing. Uh, over 400 programs, uh, for, uh, po projects invested by USDA in the last three years. Uh, focusing on local and regional food purchasing agreements. We've provided your secretary, your commissioner, your director of agriculture in Washington with millions of dollars encouraging them to have direct connection and, and contracts with local producers, small producers, to be able to provide those fruits and vegetables for schools and for the f uh, food banks. Uh, using our uh, procurement dollars uh, as well for that purpose. Uh, reducing fertilizer costs with investing in, in new fertilizer capacity in the U.S. So th there's a broad array of strategies, and the goal here is to create new income streams. So it's not just the commodity that they're selling that they have to survive on, because the reality is they also have an off-farm job. That's how they're surviving. Mm -hmm. The question is, do we have to have the farmer have the off-farm job, or can we figure out the way the farm can have three or four different sources of income simultaneously? I'd be more than happy to show you the investments that we've made, the extent, particularly as it states uh, in Washington specifically. Yeah, we are very excited about some of the growth in processing in particular. So thank you for the support there. Um, I wanted to change gears just a little bit and talk about another really important issue for my district, um, NACS. So effectively addressing the wildfire crisis, it requires forest management activities, including removing trees and other low value material. Timber sales working in conjunction with other tools like prescribed burns, habitat restoration and reforestation where, um, where appropriate will ensure that we can have safe and resilient forests while growing rural economies. Um, last week, the EPA updated PM 2.5 NAAQS rule, which will significantly tighten air quality standards. I'm concerned about the impact this new rule will have on our forest um, product industry and our ability to conduct prescribed burns. I'm probably, you know, when I burn the bacon, it's probably reaching air quality standards that might trigger uh, in my house. Um, and, and so I, we lost 731 acres in the Gifford Pinchot, and I want to make sure that we're utilizing every tool at our disposal. Uh, can you speak to how USDA and EPA are working together to promote the use of prescribed fire, and generally, how can we be better partners when tackling the wildfire crisis? We, we entered into an MOU with uh, the EPA to avoid uh, a restriction on the use of prescribed fire as it relates to that particular regulation. So that, uh, that was a result of negotiations and, and recently concluded an assigned MOU. Uh, also, we have our wildfire crisis strategy where we're investing resources from the infrastructure law and the IRA uh, into more uh, hazardous fuel reduction. And finally, we're trying to create market opportunities for that wood by developing cross-laminated timber projects and by uh, focusing on wood innovation. Thank you, Secretary. I yield back. Thank the general lady. Now recognize the gentleman from South Dakota, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes of questioning. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Mr. Secretary, for being here. You and I have had productive conversations in the past about the fact that managed forests are healthy forests and unmanaged forests are tinderboxes. You know, unfortunately, I think for a lot of different reasons, we've seen the volume of timber sales decrease. Uh, the last information I saw was that uh, 80 different units had failed to meet their harvest targets in the last five years. Uh, and, you know, in the Black Hills National Forest, this is important to us. We were uh, proud to host the first federal timber sale in 1899. We've been dealing with these issues for a long time. What can we do together to uh, better hit, pr better provide these forests the treatment that they need? Well, uh, I think there are two issues here. One is the forest itself, and I think our uh, our wildfire crisis strategy is directly 
designed to increase activity where it needs to be increased in order to reduce the risk of catastrophic fire. And so continuing to invest in that system is important. You provided a down payment with your bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, that's going to take us through a couple of years, but as you know, this is going to take a decade or more of commitment. So that's number one. Number two is making sure that we also have uh, activities for our, our, our mills. I know that that's been an issue, particularly in, in the Black Forest area, which is why we are literally transporting wood from the western uh, states to that mill in, in uh, South Dakota so that it maintains uh, uh, viability. We're continuing to do that. And I do want to give you kudos for that, Mr. Secretary. When I'd first heard the, the concept, the idea that there would be timber from elsewhere uh, brought in, I thought there's no way the bureaucracy is going to make that happen. And the fact that it has happened, I think, is a testament to you and your team. I think Chris French and others have done a good job of, of telling me that, that y'all want to get these things done, these things meaning more timber sales, more treatment so we can have healthier for us. I think there are still, a, just, it seems like there are a lot of holdups. Uh, I think it feels like there's some bureaucracy maybe further down the food chain. And so well, I'm going to continue to look forward to working with you and, and your team to do what we can to, to uh, maybe hit more of the center of the target. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit about uh, high path. Um, I mean, obviously, this country's got a lot of great poultry uh, producers. And in South Dakota, we got a lot of turkeys, we got a lot of pheasants. Uh, we've seen, as a country, 81 million dead birds as a result of high path. I mean, I think it is a terrible situation, uh, just devastating the industry and, and devastating to these growers that uh, have to, as of right now, are the only real solution when we have an outbreak is a total depop. Talk to us a little bit, Mr. Secretary, about are we getting closer to developing a vaccine solution that would not unduly harm trade so that we can have some alternative to total depop? Uh, Representative, you, you've asked a pretty tricky question there uh, by adding that trade uh, piece. Because there's clearly a distinction between if you're a broiler and the broiler industry, that's a concern. If you're in the turkey uh, industry or the egg laying industry, you're in a different, different place. Uh, here's where we are with vaccines. Uh, I'd say we were probably uh, 18 months or so away from being able to identify a vaccine that would be effective for this particular uh, HPAI that we're dealing with now. The problem, of course, is it mutates. And so you have to basically create, ultimately, a vaccine that is available for all strains, right? So there, there's that issue. The second issue is how do you, how do you deliver the vaccine? Um, do you deliver it in a way that is efficient and effective and less expensive, or, or is an injection required? Well, when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of birds, that's, that's difficult. So we're trying to develop that process for distributing the vaccine. Uh, then the, the other issue is whether or not you can get to a point where by vaccinating you can distinguish between a bird that's been vaccinated versus a bird that's been that's actually sick and we're working on that uh, so it's we've got work to do uh, there is a commitment to get it done there's a commitment to begin the conversation on the trade side uh, to begin asking our trading partners how do you feel about this what are your concerns about it so that we eventually sometime down the road get to a point uh, where I think you want us to be. But it's, it's going to take, it, it's very complex and it's going to take some time. So you're talking 12 to 18 months? 12 to 18 months just to get the vaccine for this particular type. Not that it's true for every type. We still have work to be done on how to, how to actually administer it. And we are nowhere near being able to do it from a standpoint of the impact of trade. We would have a circumstance where if we vaccinated uh, today, I think we would have a number of our trading partners saying we're not interested in your in your chickens. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Now, please recognize Dr. Adams from North Carolina for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you as well to the ranking member. Good morning, Secretary Vilsack. Good morning. Uh, thank you for coming back to testify. I do appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I appreciate the range of issues that you've raised today, and I want to follow up on them again. Equity in USDA and in agriculture, um, USDA's purchasing power, addressing competition and, and distributing resources to distressed and disadvantaged farmers uh, via the IRA. But I especially appreciate you naming food insecurity as an issue because I want to address something that we've been hearing in and around this committee 
as we approach uh, a farm bill. Uh, recent pay for proposals have, have suggested uh, that requiring the thrifty food plan be held cost neutral in future evaluations would save something like $30 billion over a 10-year projection. Uh, these proposals have been, been accompanied by a talking point that, that, that says not a single recipient of SNAP will lose benefits. Uh, I worry that that's not, that's not true. Uh, pulling cuts from future benefits and calling them savings, concluding that there will be no cuts, I think it's just disingenuous. The Thrifty Food Plan is the backbone of SNAP as it helps to determine the amount of dollars that our neighbors who are enrolled in the program get each month as they face the harsh reality of inflation in the grocery checkout. Uh, in my district, um, uh, participants in, in my Adams Hunger Initiative who represent over 30,000 uh, people on SNAP celebrated the long overdue reevaluation of the Thrifty Food Plan in 2021 and they and fear any threats to keeping Thrifty up to date in perpetuity could spell trouble. I understand that that during previous Thrifty Food Plan reevaluations an administrative decision was made to hold them cost neutral. And so the consequences of this decision resulted in absurd assumptions about how low-income families would have to stretch their food budgets for example, prior to 2021, uh, the Thrifty Food Plan assumed weekly diet of a family of four would include 12 pounds of potatoes, 25 pounds of milk, 20 pounds of, of orange juice, five pounds of fresh oranges. And I don't think any of us could reasonably eat a diet consisting substantially of potatoes, milk, oranges for long periods of time, uh, let alone get our children uh, to do that. So my question, is how would holding uh, future thrifty food plan evaluations cost neutral impact the ability of the thrifty and therefore SNAP benefits to be based on a realistic food plan? And could it undermine our ability to improve the diet of SNAP participants by making it more and more difficult for them to uh, afford more expensive but critical foods like fruits and vegetables? You know, the only data point I have, Congresswoman, is, is uh, the fact that when we basically looked at the Thrifty Food Plan based on what actually is happening for American families at the grocery store, based on data that was specific, uh, that was based on uh, the scanner uh, activities and information, what we saw was that we were underfunding, if you will, the foundation of the SNAP program to the tune of 20-some percent. Uh, so I think the, the, the challenge and the problem is if you try to maintain a steady course, you're essentially going to transition away from looking at what's happening uh, at that particular time in grocery stores. Uh, and over time, you're going to create a, a, a benefit that will uh, not adequately support the families that, uh, that need the help. Okay. Well, thank you, sir. So uh, switching gears a little bit, I, I'm pleased to see the ongoing commitment to the 1890 and, and 1994 land grant universities included in your uh, work on next gen and your letters to governors with Secretary Cardona uh, about land grant funding uh, because for too long these institutions have been underfunded. So can you discuss uh, briefly how you would ensure that 1890s are being brought to the table in conversations about future research, education and extension priorities? We've uh, taken a look at ways in which we can incorporate uh, historic black colleges, universities, and for that matter, all minority-serving institutions in many of our programs. Uh, they've taken full advantage of the Climate Smart Commodity Partnership Initiative. Uh, you mentioned the Next Gen program. Uh, our scholars program is at record levels of par participation. We've increased research. We've established more centers of excellence at HBCUs. Uh, most recently, the nutrition, uh, precision nutrition uh, uh, effort at uh, uh, Southern University. Uh, we're looking at the possibility of establishing a veterinarian school uh, at the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Um, and so there are, I think, a lot of exciting opportunities for us to continue uh, investing. We have obviously need a budget and we need a farm bill to be able to continue. To Great. Do well, thank you very much. As a proud HBCU graduate, 1890, 40-year professor at an HBCU, I appreciate all of your support. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. General A yields back, and I'll recognize the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Feenstra, for five minutes questioning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for being here. Uh, you and I have a lot of uh, commonalities, obviously, you being our governor for many years, and 
uh, so I just want to talk about what's happening in, in Iowa a little bit, what, I, what I'm hearing. I was in Buena Vista County, talked to 250 pork producers on Friday evening, and I'm hearing this you know, all over, and you noted it. The first question that was talked about from our chairman was Prop 12. And, and my question is, are, what, what are you hearing from our trading partners like Canada and, and other, uh, other trading partners? Uh, is the USDA concerned about trade disputes uh, through USMCA? Is this going to be a big issue because of Prop 12? Uh, Congressman, it's been raised uh, in our conversations with the Canadian uh, minister. Uh, they want to have some clarity and some indication of kind of how we're responding to this. Uh, Obviously, we're in the, in the relatively early phases of all of this. Um, I will tell you that we are looking at ways in which we can pr help and assist the pork industry. We know it's under a lot of stress, as you do. Yeah. Uh, we recently purchased uh, roughly $100 million of pork products uh, in our feeding programs using the CCC and, and Section 32. Uh, the good news is we've seen a significant increase in pork exports, yeah. uh, but there's obviously a lot of work still to do to try to help and assist them. Yep. Um, I think we're going to go through a bumpy period here uh, where farmers have to basically make a decision uh, about whether they're going to participate in that market uh, or whether they're going to be more localized. And I think that's why one of the reasons why we focused on, on building a local and regional food system so that you have an option, that you don't necessarily have to participate in a, a national system, right. that you actually have the opportunity to sell directly to your school, sell directly to an institutional yep. purchaser like yep. a university right. or a college. You've got many of them in your district. Yep. Yep, and that's exactly right. I just wanted on the forefront that, you know, this Prop 12, and we have to do our work, you know, in Congress, we got to pass something to pre preempt it. Um, and you hit on something with trade. I mean, trade to me is, is when you start looking at our corn commodity, I mean, we're, we're growing so much extra corn. Obviously, that can go to ethanol, but that gets hurt by trade. Uh, we got a lot of pork, uh, you know, going to Mexico and stuff. Um, and yet, I, I look at the administration and say we haven't had any new free trade agreements uh, in in the in in the last three years. I mean, where where do you see? I mean, how, how can U USDA help uh, on the free trade agreements, and and how can we expand export markets? Because to me, we, we're 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 doing amazing things, growing the product, but we don't have places to go for it. And that being said, there's a lot of competition. We're seeing a lot of our competitors claiming some of the the export markets that we used to have? Well, I'd say a couple things. Uh, first of all, one of the reasons why uh, the competition is steeper is because uh, folks in the past in our competition invested more uh, fully and completely in their infrastructure and allowed them to essentially squeeze the difference in the gap that we once had. Fortunately for us, we've got the bipartisan infrastructure law that's going to allow us to reclaim that competitive edge, number one. Number two, um, you know, the reality is uh, I have a hard time understanding the focus on trade agreements when I'm pretty confident, and maybe you, maybe I'm wrong about this, but do you believe that you can pass a trade promotion authority in this Congress? You haven't been able to pass a budget. You haven't gotten a farm bill through. Can you pass trade promotion authority? And if you can't, why not? Be and I think the reason you why not is because people have an attitude about trade that requires us to, to, to rebuild people's trust in trade. Farmers understand it. They absolutely yeah. understand it, yeah. not the rest of the no, country. No, and it's a huge deal. I, I just look at, you know, I was in the UK, they're doing uh, individual trade agreements on ag with Kansas and other states and stuff like that. I just wish uh, our federal government was a little more engaged. Kathleen Ty, we've talked well, about it and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and we, we are engaged, but it's not just trade agreements. It's breaking down barriers. Yeah. And I mentioned this earlier. A lot of trade wins have occurred. Don't get the headlines, but they've occurred. I, I, we've got $21 billion of trade wins in the last three years. Uh, the other issue is China. And I, I, you know, let's be honest about this. Uh, I spoke to the co-op uh, entity yesterday, and I asked, them, I asked them to identify their number one customer. And then I asked this question. If you started criticizing your number one customer, right. how long would you be able to yeah. have that number one customer? Good point. Hey, I got, a, I got one more question for you. When we think of uh, high path, African swine fever and foot and mouth, obviously going back to hogs, I got 17 seconds left. Do you feel confident that, that we're prepared? I mean, this, this is a, you know, keeps you, people, people wake at, I do. People, okay. I do. Okay. I do. I do. Right. Uh, I do because we have good people assuring it doesn't get into the country, and we have good people who are doing the research and the vaccine and all of that. Uh, so, you know, we're going to have it at Manhattan, Kansas, 
uh, at our MBAF, and I, I'm confident. Thank you. General, gentlemen's time has expired. Now recognize the general lady from Texas, Congress Crocus Roman Crockett, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your time. There are a lot of things that you have been asked today, and you clearly have a lot on your plate. So I'm going to stick to one subject matter that is crucial to all families that House Democrats are committed to upholding in this Farm Bill, nutrition. At the USDA, you award billions of dollars annually to support the nutritional needs of Americans from all walks of life. I especially want to commend your repeated commitment across USDA leadership to supporting nutrition programs that serve all Americans regardless of their circumstances. But with so much on your plate, there are some things that can fall through the cracks. In particular, I'm referring to GUSNIP and produce prescription programs. These programs provide critical assistance to Americans that need to stretch their SNAP dollars further and those that face medical complications from poor nutrition. But in each of these programs, not all fruits and vegetables are treated the same. Under current USDA policy, fresh fruits and vegetables receive more favorable consideration than frozen, despite the best science showing no nutritional difference. I'm concerned by this because we know that frozen is often better for folk who that most need nutrition assistance because it keeps for longer and provides more variety. Now, I have no issue with fresh, so don't get me wrong, but if we want these programs to be accessible and be accessible for as many people as possible, we should have parity between fresh and frozen. That is why I introduced the Bipartisan Shop Act with Congressman Alford, which now has 22 House co-sponsors and four supporters in the Senate. And if I recall correctly, when Congressman Rose asked you about the lack of parity on fresh and frozen in these programs last year, you said you would get back to us. So my question, Mr. Secretary, is whether you will commit to increasing equity in these programs by evaluating establishing parity between fresh and frozen fruits and vegetables in GUSNIP and the produce prescription program. Uh, Congresswoman, I'm happy to commit to uh, encouraging uh, those who use our nutrition programs to consider and to participate in fruit and vegetable consumption. Uh, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about what parity means and how it, would, how it would act and react in terms of our prescription produce program, for example, where we're working with pediatricians and physicians, um, how it would work with our GUSNIP program, uh, where we essentially provide resources uh, how it would work at, at farmers' markets, where it probably wouldn't because it's mostly uh, fresh fruit and, 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 and vegetable. Uh, there, there isn't any frozen vegetables available. So when you promote a farmer's market, uh, are you suggesting we not promote the farmer's market because it doesn't have frozen? No. I, what I would say is that I have a district where 20 percent of my district live at or below poverty. And because of that, my district probably in a disproportionate way is in more need of access to fruits and vegetables. But what we typically see is in underserved communities, um, they don't necessarily have the big grocers. So I don't, I, I have so many food deserts in my district. And so what happens is they don't necessarily always have grocery stores. And if they do have grocery stores, those grocery stores don't necessarily have fresh fruits and veggies. So if it's a matter of I can use my SNAP benefits so that I can get fresh broccoli, but the only place that I can go to maybe is the convenience store that's down the street and the convenience store has frozen broccoli. Why is it that I can't go to the convenience store? What's going to happen is I am now put into a situation where I now have to go to an area in which they have fresh fruits and veggies instead of being able to use I'm more than happy to work with you on, on that issue. That's a, that's a slightly different issue uh, and has slightly different responses. One is basically taking a look at, at what convenience stores have to offer in order to be able to qualify for the SNAP program. The other aspect of this is how we might be able to use the Healthy Food Financing Initiative that supports corner stores creating broader access to, to healthier foods, how we might be able to work together to make sure that frozen vegetables are part of of what they are able to uh, provide. And I thank you for that. I use that as just a general example, but overall, even if it's another grocery store, I would want people to be able to choose frozen because some of those grocery stores don't necessarily have, um, I would say the most appetizing fresh food sometimes. But I'm gonna move on to another issue that is specifically super important to Texas. 
And um, that is the summer EBT program. For whatever reason, my home state of Texas is having some problems standing that up. And I would like if you could update me on what other states are refusing to feed children during the summertime. There are 14 states, and we'll get you a list. Nebraska just recently uh, decided to come into the program. So there are 14 states. Thank you. Gentle lady yields back. Uh, now please recognize the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Mann, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Secretary, thank you for being here this morning. As, as you know, I represent the Big First District in Kansas, the number one beef, sorghum, and wheat producing district in the country. Um, as the subcommittee chairman for the Livestock, Dairy, and Poultry subcommittee here, I'm concerned with several proposed rules that would impose nonsensical and costly regulations on ag producers in my district and across the country. From U.S. Today's Packers and Stockyards rules, which extend well beyond the bounds of congressional intent and ignore legal precedent, to the new USDA Food Safety Inspection Services Salmonella regulatory framework, which has left the industry scrambling for answers. My view is the federal government should so either support producers or get out of their way. I look forward to working with my colleagues to craft and maintain sound, comprehensive livestock policy that honors the work of every link of the animal agriculture supply chain. Uh, Mr. Secretary, first question. Um, on January 24th, um, APHIS sent a final rule out to ONB that would require electronic identification ear tags for animal disease traceability and is a requisite for official uh, interstate movement of certain cattle and bison. And I understand the goals here. I guess my question is, what are USDA's plans for mitigating the cost to producers and other entities like sale barns to comply with the rule? Well, this is really, uh, I think, an investment uh, to support and preserve market opportunities. Because if we have a problem and we can't trace it back quickly, it destroys the entire market. So I think I would think that this is a relatively small cost associated with this. Um, and the reality is if Congress wants to provide us the resources to provide uh, reimbursement, we're more than happy to do that. But this is a very important, uh, I think, a market uh, protective measure to ensure that we can respond quickly to an outbreak, whatever it might be, to be able to isolate, quarantine, and prevent uh, an entire market destruction. Yeah, and, and I agree. I just, we got to think through how does that impact our producers on the ground. Um, second question, as we work to prevent animal disease outbreaks here at home, we also have to protect the U.S. Um, food supply against introduction of diseases from our trading partners. The USDA recently issued a final rule allowing for the importation of beef from Paraguay, despite Paraguay's long history of foot and mouth disease. Does Paraguay, in your view, have the necessary means to fund its foot and mouth disease mitigation measures, and how will USDA ensure there's no lapse in safety mitigation measures in We spent Paraguay? eight years looking at this issue. Uh, I have a lot of faith and confidence in the people that work for APHIS. Uh, there have been multiple audits of their system. Uh, we're convinced that their system is equivalent in terms of our, their ability to detect, their ability to quarantine, their ability to, uh, to uh, uh, respond quickly. We also have put a series of conditions uh, on the importation. Uh, the beef can't come from a, a facility that's ever, ever had any FMD. It can't come from a region that's had FMD in the last year. Uh, it's inspected both before and after uh, slaughter. Uh, so we are confident that we have a system that, that will ensure protection. Uh, and I think I've got to have confidence in the APHIS folks when they tell me after eight years of study, they're equivalent. Okay. Um, last question is likely, I'm sure you know, the EPA recently proposed a rule that would impact the affluent limitation guidelines and standards for meat and poultry processing facilities. Um, by EPA's own estimates, this rule could potentially close between 16 and 53 meat, poultry, and rendering facilities. Meanwhile, USDA has spent hundreds of millions of dollars to expand meat and poultry processing capacity. Did the EPA consult with USDA on the impact of this rule prior to its publication, and how do you plan to engage with the EPA we, on this moving we, forward? Uh, we provided information and data uh, in an effort to try to bolster uh, the most, the least restrictive option. There are three options, as you know, that they've proposed. Uh, we provided information in an effort to try to bolster the least restrictive, restrictive op option that they've identified. Yeah, big picture. It's frustrating for me, you know, taxpayers when, you know, we're spending all this money to try to improve capacity and enhance capacity, which we should. At the same time, the EPA is putting on regulations. I understand that's the EPA and not the USDA. Um, you know, we're, we're 
pushing on the door on one side and pushing on it, uh, pulling on it on the other. Um, last question um, with the last 30 seconds. One thing I'm really passionate about is our um, Food for Peace program and the notion of using American-grown commodities to feed hungry people around the world. Can you speak to the importance of using U.S.-grown commodities in, in our international food aid programs, um, which is obviously also authorized in the Farm Bill? Well, it's a critical component of the McGovern Dole. It's a critical component of Food for Progress. It's a, con a, a critical component of the Bill Emerson Trust if we get it replenished. Uh, so it's obviously a very significant uh, uh, tool that we have to try to address global <coughs> food insecurity. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Carvajal, for five thank minutes. Thank you, Mr. Please. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for being here. Uh, if anybody knows the federal government and the USDA and even Congress, it's you. And so I really appreciate your wisdom and your leadership in the capacity that you're in. I also understand why you're so smart. Uh, you have a former staffer of mine uh, that you hired, Aaron Sandlin, so I definitely know you're in good hands. Um, Secretary Vilsack, I represent what many people call paradise on earth, the central coast of California, where agriculture is the number one industry. When I meet with growers and producers in my district, they consistently bring up labor shortages. I believe we agree that finally getting the Bipartisan Farm Workforce Modernization Act enacted into law is essential, and that there are also additional tools that we, uh, that we would, that would help farmers with their labor challenges, including many that are within USDA's purview. How can we support producers through the Farm Bill to address labor shortages and could investments in research like mechanization or future workforce development be helpful? Well, I think a lot of uh, producers are looking at robotics uh, in an effort to try to make their systems more efficient. I think in the meantime, we have started at USDA uh, a farm uh, labor stabilization initiative, a pilot. We took $65 million from the American Rescue Plan. We put it on the table and we asked producers of all sizes, large and small, uh, what would they do with this resource uh, to recruit and retain a workforce uh, from, uh, from uh, the Northern Triangle countries in Mexico? Uh, we were actually impressed with the reaction and response to this. Uh, we got uh, applications from entities that wanted a, just a couple of workers to entities that wanted hundreds of workers. And each and every single one of them, we also gave them options of, of a very basic program or sort of a silver and, and, and gold program where, they, where the working conditions, the wage levels, and so forth would be significantly higher. I expected that the base program would be the more popular program in terms of application. Turns out that no, people were more interested in the silver and, and, and gold programs. We had far more applications in that space. So I think it's important, I think, for us to take a look at what we learned from that experience, and maybe that can help inform policy in the future. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, climate change continues to be an issue for farmers and growers throughout the country. As you may recall, last year at this time, atmospheric storms hit the central coast of California, leaving an estimated $2.4 billion in damages and crop loss. Once again, the central coast was hit with storms earlier this month. What disaster reforms can Congress do in this upcoming Farm Bill to help protect producers against climate change? Well, I think there are a couple things. I think uh, obviously we're going to learn a lot from the Climate Smart Agriculture Commodity Initiative in terms of strategies, conservation programs that farmers can use to make their farms more resilient. Uh, and so would encourage uh, learning from that experience and also preserving the IRA resources, conservation resources. Uh, I think uh, the chairman's right uh, in uh, his concern about disaster and, and trying to get away from the ad hoc programs that we've had in the past, sometimes they're adequately funded and sometimes they're not. Uh, to have a more permanent a disaster assistance program would provide some predictability and stability in that area um, and would certainly uh, look forward to working with everyone to try to figure out what that looks like. Um, you know, in addition, I think it's important for us to look at crop insurance. Uh, I think it's a, it continues to be a very important mechanism 
Uh, we've seen an expansion, a significant expansion of the number of policies, the, the number of commodities that are, that are now covered by crop insurance that weren't a couple of years ago, uh, uh, modifications to the programs, uh, ways in which the risk management tool can be used to encourage the kinds of actions and steps on the farm that uh, create greater resilience. So I think there's a combination of things that we need to probably look at. Thank you. I will just say that crop insurance needs to also make sure that it grows in the areas of specialty crops, which oftentimes are left behind. So. And that's where we've seen significant expansion recently. Thank you. As you mentioned in your testimony that food insecurity remains more common in rural areas than in the suburban areas, can you address the misconception that SNAP is a program predominantly used in cities and elaborate how SNAP supports rural communities and combats food insecurity in those regions? Well, there's no question that, uh, that poverty uh, is not concentrated in one part of the country. Uh, there are many, many remote areas and rural areas uh, of very significant and deep poverty. In fact, the persistently poor counties, the majority of persistently poor counties, counties that have experienced more than 20 percent of poverty uh, over decades, are located in rural communities. And so there are a series of programs, I see the time is up, but there's a series of programs that we've ad identified trying to address those issues. Thank you, Secretary Vilsack. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Now recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Miller, for five minutes of questioning. Okay. Secretary Vilsack, I'm sure you've seen by now countries all over Europe are facing protests from farmers because left wing governments are trying to destroy the ag industry to advance the climate change agenda. These farmers are tired of top-down policies intended to appease the left's climate cult, which make it harder for them to farm and feed the world. The Biden administration has taken similar steps to push this radical climate scam. From re-entering the Paris Climate Agreement to the EPA trying to make it harder for farmers to use pesticides, to Biden's attack on American fossil fuels, this administration's policies threaten our farmers. The agriculture industry needs the ability to access affordable diesel, nitrogen fertilizer, and pesticides. President Biden puts that ability in jeopardy. In a report published last week by the Buckeye Institute, they estimate Biden's climate policies will increase farm costs by approximately 34% and increase grocery prices drastically for Americans. To make matters worse, Mr. Secretary, you traveled to the UN Climate Change Conference and told attendees that the USDA wants to quantify and track carbon sequestration and greenhouse gas emissions of farmers. Mr. Secretary, are you aware of the report from the Buckeye Institute estimating Biden's climate policies will increase farm costs by 34%? and thus increase grocery prices. I, I'm not aware of that study, but I am I'm aware of the reaction of the farm community to our Climate Smart Commodity Partnership Initiative, which is fundamentally different than what's happening in Europe. Um, sir, different. I can Voluntary tell you, I'm actually a farmer in Illinois. I can tell you the majority of farmers are not on board with this climate cult agenda and that you are, and the we had Biden thousand. administration is wildly incentivizing these policies. And I can tell you if all things were equal, farmers would rather plant corn than put a solar panel on the best farm ground in the world. That's not what this is, ma'am. That's not what this is, Congresswoman. This, so, this, sir, this. John Kerry said we can't get to net zero. We don't get this job done unless agriculture is front and center as part of the solution. Do you agree with John Kerry that we have to get farmers to net zero? I agree that that's an opportunity for farmers to make more money and for small, small and mid-sized producers to actually stay on the farm. Okay, this is a disaster for farmers when you are incentivizing them to put farmers solar panels it. on the best farm ground in the world. What is this going to do well, to our ability to feed people? And not only that, those solar panels do nothing but help our adversary China. And going by the climate cults, own uh, practices, China is using coal to produce these solar panels, and we don't have a reclamation plan. And not only that, it's messing up when farmers are in competition or uh, have to um, rent their land, and you've got people that are getting uh, 
uh, subsidies from the government making three times as much as a farmer makes, of course you've got some farmers that are signing up. The, the uh, profit margin is so narrow on farms. You are forcing farmers into this. Look what's happening in Europe. And what I want to know is um, who's standing up for the farmers? Who's advocating for the farmers? Have you ever discussed agriculture or climate policy with John Gary? Well, of course I have, and I've also discussed it with farmers. Oh, what had, was your discussion well, with John let me Kerry, the sir? You know, I I'm would like to, to know what you discussed with John Kerry, I'm because you're advocating for the farmers. We need you to advocate for farmers. I am. And for the people that have to turn around and buy the food at inflated prices if these radical policies are put in place. Our program is voluntary, it's incentive-based, it's market-driven. It is precisely what the Food and Agriculture Alliance, which is made up okay. of 80 large organizations, Farm Bureau, <laughs> National okay. Farmers Union, every major commodity group has requested In Europe, the, the rug has this been pulled Europe. out on this the farmers is, this is because they, they... This is not Europe. This is completely okay. different. No one is on the side of American farmers, you but this to, committee. Need to the learn Biden administration that. has done everything in their power to attack the family farm. We're not going to let you jeopardize our nation's food supply for the climate change agenda. That's not true. That's not true. We're doing what farmers have asked us to do. You need to, you need to sort of study up on this because it's not Europe. It's not Sir, it's I'm a farmer. Of Europe. The farmers want policies. Okay, thank you, and I yield back. General Lady's time has expired. <clears throat> now recognize a gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Bishop, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, as you know, fuel and energy expenses are still at historic highs, and producers in Georgia's second district are concerned with how the farm safety net will perform now that commodity prices are falling while input costs remain elevated. Uh, but 700 small businesses and ag producers have found relief through USDA's Rural Energy for America program, the REAP program, just last year alone. Uh, these energy efficiency improvements and renewable energy investments are helping farmers and business owners across rural America lower their energy costs. Can you talk about the impact of this program on operating margins for our farmers and our ranchers? And what about small business owners in rural areas like those in Georgia's 2nd Congressional District? The second question has to do with uh, rural development, uh, one of my top priorities. Uh, so thank you for highlighting the investments in water and sewer infrastructure in your testimony. You also recognize USDA's emergency rural health care grants as a program that's vital to helping rural communities maintain access to health care, with over 800 grants reaching more than 22 million people. Can you tell us what the administration has learned and what trends you've seen related to both infrastructure and in health care, and what suggestions or lessons you can share with Congress from the emergency rural health care grants that we can implement moving forward. Uh, finally, Mr. Secretary, you identified the potential, the impact of potential cuts in our annual appropriations. Uh, if we're not able to enact four-year bills for FY24, at the levels in the bipartisan budget agreement, we could be looking at sequestration or a four-year continuing resolution. Uh, with such a touch and tough environment, can you tell, you tell us what's at stake? The impact of sequestration to mothers and children who rely on USDA food assistance, to our farmers and our ranchers across the country, to our producers who rely on technical assistance from extension agencies from NRCS, and to those who have housing and business loans with the USDA. And what about the impact of a four-year continuing resolution? Uh, I'll try to respond to all three of those questions. Uh, on the REAP program, we've had over 5,000 grants awarded. Many of these grants not only reduce the cost uh, to a producer or to a small business, but they also, for producers, create an income source. Uh, uh, what's interesting about this is so a Rhode Island producer who's uh, basically invested uh, in a renewable energy program where he is selling excess energy on the grid. So it not only reduces his cost, but it also creates a new income source. We want to obviously see more of that. Uh, and again, it's voluntary. People can apply for it uh, if they wish. Uh, and we're excited about the opportunity to see more grants in the future. On health care, listen, this is about basically uh, continuing to invest in our community facility program and our, com and our telemedicine program, our ability to basically help and assist uh, small communities uh, equip or build 
hospital complexes and or provide services, levels of services through telemedicine. Um, these are two very popular programs. Uh, the emergency care program was funded through the pandemic assistance. To the extent that you want that to continue, that would require an additional appropriation. But in the meantime, at, at, at the very least, continue to, to fund the community facilities program because that's a, a tremendously flexible opportunity. Uh, on the budget, yeah, I understand. You, uh, I'm getting a budget. I think I'm doing a pretty good job here, actually. Um, on the budget, look, if you cut the budget, uh, you have less services, you got less people. It's really that simple. You didn't expect me to be that quick. <laughs> uh, what's the impact of a, a four-year continuing resolution or for sequestration? Well, uh, the, 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 the problem with the continuing resolution, I mean, it's, it's essentially uh, the same uh, because you're not going to get, if you get a continuing resolution based on the debt, uh, debt ceiling uh, uh, deal, you're going to see a reduction in, in the overall budget. And so therefore you're going to see a reduction in services and a reduction in people. I mean, it's just that simple. Uh, we're, we are operating right now at a, well, historically we've received less of the non-discretionary defense spending than many of the other agencies. So whenever we receive a reduction or, 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 or a flatline budget, it really stresses things. Um, the backlog on SNAP applications in Georgia, um, the states, failing to meet the application processing timeliness requirements. I know uh, that, can you commit to working with us to try to give states more flexibility, such as eliminating the face-to-face -face interview, the, to clear the backlog, and making backlogs more transparent to the applicants so that they know that they may have to wait months in order to get their benefits? With respect, that's not the answer. The answer is uh, not to sacrifice integrity of the program. Those those face-to-face uh, -face interviews are very important. It's for the Georgia to use the resources they have available to have the staff adequately to, to run the program, and that's what we've asked Governor Kemp to do. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. The gentleman's time has expired. <clears throat> now recognize the gentleman from Alabama, Congressman Moore, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Thompson and uh, Secretary Vilsack. Good to see you again. I'd like to first thank you for uh, being here today and for the work that the Department of Agriculture does for our farmers, ranchers, and foresters across America. I'm sure you know farm programs and safety net programs are important to Alabama agriculture. Impro improvements to our nation's farm policy and ensuring timely farm bill re reauthorization is certainly a top priority of mine, the producers that I represent in Lower Alabama. Much like my colleagues here today, and you as well, I look forward to seeing a timely farm bill authorization, increasing reference prices, ensuring programmatic integrity to, for SNAP and other federal assistance programs and promoting wood product industries are top priorities for me in the reauthorization process and the livelihood of those I represent. The wiregrass in western Alabama are struggling to stay whole after a serious drought in recent months. Peanut producers are feeling a pinch of slimmer than ever margins and uh, are only met with resistance by our Democratic counterparts when any suggestion is made to adjust Title I to meet the needs of modern day production. I think it is, this, it is disappointing that these producers do not feel supported by the current administration we have in place and who would rather play favorites with ERP, grab every tax dollar they can for SNAP, and pander to radical social environmental justice agendas. It seems the agency is putting politics before policy, and quite frankly, our farmers, ranchers, foresters, and rural communities certainly deserve better. Um, first question I have is the executive action at the Environmental Protection Agency, General Services Administration, and the Department of Interior, Interior have recently been announced which are adverse or do not consider the work of your agency and its constituents. Secretary Vilsack, how are you making good faith attempt to give agriculture a voice across this executive branch? Well, I, I have an ongoing relationship with each one of those, the secretaries of each one of those uh, departments, and we are in constant communication about policies and issues that they are ad adopting that may have an impact on agriculture, and we provide input. I'm certainly not going to be in a position to tell them what they should do in their department. I don't want them telling me what I should do in my department, but we do provide input. We do provide data. We do provide the consequences of what they're considering on, on American agriculture uh, that's our job. And then once a decision is made by another department, to the extent that we can, we use the resources of USDA to try to mitigate the consequences of that. You know, I've heard the most terrifying words are we're from the government and we're here to help. And when I listen to you as the director of, or 
department head of agriculture, the USDA, it seems like you're battling the Department of Labor for production of food or you're, depart you're battling maybe the EPA to get them off the backs of local producers. And so um, would that be true, Mr. Vilsack, that probably the most terrifying wor words that you ever hear is we're from the government, we're here to help? You know, let me say something about that. Uh, yeah, you know what? And I think government does help. You know, when the farmers, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the crop insurance programs, the disaster assistance programs, the ARC, the PLC, uh, the, the, the wide variety of programs that you're discussing in the Farm Bill, that is government helping. I think that the, the, the challenge is we want to make sure that government is helping and is efficient in the way that they and, are And to helping. your defense, I think you're trying to do the job. Sometimes I don't agree with the policies that are implemented, and I certainly am not a, a big friend of the, some of the environmental stuff that's going on. But, but I, I think it seems like to me that your own government is your biggest issue sometime in trying to actually help the producers in America. And, I, you know, I appreciate you being in a fight for us. I hope you'll continue that. I'm sure you will. But uh, for me, it, it, more so when I listen to you talk about the D Department of Labor or these regulations that you have to try to jump through these hoops so we can have food on the tables of American consumers, um, you know, I, to me, I, I, I almost start to understand that the battle you're in is the same battle we're in many days here is how to stop the bureaucracy and take care of the people. And so let me, let me do one more question here, sir. I, I got one question. I'm running out of time. So uh, this past June, the department of, uh, announced uh, SNAP's error rate, a rate that measured overpayments and underpayments. Um, this announcement included an overpayment rate of 9.54%, which amounts to roughly $30 million a day. It's a, certainly, that would be an insult, Mr. Vilsack, to our taxpayers. What concrete, serious, and forward-thinking steps are on the horizon? We've states basically administer the program. Uh, we are working with state governors to make sure that they understand they need to get back to a more disciplined effort uh, in terms of SNAP. Uh, we sort of relaxed the flexibilities uh, or created flexibilities during the pandemic. We're now asking them to go back to the ordinary uh, work of uh, administering SNAP, which involves, to Representative Bishop's question, face-to-face -face interviews, which I think will be helpful to restore integrity in the program. So we're encouraging governors, and the governors, if they fail to, to respond, there are sanctions that can essentially be uh, put in place. We're concerned about this, and we should be. Yes, we should. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. Now, please recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Soto, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary, for being here today. I know it's been a long morning. Uh, your thoughtful and candid answers to an onslaught of questions just reminds us that American agriculture is in good hands uh, with your leadership. Uh, I've visited ranchers, growers, and farmers across central Florida, as well as food banks and food pantries, and they spoke with one voice, which is, can you please pass a farm bill? Uh, we've talked about uh, how food inflation has dropped in half and continues to go down, but there's more work that we need to do. Uh, is it your opinion that if we pass the farm bill that would help in continuing to lower food costs in the nation? Yes, unless it involves restricting the utilization of the Commodity Credit Corporation. That is a tool that we use to help food banks deal with the increased need that's out there. So we need to continue to support programs like that, and we will continue to see food prices decline for the American consumer. Correct. In Florida, we have uh, hurricanes that have only gotten worse over the years with climate change. Uh, Hurricane Ian recently led to over a billion dollars in agriculture losses. Um, we've passed out of this House a bipartisan disaster block grant authority. Uh, this was the, is the top priority for Florida Farm Bureau. Uh, do you think this would help going forward? I know the Senate didn't pass it yet, um, especially to help both our ranchers and particularly citrus as we uh, face these increasing storms. We'll be happy to administer it if it gets passed. Right now, we don't have the authority to do that. I know Florida is anxious to have it. Um, if that's the wish of Congress, we will certainly follow it and do whatever we can to make sure it's administered properly. And Mr. Secretary, we want to give you that authority. Uh, also representing cattle country, I just wanted to stress the importance of uh, continuing to invest in the National Vaccine Bank. Uh, that has come up several times for several different uh, types of livestock. We have the largest herd in the nation in uh, Deseret Ranch in our area, along with many other ranches and cow-calf operations. So that's really important. Uh, I've also visited places like Second Harvest in Central Florida, our food bank, that had to spend $2.5 million last year to fill the TFAP gap. Uh, how critical to feeding America's families uh, is the emergency food assistance program? Well, it's essential. It's an essential tool that when demand goes up, 
or, or there's a, a, a regional uh, tragedy that, occur, that occurs, it's an opportunity for us to be able to respond quickly to provide the resources for those food banks to meet the need. So it's critically important. Well, I've seen both seniors, children, the disabled, our veterans uh, coming to these food banks uh, to get healthy, nutritious food, and the TFAP program has been absolutely uh, critical for us. Uh, in addition, uh, we are, after many years, finally turning the corner in Florida Citrus. I appreciate your dedication over the years, both uh, under the Obama administration, now under the Biden administration, uh, to work with us on uh, this uh, research and development funding. We're seeing great advancements with new uh, herbicides that are and uh, pesticides that are helping out with new trees, especially injection. So I wanted to thank you for the waiver that you all provided to allow these uh, these areas to go forward. How critical is it for us to continue to make sure we have U.S. grown citrus, whether it's orange juice from Florida or uh, eating fruit from California and other areas to protect America's vitamin C source? Well, I think it's, it, it's connected to the health and welfare of, uh, of American, uh, Americans and specifically American children. You know, we're trying to encourage more fruits and vegetable consumption, and obviously to the extent that we do so, it'd be nice if we can provide them something that's produced here in the U.S. Well, we're going to try to dig deep to get this done. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is um, in my family's native island of Puerto Rico, along with many other territories, they are under the NAP program, trying to move them to the SNAP program. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to introduce a bipartisan letter from uh, Representative Jennifer Gonzalez-Colón and myself uh, just talking about the needs of the NAP program. Without objection. Thank you. Um, there's been some debate about whether there needs to be legislation or just funding uh, to convert NAP to SNAP. Do, do you happen to have any opinion on that or any advice on how we proceed going forward? Well, I, I think there is legislation that's required, but I think more importantly uh, is making sure that Puerto Rico in particular uh, is prepared for that transition. Uh, it's not a simple process to administer the SNAP program, and we have been working with officials in Puerto Rico to get them to a point where they're ready, willing, and able uh, to administer the program effectively so their folks won't fall through the cracks. Well, we're absolutely thrilled by that. In Central Florida, one in four of my constituents are fellow Puerto Ricans. We care deeply about what's happening on the island, as well as uh, supporting our local growers, ranchers uh, in cattle, citrus, blueberry, and strawberry country, uh, and making sure no, no Central Florida family goes hungry. So I appreciate your leadership, Mr. Secretary, and thanks for being here. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Uh, now please recognize the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Finstead, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Chairman Thompson, and thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for uh, being here today and for your testimony. Uh, I'm a proud fourth-generation farmer of southern Minnesota, excited to be raised in the fifth, and just really proud of the fact that uh, I'm part of a very honorable profession that really is called to uh, feed and fuel the world and to uh, help support our communities, families, and, and really the country as a whole. Recently, your department released several concerning reports related to the current state of farm economy of the farm economy. As you know, USDA's most recent projections found that the United States will experience an ag trade deficit of over $30.5 billion this year. Last week, USDA's, uh, your economic research services forecasted that in 2024, net farm income will drop by almost $40 billion. This is after close to $30 billion decline in 2023. You should already be aware of who was leading the USDA the last time the farm income fell two years in a row. As a matter of fact, you oversaw four consecutive years of decreased farm income from 2012 to 2016. That's quite the resume. As I meet with producers across the 21 counties I represent in southern Minnesota, they are worried about a repeat performance with multiple years of decreased income. Yet today, you have downplayed farm income falling by 27%. Maybe you can stand to lose 27% of your income, Mr. Secretary, but the farmers I represent cannot. My producers are dealing with compounding effects of increased input costs, interest rates, supply chain challenges, and burdensome res regulations, creating a highly leveraged financial environment in farm country. The, the hypocrisy of this administration knows no bounds, and a prime example is your shifting positions on the ideal farm size in less than a decade. Every one of us that is not a farmer is not a farmer because we have farmers. We delegate the responsibility of feeding our families to a relatively small percentage of this country. If you look at 85% of what is grown in this country, it is raised by 200 to 300,000 people. That is less than one-tenth of 1% of America. 
Those are your words from a 2016 congressional hearing, Mr. Secretary. Yet in your testimony today, you coldly dismiss these same fam family farms who are the backbone of their rural communities as they work every day to, to feed and fuel the world. In the last eight years, you seem to have forgotten that the small number of producers you now demonize are responsible for 80% of the production. All Americans and members of Congress should want to help small producers. I just, don't, I just think you don't have much appreciation for the operations that provide a majority of the food in this country with tight margins and greater risk. Farmers have continued to produce more with less by adopting innovation, increasing efficiencies, not because the government tells us to do it, but to remain competitive, to take care of our land, and to pass our farms down to the next generation. As farmers do every day for planning purposes, I did some back of the napkin math. Uh, effective reference prices are $4.01 for corn, $9.26 for soybeans. December corn is $4.67, and November soybeans are $11.62. If we look at that break even, uh, it's about, if we look at the break even, it's about five ten for corn, $12 for soybeans. Doesn't take a mathematician to figure out reference prices as they stand today are really irrelevant. If crop prices were to fall to the level needed to trigger these reference prices in the safety net, farmers would be facing bankruptcy. So due to that fact, crop insurance is the number one risk management tool we have for farmers to succeed. From working with their lender to making marketing, deci to making marketing decisions, uh, that really help us plan for farming uh, of the future. Moreover, FSA loans, uh, loan size limitations have not kept up with rising prices of farmland and these farm inputs. The current cap makes it more difficult for farmers, especially beginning farmers, to access FSA guaranteed loans for land purchases and operating expenses. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit into the record an October 2023 study prepared by Texas A&M examining farm policy and, and its impact on farm families. Without objection. Mr. Secretary, you closed your testimony today by saying we can continue on the path that this administration has taken that leads us to an even better and stronger rural America. I don't know about you, but if collapsing farm incomes, worsening trade deficits, increased regulatory burdens are your version of a better and stronger rural America, I think most farmers, including myself, would like to find a different path, and quite frankly, we call it hogwash. I will proudly stand up for farmers against the so-called leadership at USDA and across the Biden administration looking to tear them down. Farm and food security is national security, and good farm policy isn't written by D.C. bureaucrats for D.C. bureaucrats. It's written by farmers in rural America for farmers in rural America. So, Mr. Secretary, actions speak louder than words, and your track record speaks for itself. Mr. Chair, I have no questions, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Now recognize the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Vasquez, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Vilsack, thank you for being here today and for your testimony. Uh, thank you for what you uh, and the department do for our farmers, our farm workers, our ranchers, our ranch hands, and our ranch managers. Uh, I just want to make it clear that agriculture doesn't happen without the workers. And that's not just the owners, but that's the folks that are working the lands. Uh, expanding access to nutrition programs in New Mexico is one of my top priorities. And New Mexico has the highest participation in SNAP in the nation. One in four New Mexicans rely on programs such as SNAP and WIC to have the basic nutrition to go to work and go to school. Children and families are hungry in our state and they need food to thrive. Now the irony in this, Secretary, is that we work hard, we wake up early, we put food on the table for the rest of the nation, and yet we are the ones who need these food assistance programs the most. We struggle with food insecurity. One in five children in my district faces hunger. And without access to this critical nutrition, parents cannot focus on going to work or going to school. Now, I recently heard from Sofia, a mother in Las Cruces, who goes to school while working full-time to ensure she can feed her family. Since the expanded SNAP benefits expired, she struggled to feed her family while continuing her education. So it's clear to me that SNAP and WIC, when it comes to the entire equation of feeding our nation, are critical to strengthening food security for this country and strengthening our families. Secretary Vilsack, uh, what more could we do to make sure that families like Sofia's, who are directly in charge of being the next generation of folks who are putting food on our tables can have food security in one of the poorest states in the country? Well, I think, first of all, making sure that you're adequately funding the WIC program you mentioned. Uh, to the extent that that WIC program is underfunded, that would mean fewer people would be able to access it. 
Uh, I think secondly, uh, making sure that, uh, that there are not restrictions on the SNAP program that would make it more difficult for people to qualify or more difficult for people to get the benefit that they need uh, to provide uh, a supplemental assistance. Uh, I think third, making sure that uh, states understand the importance of, of uh, t taking steps to ensure that those who are qualified for the program actually participate. Unfortunately, sometimes there are circumstances and situations where states don't uh, make a concerted effort to sign people up or to get people to participate in the program. Uh, and then I would say, in addition, uh, making sure that uh, the states that you are most concerned about uh, are fully and completely uh, focused on implementation of the summer EBT program, which is going to provide additional resources to families uh, who are on free, who have free and reduced lunch children in school. Uh, I would say that's a, those are pretty significant opportunities as well to provide help. Thank you, Secretary. And I will just say one of the, the things that I've enjoyed most about serving on this committee, along with my colleagues on the other side, is the bipartisan uh, committee that we've set up to help modernize uh, the farm worker uh, system that we have for folks in this country, including H2A and H2B, uh, of which we should have some recommendations uh, for the rest of our colleagues, but also before your department and the administration uh, that helps some of those both domestic producers and immigrant producers, the folks who are working uh, at these very hard jobs, be able to have the opportunity to put food on the tables of Americans. So thank you for that. Um, the other question I have is a little bit different, uh, but you were recently in my district. You were in Albuquerque, South Valley. Uh, we were announcing a monumental investment in broadband for rural communities, $40 million for the state of New Mexico. Uh, Secretary, how can we make sure that those dollars are being spent in an efficient way that truly delivers the connectivity that rural communities need, including small and medium producers that can now take their businesses online and produce niche products that can help support rural economies? Uh, what are the plans for the administration in terms of oversight and administration of these rural broadband dollars? Each of the projects that are awarded resources have a team at USDA that follows the, uh, the construction, uh, the implementation of the grant to ensure that things are done in a proper way, in a timely way. Uh, and so that, I can guarantee that that will take place for every one of the projects that we award resources to. I think the other issue, of course, is that there are other programs outside of USDA that I think are, are very important. Uh, to keep an eye on, and that is the resources that are being provided to states and state governors to basically fill in the gaps. Our program primarily uh, if, is focused on improving the, the level of service that's available so that people actually have meaningful broadband access. Uh, we do serve underserved areas, but we also uh, make sure that the, the level of service is adequate so that more than one person can be down, downloading something in a home, for example. Secretary, thank you for your investment in New Mexico. Thank you, uh, Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman and now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Thompson, and thanks to uh, Ranking Member Scott for holding the hearing, and thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for being with us today. As time is limited, I'll dive right in. The Tennessee walking horse industry is a special industry that, frankly, is extremely important to my constituents and one that I value personally. Last summer, during a Farm Bill listening session tour that uh, uh, Representative Desjardins and I hosted in Tennessee. I, along with Representative Desjardins, joined by Chairman Thompson and also uh, 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 Representative Jonathan Jackson, visited a walking horse stable facility. The walking horse celebration is a time-honored tradition in Tennessee that began in 1939. Over 2,000 horses compete to be crowned the world grand champion, which is always crowned the Saturday night before Labor Day. I see you're writing that down. Uh, this year's celebration will be held August 21st through August 31st in Shelbyville, Tennessee. Mr. Secretary, I would like to extend a personal invitation for you to attend this unique event and experience firsthand this longstanding Tennessee tradition. Mr. Secretary, uh, schedule permitting, would you be willing to consider attending this year's celebration? I'd be happy. I, you know, they don't put me in charge of my schedule, uh, Congressman. It would be chaotic <laughs> if they did but I'm happy to make sure that folks are aware of your inv kind invitation and uh, we'll certainly take it, take it under consideration. And I invite you because as part of my visits to the celebration in recent years, I've had the opportunity to, to uh, take a look at what uh, your staff is doing there to inspect the horses. And it's really quite something, uh, the, the, the efforts, the lengths that are taken to make sure that these horses are treated 
humanely and fairly and and uh, and and so I just think it would be useful to you to see that and and then compare and contrast that to what happens elsewhere in the equine industry the lack of equivalent uh, oversight that's going on with respect to other shows with respect to other breeds so I, I would encourage you to consider coming I think it would be insightful to you to to have a sense for the scope of that of that inspection process I want to shift gears I was extremely alarmed to read uh, the December 20th 2023 press release from the US Attorney's Office for the Southern District of Mississippi announcing that a USDA employee named Ella Martin has sent it was sentenced to 35 months in prison for using her USDA position to create fraudulent warranty deeds with the intent to deprive the actual owners of the real estate of the use and benefit of their property. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I ask unanimous consent to have the text of the press release entered into the record. Without objection. Mr. Secretary, what specific policies and procedures has USDA implemented uh, in light of this development to strengthen internal controls and prevent similar fraudulent activity like this from occurring in the future? Every time something like this occurs, uh, our Inspector General gets engaged and involved and basically gives us uh, uh, ac activities or steps that could be taken to ensure that, it, that, that there's not a repeat situation. Uh, we obviously are very interested in making sure it doesn't happen again. Uh, and so we institute training, we institute uh, new guidance, uh, we institute oversight uh, to make sure that uh, these kinds of activities don't occur on a regular basis. Uh, Mr. Secretary, recently USDA published the Organic Livestock and Poultry Standards, standards Final Rule that sets new standards for organic livestock and poultry production, including standards related to animal welfare for the first time. Previously, the Agricultural Marketing Service stated that the Organic Foods Production Act did not, quote, authorize the animal welfare provisions, close quote. This sudden change in statutory interpretation leads me to believe this action could be interpreted as arbitrary and capricious. Secretary Vilsack, can you further explain why USDA changed their interpretation of this statute? I think it's important uh, from a brand perspective that we do what we can to ensure that the organic brand remains a high value brand. Uh, there, I think there's a certain expectation from the consuming public when they, when they pay uh, significantly more for organically produced items uh, that they are produced in, in an appropriate way. And I think it's a reflection of, of uh, consumer expectation uh, and the, what the industry itself is requesting. Thank you. I appreciate that insight. And, and uh, I don't think I can make it through this question, so I think I'll just yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields Chairman. back. Now, please to uh, recognize the gentlelady from Ohio. Congress thank you, Chairman Brown. Thompson. And thank you for holding this hearing today. And Secretary of Vilsack, thank you for being here. It's great to see you again. Um, we are months past our original deadline to get the farm bill done and now just months away from our new deadline. Um, as been mentioned by my colleagues, it's been six months since our last full hearing in this committee. And I too am glad that we are getting back to business because it is past time to get serious. So Secretary Vilsack, as ranking member of the General Farm Commodities Risk Management and Credit Subcommittee, I appreciate the emphasis in your testimony on small and mid-sized farming, because we know that our traditional farm programs need to work for everyone, not just the biggest players. Given that the average age of the American farmer is increasing each year, promoting the growth of small, mid-sized, and urban farms is an effective way to bring new, younger faces into the industry. So can you talk more about which of the USDA's efforts for small, mid-sized, and urban farms are specifically targeted to or beneficial for new producers into the agricultural space? Uh, well, there are a couple. I mean, first of all, we have 17 urban-centered uh, initiatives in 17 cities across the United States to encourage urban agriculture. Uh, we have placed a farm service agency office in each one of those 17 cities so that all of the programs that a farmer would have wherever they are located are available to those urban farmers. Uh, NRCS is also engaged in providing and ensuring that all the conservation programs from uh, hoop houses to extend growing seasons, things of that nature are available 
uh, to those uh, urban uh, uh, systems. I think we're also looking at ways in which we can promote market opportunities. That's why we invest in uh, farmer market promotion programs. It's why we have our, our, our local agricultural marketing effort, which provides resources uh, to, to uh, farmers uh, to, in, to value add um, if they produce a product. Um, it's, uh, it's why we are focused on ensuring uh, uh, local food purchasing agreements where when states purchase money, uh, product for food banks or for schools, they are doing business with local, small, mid-sized producers. It's why we track that information. Uh, it's why we are also using our uh, emergency resources, our emergency fund, uh, food assistance re resources to funnel into that local and regional food system. And the reason for it is simple. When you go to the grocery store, the farmer gets roughly 15 cents of every food dollar that's uh, spent. The net of that is about seven cents to the farmer. But when they sell to a local direct-to-consumer opportunity, they can get 50 to 75 cents mm -hmm. of the food dollar. So it's a, it's a way of helping those small and mid-sized operators have a market that's more designed for their, for their, for their capacities. Uh, so there's research that, that's, that's also uh, we're investing in. There are systems to help those farmers transition to organic and a high value proposition if they are interested in that. Uh, we also have a local and regional food system, uh, a set of 12 centers across the country that are providing the assistance and help uh, to those who want to establish a local and regional food system. So there's a, a multitude of efforts uh, underway to help folks regardless of where they're located. Thank you very much. I'd also like to touch on the topic of food assistance, particularly because there are more than 82,000 households reliant on SNAP benefits within my district, representing one of the largest concentrations in the country. When it comes to this upcoming farm bill, there has been a lot of noise about the thrifty food plan. Specifically, some Republicans have suggested we hold future reevaluations of the thrifty, arbitrarily cost neutral in in an effort to save money. So Secretary Vilsack, what would the theoretical impacts be to holding the thrifty to the cost of the 2021 plan for another 20, 30, or 40 years? And most importantly, how would it impact SNAP recipients? Well, I believe uh, that essentially it would result in us getting a benefit, as was the case in waiting 45 years to do what we did uh, recently. Uh, that inadequately, if you will, uh, meets the, the requirements uh, and the modern day needs of, of a family. I think what we found when we redid the SNAP uh, Thrifty Food Plan consistent with the 2018 Farm Bill was that the information that we were funneling into the system was not aligned with what was actually happening in the real world. And that's why we used real world data, real world uh, examples and information to be better inform the system, and that's why Congress directed us to do that. And it resulted in a 20-some percent increase in the overall floor of SNAP. Well, thank you. It is clear in the upcoming Farm Bill, two essential objectives must be met. We must strive to both strengthen and expand our longstanding agricultural programs while simultaneously ensuring the protection of our nation's critical nutrition assistance. So I really hope my Republican colleagues are listening and will join Democrats in putting producers and people over politics. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Uh, now, please recognize the gentlelady from Texas. Congresswoman Dela Cruz for five minutes questioning. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Secretary, for being here today. Um, as you know, Texas is one of three states that grows and mills sugarcane. And I'm proud to say that in my district, Texas 15, which is deep south Texas, uh, where McAllen, Texas is, the sugar industry uh, provides good jobs and it uh, provides economic opportunity and growth for our community. Unfortunately, it has been incredibly challenging for our sugar mills in our area due to the lack of water. This is in large part caused by the 1944 water treaty with Mexico. Are you familiar with that water treaty? I'm not specifically uh, familiar with that specific treaty. I'm well, let me share issues. with you how important this treaty is. This treaty and under this treaty, Mexico is supposed to give United States of farmers 350,000 acre feet of water every year. Mexico has failed to do this. 
I'm proud to tell you that I stand with my farmers and ranchers and have worked in a bipartisan manner to pass a House resolution that had overwhelming bipartisan support. And what that House resolution did was ask Mexico to give us our water that is so deeply, deeply needed. We are in the fourth year of a current five-year cycle where Mexico is deficient over 760,000 acre feet of water. This is simply unacceptable and it's causing lots of harm and hurt to our farmers and ranchers in our area. Given the current water situation, the uh, farmers that's really out of our farmers control, we are suffering right now deficiencies in water, which is basically having the farmers so less crop than what they are able to, to send. What I'm asking you to do today is to help us in South Texas, help our farmers and ranchers because our sugar mill companies in South Texas are saying that due to this lack of water, they're going to have to close. Let me ask you this, how do you feel about knowing that there are sugar mills in South Texas that are about to close due to this lack of water? Well, I think it's important for us to have uh, a focus on this issue of water, not just specifically for the sugar mills, but for farmers and ranchers and producers across the United States, and particularly in the western part of the U.S. It's one of the reasons why we established our Western Water Initiative, which uh, I probably should make sure your staff is aware of if they aren't already, uh, which is really focused on sustaining agricultural productivity, taking a look at uh, ways in which we can protect both surface water and groundwater, uh, restoring rangelands and forest lands uh, a, a, a in terms of water utilization, uh, and responding to disruptions. I'm going to reclaim my, client, uh, my time, sure. Mr. Secretary, because it's such an important issue. And like my colleague across the aisle said, we don't want to play partisan politics with our farmers and ranchers. Food security is national security. And I would like your commitment to stand with me and our farmers and ranchers and meet with and talk with Secretary Blinken about Mexico's lack of abiding to the 1944 treaty. Can I have your commitment to stand with the ranchers and farmers and speak to Secretary Blinken about this treaty? I'm happy to take a look and learn more about this and get back to you, Congresswoman. I think that's fair. Thank you. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. And my office will follow up with you on this important topic. With that, I yield back. General Lee yields back. Now please recognize the General Lee from Hawaii, Congresswoman Tokuda, for five minutes of questioning. Mahalo, Mr. Chair. And first of all, uh, Secretary Vilsack, uh, just a, a big thank you to the USDA for um, all the responses that have come forth as a result of the wildfires in Lahaina. Um, I know you have not been able to come and visit yet, but please, we welcome you to do so. You know, we had significant damage, uh, over 6,300 acres burned and raised as a result of the fire. We lost heads of cattle equipment, you know, $23 million um, in damage. It may not seem like a lot in some communities, but it's very big for ours. Um, so again, thank you, but we do know that there's a lot of work that needs to be done, a lot more funding for disasters. Um, after Lahaina, we have seen so much more, and so we need to start funding uh, these efforts so that you and your teams can do good work in the community. Uh, the hard part about going almost last is a lot of questions have been asked already, so I'll try to jump to some different ones that have not been touched on yet. Um, I wanted to talk a, a little bit about um, our need to continue our ongoing commitment to the 1890 and 1994 land grant universities. As you know, I remain committed uh, and concerned about access to scholarship and resources for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander students. And I know we've discussed this, Mr. Secretary, before when you spoke to our Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. However, I reiterate the need for Congressman Zablon's AANHPISI opportunity Act, of which I'm an original co-sponsor. And so what is your position on establishing grants to support Asian American and Pacific Islander-centered agricultural research and scholarships for AANHPI students? And what steps has the department taken to support AANHPI farmers as well? We've included those students in our Next Gen initiative, which is designed to provide resources uh, to minority-serving institutions across the board. Uh, to fund scholarships, internships, fellowships, and things of that nature. 
That's $262 million from the uh, American Rescue Plan that's been uh, circulated or, pro or provided in a series of grants. Uh, we've also made sure that our Office of Partnership, uh, uh, basically, as it administers the uh, Scholars Program, ensures that it is administered in a, in a holistic way. Um, and I think you'll see that there are actually more, uh, more grants and more scholarships that have been awarded recently. Thank you for that, and I would just reiterate as well, and we've spoken ab about this before, that as we do outreach to these particular communities, we need to be conscious about the best way and most effective way to reach out to them, oftentimes to considering a language access and barriers that may be particular issues, cultural um, barriers as well, and so to the extent that that can be aggressively integrated into your outreach so we can make sure that those individuals, those students have access, able to participate actively, I would appreciate that. Um, we have a very extensive process now where we're trying to convert a lot of our information to multiple languages to make sure that uh, information is more readily available to a broad, broader scope of individuals. Thank you. And, and somewhat along those lines, when I take a look at, and we talk about indigenous agriculture, by the way, if you're able to, to join us in Hawaii, we can really expose you to some of the uniqueness of Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander traditional farming practices and techniques, crops that for us might be, they're staple crops for us, specialty crops to others. But on this particular issue, I often see in my home state and my district how challenging it can be uh, for my producers, including Native Hawaiian producers, to access USDA programs in the first place. Mr. Secretary, underrepresented and underserved producers have been calling on the department to pilot a navigator program to help them navigate USDA's systems and processes for some time now. What's your position on the need for and the effectiveness of such a pilot program to be able to, to connect up our farmers, ranchers, and producers with the support and help that's available and they need, but is right now very inaccessible to them in the way it's being offered? Well, uh, both the Farm Service Agency Office and the uh, NRCS have engaged in the signing of a series of cooperative agreements similar to what you've outlined. Uh, Farm Service has over 30 of these agreements. Uh, uh, NRCS has over 100 of them uh, with organizations and entities designed to provide uh, outreach uh, to historically underserved uh, producers to make sure that they are aware of programs and to help guide them through uh, whatever the application process is. Uh, needs to be. So that's already taking place uh, in both both of those agencies. I would humbly suggest, and I'm glad to see that these cooperative agreements are in place, um, but for many of us that represent communities with high populations, for example, I'm specifically talking about AA and HPI communities, uh, let's just make sure that the individuals we are actually contracting with, that the method in which we are outreaching to them through these individual groups um, are the most effective possible. So I uh, welcome further communication with you on this because the, at the end of the day, I want to make sure my farmers, ranchers, and producers can actually um, engage with the USDA in a meaningful way. I have a number of other questions relating to natural disasters and rural health. Um, I know, Chair, an interest you and I both share in terms of making sure that food is viewed as medicine and we can help our rural communities, so we'll submit that for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank the general lady. <coughs> now, please to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Duarte, for five minutes of questioning. A big thank you. Thank you to the secretary. Thank you. I had just a month ago best of breed growers in my district, um, very established farm families, almond, walnut, wine grape growers, diversified, um, long term families, call me into a meeting with bankers talking about a farm liquidity crisis, a farm um, borrowing crisis in the Central Valley. Um, almond prices have been low for a long time, pistachios. Walnuts are through the floor. Wine grapes are in an entire glut right now, greatly due to a lack of exports. But nonetheless, anything you can do, Mr. Secretary, with the Consumer Protection Financial Bureau or Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to loosen the screws a little bit on ag lending is going to be very, very important. Anything you can do with the farm credits to make sure that ag lenders can get their growers through this crisis. Because if, if you look at the aggregate numbers, American farm values and ag Ag revenues are down um, tens of billions of dollars in the last couple of years. In specialty crops in California, a lot of these high export crops, it's disproportional pain. And so please look at ag lending, um, look at farm liquidity. It, it's a crisis. Um, 
The crisis stems greatly from trade deals, um, from trade. And not necessarily, you know, lack of trade deals, yes, there's a lot we can do there. But the retaliatory agricultural tariffs um, from China, India, and Turkey, those are the big pieces of the pie chart, uh, are really what's causing, in my opinion, the agricultural crisis today, the commodity gluts, the low prices, and the low, the low farm returns. I'm carrying a bill, but I believe you have it within your power to look at the Commodity Credit Corporation. My bill is called Foreign Retaliatory Agricultural Tariff Supplement. Simply use the Commodity Credit Corporation fees instead of some of the uh, other programs that are elevating farmers under low prices to simply supplement back the retaliatory ag tariffs being put on farm exports. If we export almonds at 25% tariff to China, supplement that back to the exporter, get it down to the grower, and that would alleviate the gluts that are killing farm returns right now today. And so I'd very much like to connect with you or anybody in your trade group on an um, FRAT's proposal. We just won a five-year World Trade Organization lawsuit against China's retaliatory ag tariffs, and those ag tariffs are still in place and they're really crushing on, Cali on, on American agriculture. So I'd, I'd invite you to look at that. Um, I also want to look at, um, I've, I've worked in some plant biotechnology over the years. Gene editing is a brave new frontier in, um, in plant biotech and plant improvement and solving a lot of the long-term sustainability problems and challenges that we have in, in uh, growing crops, especially clonal crops like grapes and almonds where it's not easy to breed new seed each year. Um, there are people, um, you've got an a undersecretary for market services, Jenny Moffat in your group, who I'm getting a lot of feedback on is really restricting the types of CRISPR editing that can be done in plants and still qualify under the biopesticide exclusions. Um, it's really not the realm of USDA to be, je to, to be del delving into these biopesticide exclusions. Um, that's really an EPA area. But I'd invite you to take a look at that and make sure that America maintains its leadership in plant biotechnology, especially in the CRISPR gene editing area. Um, it's incredibly important. I think 37 Nobel laureates just signed a joint letter encouraging the EU to maintain leadership in this field. I'd hate to see America give up our leadership in biotechnology, which we've, we've established over many years. Um, and fourth, I'm not letting you talk much today, but you've had a lot of that. <laughs> At least I'm not breaking your chops too hard. Um, the, the fourth thing I'd, I'd want to talk about is the crop insurance and um, using the example of the citrus producers in California as a, as a um, case. We've had the Oriental and the Queensland fruit flies in, infest California citrus, causing huge marketing problems with our crop, huge movement pro, um, problems within our fresh crop and citrus. And I really want to make sure that our crop insurance programs allow for marketability losses due to exotic pest infestations and disease infestations, as well as catastrophic weather events and other losses. Um, these things cost farmers the same, the same loss of returns and revenue as, uh, as, as catastrophic weather events, and they're often almost all the time out of the control of the farmers themselves. Thank you for listening. I'm sure you'll have something to say for the next person. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Chairman. I yield back. <laughs> Gentleman yields back. Now I'm pleased to recognize the uh, general lady uh, there we were, yep, from Minnesota, uh, Congresswoman Craig, to wish her a very happy birthday to begin with. What a, what a way to spend a birthday. This is fantastic. There you go. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Secretary, for making and, my birthday. And for five minutes of questioning. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you for being here, Secretary Vilsack. It's a uh, great honor to be here uh, with you on my birthday. So uh, from your own visit to Minnesota two weeks ago to Deputy Secretary Torres Small's visit in 2021, I know that you and your team at USDA have been great partners in working to support family farmers and rural economies in Minnesota and across the country. So thank you for that partnership. I know uh, you've put some miles on yourself over the last uh, three years, and we appreciate your dedication to family farmers. I've got a few questions. I won't let you get off as easy as my colleague there, so I'm going to get right to it. Um, first of all, we have a unique opportunity in front of us to get sustainable aviation fuel off the ground and in places like my district, and in rural America into this emerging market that we fought for in the Inflation Reduction Act. 
I know you're enthusiastic, and I want to thank you so much for your support of renewable fuels over the years and for your championship of SAF. It does not go unnoticed by my family farmers uh, and by myself. However, it's frustrating to hear that there's still some uncertainty about the updated GREET model. I know the president has a goal of hitting 35 billion gallons of SAF by 2050, which is laudable, yet we're still waiting on a determination from the interagency working group on GREET modeling. So let me just push you here. Um, how have the discussions been in that interagency working group to update the model? And can we expect those updates to be announced on March 1st as originally directed in the December guidance from Treasury? And if not, when should we expect them? Uh, conversations have been positive uh, in terms of expanded access to feedstocks uh, to produce SAF. And I'm confident that there is a, a genuine desire on the part of all the agencies and the White House to meet that March 1st deadline. Excellent. That's a great answer. Thank you. Um, I know that you'll see this soon, but I'm leading a bipartisan bicameral letter with 25 of my colleagues on the issue. It'll be sent to members of the working group at the end of the day today. Um, and please know that there are American farmers that have been unable to scale up their production because they're waiting on this guidance, and we certainly are looking forward to it, and hopefully by that March 1st timeline. Um, my second question is about the Grassland Conservation Reserve Program, CRP. We know it is an absolute critical program that supports farmers and the work that they do to sustain the lands uh, that they farm. And thank you for your remarks in your opening statement there. My home state of Minnesota is eighth in the country for the number of acres enrolled and third in annual rental payments for the program. So I know there's an ongoing conversation about turning CRP into a dollar-based program. Given the rising costs of land, um, how do you foresee this impacting CRP's effectiveness uh, if that happened? You know, uh, what's interesting about the grassland part of the, of the CRP program is we're now at a record level of enrollment. There's a lot of activity and a lot of interest in the grassland, and, uh, and we've continually seen that each year uh, in terms of the sign-up. There's still robust interest in CRP, and I would anticipate and expect that's going to continue. Um, uh, you know, I think there's a, there, there will be an interesting uh, intersection of climate smart activities and ecosystem service markets and the potential opportunities for CRP to be um, integrated into that system. Uh, but I think right now we're, we're excited about the opportunities and we continue to see a lot of interest in it. And, you know, we are sensitive to making sure that the rental rates are in a situation where they don't necessarily encourage or discourage, um, encourage or discourage the use of productive farmland for productivity and non-productive land for going into CRP. I think I have just enough time to sneak in one more question. I know the Farm Bill is on top of everybody's mind. It's certainly on mine as well, and that American Ag is at a crossroads. It's just essential that we continue to improve the farm safety net. What should leg legislators be keeping in mind as we look to strengthen the farm safety net in the Farm Bill from your perspective, Secretary Vilsack? Well, I think the challenge is to find uh, the resources to strengthen the safety net without necessarily uh, jeopardizing the capacity of nutrition assistance to do what it needs to do and without taking resources away from conservation, which benefits a, a broad array of, of producers. Uh, I think that's the challenge, and I think, uh, I think there's a creative way to do that. Uh, that doesn't necessarily uh, limit SNAP and doesn't necessarily take money from the IRA. I think that's the key. I couldn't agree with you more. And with that, Mr. Secretary, thank you, and I yield back. Happy birthday. Thank you. I thank the gentle lady um, for uh, sharing her birthday with us today. Um, and please recognize a gentleman from, from, uh, gentleman from Iowa, uh, Representative Nunn, for five minutes of questioning. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Secretary of Agriculture, for being with us today. Unfortunately, we are talking to farmers who are facing larger than expected year-to-year -year losses. In fact, a drop in net income in 2024 alone. This is one of the largest drops of nearly $40 billion that everyday farmers across the country are facing. In fact, it's down 25% just from last year. So let's get directly to it. Look, the reality is that taxpayers have invested over $500 million in the expansion of biofuels, and I appreciate my colleague on the other side of the aisle, Congresswoman Craig. We've worked together on this issue. 
But at the same time, taxpayers under this administration have also put $40 billion into electric vehicle infrastructures through the Inflation Reduction Act. So let's begin here. Our home state of Iowa. Biofuels produced in our home state provide Americans with cheaper and cleaner fuel. Mr. Secretary, we could both agree to that. Is that right? Yes. Is it true that biofuels reduce greenhouse gas emissions and have a lower carbon footprint when compared with traditional fuels? Yes. Do you believe that America's energy independence is a priority for national security? Sure. So here we are in a situation where we are now putting $40 billion directly into a competition of an electric vehicle system that directly funds one of our key competitors, that of China. Are you aware of the fact that China uses child slave labor for the production and elicitation of a number of the critical minerals necessary to build batteries? Uh, I, I, uh, that's why we're uh, focused on investing in battery uh, production here in the U.S. But we haven't done that yet. Well, we so are here, doing. Mr. Secretary, I'd like to talk uh, about where some of our additional competition comes from, and that's in our export markets. When we talk about foreign competitors, let's talk about Brazil. You know, last year, the U.S. exported 1,600, 1600 million bushels uh, of corn. Additionally, the U.S. exported 1.25 billion gallons of ethanol to that same market. But, Mr. Secretary, it's not also true that Brazil has increased their tariffs on U.S. ethanol 18 percent last year? That is true. And as a result, they, the United States is now importing nearly 40 million bushels. I, I don't know what the exact number is, but uh, um, I'm sure you Cer do. It certainly makes it harder for Iowa farmers when we're competing in a tariff involved it, it, environment. I would ask the administration to look into this and be able to push back on our competitors, not just and, Brazil, but around the world. And we do. We do. Mr. I've Secretary, would you also agree I've that a lack of access to global markets is harming the U.S. biofuel industry? Uh, no, I wouldn't agree with that because we So actually, us not being able to sell to foreign countries we, is not harming U.S. We, farmers. We, we actually are seeing an increase in activity on the, on the export side of biofuels. We've seen it in Japan. Japan recently... Uh, not nearly enough to make up for what we're losing well, in markets uh, like Brazil, your, like Your, your question suggests Africa. that we weren't doing any of that, and that's just not accurate. You know, Mr. Secretary, there are 87,000 farmers in our home state. The average farmer is 57. In fact, most of those farmers are approaching an age where they're going to be over 70 years old. We don't expect any other industry to have to not only have a 25 percent loss in revenue over last year without providing some on-ramps and some incentives from our own federal government. So here's what I'd like to ask of us. Please join with this committee, as we've done in the Farm Bill, to provide on-ramps for new farmers, non-traditional farmers, veteran farmers. These are things that not only help grow Iowa's economy, but help keep us competitive around the world. And I'll also say that some of the conservation practices that are coming out of Iowa are a model not only for the U.S., but are ones that the USDA could learn from. And right now, working with USDA, while I appreciate the individual groups, is a top-down only approach. And I see some folks in the audience today with past Goldies Act. USDA has consistently fallen short in enforcing puppy mills in Iowa, now ranked as one of the worst in the country. In fact, our local law enforcement have asked USDA for support, and time and time again, they've made it difficult. That's part of what's in this farm bill. So, Mr. Secretary, as we work together on a farm bill, I hope that your agency and this committee continues to listen to Iowa farmers who are leading the charge in this, not just in biofuels, but in our best practices across the board. And so, Mr. Secretary, I'll end where we started here. When it comes to what this administration is committed to and you have done, is this effort for year-round E15 that you committed to this committee last year going to be ready in 2024? I think, I think, it's, I think we're going to have E15 year-round. I, I don't know what year. I don't know if it's 2024 or 2025. If it's 2025, I'm uh, reasonably confident that we'll see access to E15. You know what? I appreciate me, that, Mr. Finish. Secretary, but the let reality has been let me you finish, consistently promise this, and here we I are know. years in the making. No. no, I have eight seconds left, and I just want to highlight this, Mr. Secretary. It is important that not only do we work together, but we follow through on our commitments we are that we make to Iowa through. Farmer. We are following With that, Mr. Se Chair, I yield not, back. It's not fair to, to mischaracterize what we're doing here, Congressman. That's just not fair. That's Mr. Not Secretary, Iowa. I'll tell you what, that's 2024. Not Iowa. You, you made that commitment that we would be able to be E15 year round. Is that well, correct? We are going to be E15 expired. year round. We are. You just told me 2025 or sometime in the future. Well, we will be E15.
And I'll tell you, we're the best administration for ethanol in the history of this country, and I can guarantee That's only because of Iowa farmers and others who have led the charge on this. And I'm glad you're responsive to them, but that is a huge Gentleman's part. Let's give credit expired. to the farmers I'll on this. Thank you. recognize the gentlelady from Connecticut, Congresswoman Hayes, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Got it nice and chilly in here for you, Secretary Vilsack, so <laughs> you guys had to heat it up. Uh, thanks for being here again to talk to us. It's no surprise. You already know what I'm going to ask about. But before I begin my questions, I just want to um, make note of the fact that we saw a chart earlier from the Republicans that showed that cost neutrality, their cost neutrality plan would not cut SNAP benefits. I think it is pretty basic math to say that as more people are accessing these programs and it's growing, if we are not continuing to invest in them, that is, in essence, cutting uh, SNAP benefits. You can call it whatever you want. But we pulled uh, data from the CBO's May baseline that refutes that account. So I have another chart that I would like to introduce into the record to show that if we keep the thrifty food plan cost neutral, this is the Republicans' plan, this is the Democrats' plan. Benefits will be decreased. I'd like to enter that into the record, Mr. Chair. Without objection. Thank you. Secretary Vilsack, as you know, SNAP is the leading anti-hunger program in the nation. And according to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, the program reduces food insecurity by 30%. I've heard several times in this hearing that food is national security. So I would hope that we would be trying to feed more people, not less, here in America. Uh, and to do that, we've heard a lot about the data and how it's collected. SNAP administrators provide application assistance, answer qu client questions, and offer verification guidance for SNAP applicants. Throughout the pandemic, as you mentioned earlier, some of the there was lots of flexibility, and SNAP administrators were stretched beyond capacity as they worked to ensure families were f fed. Now, as we're looking at how do we improve these programs, as of April 2023, states and towns struggled to fill over 833,000 open positions for the employees who actually do this work. I have concerns about that because I don't want us to look at the program as ineffective or inefficient because of staffing or administrative concerns. So Secretary Vilsack, what have you heard from state agencies about obstacles to recruiting and retaining SNAP administrators? I think most of the agencies have asked for some kind of relaxation. And the concern is we're providing $5.7 billion to states across the country to administer these programs. Uh, and I think it's uh, I important and necessary for them to do what they need to do to be able to, to recruit the, the staff necessary to administer these programs properly without necessarily cutting corners. Because when you cut corners, it risks the integrity of the program. So we're encouraging folks uh, to get back to uh, normal business. Mm -hmm. um, and we appreciate the importance of flexibility, but there is a, a, I think there's a balance between flexibility and making sure that the resources we're providing them are being used adequately and appropriately to staff these programs. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Last week I introduced the SNAP Administrators Retention Act, which would allow states to receive 100% of the costs associated with hiring and retaining staffs staff to run these programs. Additionally, it aligns the wages of the, of the state SNAP administrators with federal wages. These are common sense solutions to improve access to SNAP, prevent backlogs, and feed real people. Secretary Vilsack, on February 8th, the USDA sent letters to states, including my state of Connecticut, expressing concern about the decline in several key benchmarks of state administration of SNAP. I heard you say earlier people don't know about the benefits, they don't have access to them, they're not really sure um, how to go about getting them. Can you please elaborate on how the Food and Nutrition Service plans to collaborate with states to improve program efficiency? We continue to provide technical assistance uh, to states as they uh, grapple with particular issues. We also have the Employment and Training Program, the SNAP Education Program. There's a variety of ways in which we are providing assistance to states uh, in the administration of this program. Uh, the, the challenge, I think, is that some states basically don't, they, they're not as aggressive as they need to be mm -hmm. to make sure that people who qualify for the program actually sign up for the program. So we, we basically keep track, and if we see somebody that's below uh, par, uh, we basically encourage them to to step up their, act, uh, their activities. Sometimes it's with seniors, sometimes it's with language issues, uh, sometimes it's just making sure that uh, the word gets out and you don't create too many barriers uh, to participation. 
Well, um, thank you for that. And like you, I agree that the government does work. We can make it work. Uh, I can tell you when a storm hits and FEMA comes, people are happy to see the government. I have a piece of legislation closing the college hunger gap, which does exactly that. When students apply for a FAFSA, they would know if they were eligible for a program like SNAP. And we're all, it's one government. We have the ability to communicate across agencies, and I think we could do a better job of doing that. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, Ms. Chair, I yield back. Gentlelady's time has expired. Now please recognize the <clears throat> gentleman from Indiana, Dr. Baird, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for being here today. My first question deals with uh, getting some idea uh, where you think you are in drafting the implementation of the Sustains Act. Uh, that's the that's a public public private partnership program that'll bring private dollars into the conservation program. So, where do you think we are on that issue? We, I, I've had a number of conversations with. Uh, individuals in the investment bank uh, a world that would potentially be uh, interested in promoting additional conservation investments. Um, and we're, pro we're providing opportunities for them to understand the various programs. Uh, I think there is uh, some interest uh, in this, and I think it's also reflected in uh, participation in, in the Climate Smart Commodity Partnership Initiative. We have a broad array of uh, food interests retail interest, uh, nonprofit interest, as well as uh, foundation interest in that program. Excuse me. Uh, in continuing on in that vein, so to speak, uh, the IRA conservation funding is limited to practices that are climate smart, which we mentioned here earlier, as defined by USDA staff, and that makes roughly 30 to 70 percent of the conservation practices ineligible in some states for IRA conservation funding. And from my vantage point, this removes the locally led producer first nature of these programs and allows USDA staff in Washington, D.C. to choose which natural resource concerns can be addressed in Indiana or elsewhere. So, Mr. Vilsack, since IRA funding is limited to climate smart practices, how can you ensure that the locally led nature of conservation programs won't be lost? And how important is the locally led component of conservation programs? I, I don't think that's, uh, I, I don't think they're being lost, uh, Congressman. I think we're seeing tremendous interest and participation by farmers and ranchers and producers across the board. That's why these programs have all been oversubscribed. We have literally have thousands of applications uh, for the resources that are available above and beyond the resources that are available. So there's tremendous interest in this. So I don't think we're leaving anybody behind in this process. And I think people at the local level are fully engaged. Uh, additional resources are going into personnel and cooperative agreements to get the word out. Um, we're very pleased with the, the way in which the countryside has responded to this. I think that's an important issue, the fact that you, the locals participate and have input into the kind of programs they're interested in. And I think we need to make sure we carry that on through and uh, follow up on that, that kind of activity. So thank you. I yield back, I yield back Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. Now please recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Davis, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. Thank you so much for um, coming before the House Agriculture Committee today. I would like to uh, first amplify that in rural North Carolina and rural America, uh, we continue to rely greatly on rural development in particular, um, new fire trucks, getting those out into communities um, that often rely heavily on volunteer departments, um, telehealth services, um, that's huge um, for our rural communities. Um, also looking at ways to continue to help with economic um, support to small businesses. So I just want to continue to lift that up. What I, where I would like to spend a little bit more time today is in particular um, looking in, and talking about broadband. Um, broadband in terms of the long-term success of eastern North Carolina and much of rural America depends on access, you know, making affordable access. My question is, 
Um, can you provide insight into the challenges that remain in bridging the digital divide and especially as we're talking, getting this out into rural communities? Well, I think the challenge is making sure that uh, first and foremost, the states do the job of utilizing the resources that are now being made available to them under the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, to expand uh, access to broadband in areas that currently are underserved or are unserved. Uh, secondly, I think it's uh, important for us to make sure that as we are expanding access that we're doing it in a way that is meaningful broadband access, that it provides the kind of uploads and downloads speeds that will allow um, a family, for example, to have the ability to have uh, somebody download more than one person at a time. Um, I think it's important as well uh, that we continue to fund, and you mentioned telemedicine, uh, distance learning, that we continue to fund the tools that will allow institutions to utilize uh, this expanded access to broadband in a way that it then expands educational opportunities or healthcare opportunities uh, in, in, uh, in small and remote, remote areas. And then finally, I think we, you know, we're going to continue to look at, at, the, at the technology necessary to make sure that it gets to the most remote of areas. Sometimes it's not physically or financially feasible to have particular technologies. Uh, uh, and then there's a workforce issue and making sure that we have adequate number of people who are qualified uh, to install and to maintain uh, these systems. So it's a combination of all of that. And Mr. Secretary, as a follow-up here, uh, do you have any sense of a time in which we'll see significant coverage across rural America? Well, I can tell you that based on the recent survey uh, that we concluded and published yesterday, we've seen an increase in access among American farms and ranches. About 78 percent of uh, farms and ranches uh, uh, report basically access to broadband, and that's up from 75 percent. Um, I, think, uh, I think you're going to see rather dramatic increases over the course of the next three to five years as the resources that have been made available under the inf infrastructure law are fully, uh, uh, fully obligated and ultimately result in the construction and implementation. I mean, you're seeing it now with our ReConnect program. Uh, we've basically gotten resources out the door. Uh, there are over 100 projects that we've, we have announced awards for that are moving forward. You're going to see progress on those. Uh, and I think you're going to see states uh, aggressively use the resource that's now available to them uh, under the, uh, the Commerce Department and the uh, uh, FCC's uh, uh, efforts. Okay. And Mr. Secretary, I have another question. The issue of hunger, in particular in the military, has been receiving a lot of attention um, lately in the recent months, um, thanks to the tireless work of advocates and organizations on the ground. Um, when I look at the 2022 National Defense Authorization Act, it included a new basic uh, needs allowance for lower income service members, uh, which will help to address the issue. Um, it is reaching less service members than we would hope. Uh, but my question to you, um, are there any steps in particular that USDA or um, Congress you believe should take in order to address food insecurity in particular with the military families? We, we have an ongoing uh, uh, effort with the Department of Defense to institute this program and to make sure that families are aware of uh, the capacity to qualify for these programs. Uh, I'd like the opportunity, Congressman, to get back to you with what recommendations the folks who have been worked, working directly with the Department of Defense have about any improvements to the, to the effort. Uh, obviously, we're deeply concerned about making sure that uh, the, those who serve us uh, are available, that they uh, can t fully utilize the programs that, uh, that we have. Um, so let me get back to you. Thank you. And yield back, Mr. Chair. Gentleman's time has expired. Now please recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Langworthy, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, mm -hmm. Secretary Vilsack, I appreciate you being here once again as we continue to craft an effective farm bill that supports our family farmers and reduces the regulatory burdens on uh, of this administration. But before I get into that, I want to bring to your attention an issue that is still impacting my district in, in rural upstate New York. Um, as you may recall, just um, about a year and a half ago, from in December of 22, Winter Storm Elliott ravaged uh, my district in western New York and across the southern tier. And this was a once in a generation storm that brought unprecedented blizzard like conditions and sub zero temperatures to the western New York community. Uh, Winter Storm Elliott also wreaked havoc 
on the dairy industry, uh, resulting in the closure of dairy plants and extensive dumping of milk. Farmers in my district face the grim reality of being unable to have their milk collected and delivered, compounding an already dire situation. Uh, I do recall that USDA set up a milk loss program, and I appreciate the efforts that the department has made uh, with the rollout of milk loss payments to producers in my district. However, I understand there's also a pending component of the program to reimburse cooperative loss. And as you know, dairy cooperatives uh, play a vital role in strengthening and supporting the well-being of family farm operations in my district and nationwide. Uh, and with that, Mr. Secretary, I was wondering if you had an update or a timeline that you can share today on when those cooperative losses uh, will be made available and if the department has made any progress on that. Uh, I'm interested in anything this committee can do to support you in this effort and help move this along. Let me get a specific answer to that question. Congressman, I'm, I'm, as I sit here today, I don't know specifically about the status of that. I thought you were going to ask me about the dairy margin coverage program, and I have a, a response to that question, but uh, not to this one. Well, I mean, our, our, our farmers have been without payment for, you know, almost a year and a half now, and, and this is ridiculous. I, it's concerning to me that, you know, we have had no reimbursement for cooperative losses uh, that have been made at all, and equally troubling is the lack of communication to producers uh, in my district regarding a timeline or updates prior to today's hearing. So it's really important that we get this information to share uh, with our constituents, um, and it's important to me that, you know, our farmers f feel that they've been communicated with. Uh, and, and they've been left in the dark at this point by the department. Uh, our, our agricultural producers, they're already struggling with this administration's egregious green agenda and the regulatory policies that are causing our energy pol uh, prices to skyrocket, and it's put farmers' backs against the wall. Uh, and, and this, you know, can also run them right out of business. So all I ask you to do today is to expeditiously use all the tools that the department has to get an answer and get these payments uh, move forward, um, and I think that's uh, a very important step uh, for the farmers in my district. Now, uh, moving on uh, to a different topic, uh, Mr. Secretary. Last year, Dr. George Krub, the director of National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, suggested in an interview that the next version of our dietary guidelines for Americans might change the definition of moderate alcohol consumption uh, to just two alcoholic drinks per week for men and women. Now, that would be a dramatic change uh, from the current definition of up to two drinks per day uh, for each man and woman, uh, which is included in the DGA's release of uh, December 2020. Does the USDA share Dr. Koob's suggestion that drinking more than two beers a day is excessive? Uh, and if so, can the USDA point to any new scientific studies released since December 2020 that would justify such a dramatic change uh, in that definition of moderate consumption? You know, frankly, our focus on the dietary guidelines is on the dairy dietary guidelines and not things that are necessarily uh, outside or being considered outside of the dietary guidelines. We want to make sure that it's science-based. What, whatever is decided needs to be science-based, uh, and that's why you set up a system with experts. You give inf experts the information. They make decisions based on the preponderance of the evidence. That's, we want to make sure that that system is followed, whether it's alcohol or any other aspect of, uh, of our diets. We want to make sure it's science-based. That's what I'm committed to doing. Okay, Mr. Secretary, well, I understand this process is developing the 2025 dietary guidelines. That is well underway right now. Uh, I just ask that any recommendation is based on sound science and not the usual regulatory overreach that we've seen uh, by this administration. Um, and uh, my additional question I'm not going to have enough time for. I'm going to submit to you uh, in writing. And, and Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentlelady from Kansas, Ms. Davis, is now recognized for five minutes of questions. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for being here today. Uh, I'm uh, very proud and happy to get the chance to serve uh, as the representative for the Kansas 3rd um, District. And uh, my district is comprised of rural, uh, urban, suburban, exurban. Um, it's a pretty, uh, a pretty diverse district, um, and I do think we have uh, an excellent, we serve as an excellent example of the critical role that USDA plays in, uh, frankly, in every community across the country. You know, Kansas 
uh, farmers and producers, in my view, are uh, are some of the best in the world, and would love actually to extend an invitation for you to come and uh, and visit us to see some of the innovative um, and certainly important work that uh, that they're doing out there. Um, in addition to my role on the Agriculture Committee, I also serve on the Small Business Committee and Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. And through those roles, I um, really have had the chance to work on uh, supply chain issues from quite a few different angles. Uh, strengthening the agriculture supply chain is, is important for uh, all Americans, uh, particularly uh, for our farmers and producers as um, as they uh, are providing food for folks. Uh, and I, kn I know that the USDA uh, is doing a lot of work on this. There's tons of USDA employees who have taken steps to strengthen our agriculture supply chains as we recover from some of the recent challenges we've been seeing. And uh, I'm uh, particularly grateful for some of the USDA food inspectors and um, the folks who are taking the time to make sure that uh, that uh, meat and poultry, poultry processing are happening um, in a safe and um, effective way. So I want to say that you know, the, the progress that we've seen, uh, which is a testament to the hard work of producers, processors, truckers, you know, the, the intermodal workers, so many different people, uh, we haven't seen uh, the grocery costs that uh, folks are dealing with come down um, for consumers in the way that, uh, frankly, a lot of people um, need and, and would depend on. You know, it remains a top concern for a lot of folks in my district, high, high grocery costs. And um, I did get the chance to discuss this with uh, Deputy Secretary Torres Small pa this past fall, and um, would love to hear from you about some of the specific actions that USDA has been taking to increase the resilience of the agriculture supply chains to help to help bring down those costs for folks? Well, let me uh, give one example, uh, an initiative that we, we're working with the Department of Transportation uh, to make sure that we are doing a good job of uh, understanding the flow uh, and de deciding or identifying where there may be barriers uh, in the supply chain and the flow of goods from here to there uh, that create additional cost or additional disruptions that can result in supply shortages, which in turn result in uh, increased uh, cost. Um, we have an initiative with the Department of Transportation uh, to basically share data and information and analyze that information so we can identify problems. Uh, we also have uh, a, uh, an effort with the Department of Transportation to take a look at the, the supply of containers so that we know where there may be potential uh, problems with container supply that we can in turn make sure that uh, adequate uh, 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 containers are available to basically move product. That's one area. And then there's, there, there's also the area, sometimes we forget the, the role that, that, that a particular disease uh, or problem might result in terms of uh, food costs. I'm thinking about HPAI, the avian influenza, and the impact and effect it has on eggs. Uh, when there is an outbreak, when there is an expansion of, of HPAI for the migratory bird uh, population, well, we, we're working with the industry to try to figure out ways in which we can minimize that. But when it occurs, egg prices go up because it impacts the supply of eggs. So there, there are a multitude of, uh, of challenges with reference to, to food prices. Yeah, and I uh, I appreciate that um, that there that there are a multitude of of issues. I do have a couple more questions. I will I will submit them uh, in writing. And the only thing I would say is I, I would love to work with you and your team on um, finding any hiccups that might exist in those uh, interagency interdepartment uh, uh, agreements that you have when you're looking at things like supply chains. Uh, thank you so much. I yield back my time. General Lay yields back. Now, please recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Alford, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. I think you'll be glad to know that since we last met here a year ago, I've boned up on pesticides. I am a freshman. I am learning every day about the ag industry and how we can help our farmers, ranchers, producers uh, in Missouri. I've been learning a lot lately about SNAP. Um, and I want to be clear that I, I truly believe, Mr. Secretary, we live in the greatest nation known to man. If someone is truly hungry, can't work, we should help them on a temporary basis. 
And I know Representative Moore has uh, touched on the SNAP overpayments, but I want to clarify just a few things with you today, Mr. Secretary. Each day in America, there are $30 million in overpayments in SNAP, $11 billion a year. Do you consider trying to eliminate overpayments, waste, abuse, and fraud as making cuts to the SNAP program or taking food away from those who rightly qualify for the program? No. Thank you for that answer. Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program is supposed to be a temporary help for those who are truly in need, and of course we know the N stands for nutrition. Yet the second most common SNAP purchase is sweetened drinks, $680 million, I believe, in 2022. Today, the obesity rate in America is nearly 40 percent, putting strain on an already stressed Medicare system. So, Mr. Secretary, how do I go home to the 4th Congressional District of Missouri and explain to my constituents and taxpayers there why we are doing this? Why are we funding to worsen the obesity crisis in America? Well, uh, Congressman, I think uh, you have to kind of uh, dive deep into uh, the utilization of those products. Uh, what you're going to find, I think, in many cases is that that is a substitute for caffeine, uh, a less expensive substitute for caffeine, for coffee and tea being more expensive. Uh, and many families basically use it for that purpose. Uh, what we try to do uh, in the SNAP program is provide education. Uh, we try to provide strategies for stretching that food dollar in a way that focuses on proper nutrition without stigmatizing those who are on SNAP. Well, Mr. Secretary, I in no way want to stigmatize anyone, but clearly the educational portion of this is not working. Our obesity rate is climbing through the roof. We are at, at uh, a financial uh, uh, crossroads now uh, in, with Medicare and Social Security, but this obesity issue I think can be directly related uh, in part uh, to poor nutrition in America, and, and part of that because of the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program. Well, the challenge, I think, is, to, is I don't believe you're suggesting this, I hope you're not, that it's only poor people that are obese or it's only poor No, people. sir, I am not. Okay. No, sir. Well, then the question been, then becomes what can we do as a country, not necessarily stigmatizing or setting aside one, one group of people, but recognizing the obesity issue is something that's, that, that's across, across the income levels, across well, I, race across the entire country. I do appreciate that. And that's, that's that, that is a great answer. We've got to focus in on that, but taxpayers should not be paying to make America more well, obese, in tax, my opinion. Taxpayer. Recently, Democrat Representative Jonathan Jackson and Don Davis and I filed the Fair Label Act to ensure consumers are fully informed and know the difference between meat from an animal and protein grown in the lab or a, a Petri dish. What is the USA doing to inform and protect consumers when it comes to uh, making them aware of what the, the truth is behind these sources of protein. We're, we're working on labeling to make sure that they properly represent uh, the product, uh, the characteristics of the product. We're working on labeling, just as we are working on the product of the U.S. How soon will that come out, sir? Um, I don't want to give you a specific timeline because I'm not confident as I sit here that I know, but I will certainly get that to you. It's, it, it, we are working on it. Okay, thank We are you. working, I will tell you though, that our priority is the product of the USA. Label, get that through the process because we do recognize people are taking advantage of that label uh, and consumers' expectations are not being met. There's misrepresentation there. We want to make sure that when you go to the grocery store, you see something product of the U.S., you know that everything was done. Good. Let's work together on that, sir. Finally, should citizens of adversarial nations, including Russia, China, Iran, Cuba, be allowed to purchase any land, including farmland, in the United States of America? You know, that's a tough question, and I'll tell you why. It's you got tough. 20 seconds to answer it. Well, you know, I'll tell you what. Let me, let me put it this way. Uh, it's a tough question. Uh, I think it's. A, I think the 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 amount of land that's being purchased by those folks is minimal. It's, I think people have this feeling that it's a lot of the land. It's not. I say Less. one outhouse is too many for a well, member it, of an adversarial be, nation to buy in our precious here, sovereign land. Here's the land. problem, sir. Here's the problem. You also want to sell product to those people. Some of those people. So when I'm talking to the Chinese ag minister, the first one of the first things he brings up is this whole notion of <coughs> Syngenta, Arkansas, and so forth. He, they're our number one customer. Can you go to Russia and buy land? Yeah, forget Russia. I'm talking about China. Can you go to I'm, China? You I'm can with a sponsor, China. but they have to have 51% no, sponsorship. And, 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 I, and that's how I responded. But the reality is that 
We're, I've gone over my time. I do thank you for being that's here. That's our number thank one you. customer. We have to be sensitive to that. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Now please recognize the gentlelady from Oregon, Congresswoman Salinas, for five minutes questioning. Uh, thank you, Chair Thompson, and um, thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for your leadership at uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. I just um, want to make a few clarifying points. Um, given uh, my colleague from Missouri, I think has some things mistaken. USDA ERS research has actually shown that SNAP participants purchase foods at rates similar to non-participants, and studies that actually track the impact of SNAP on the physical health of those recipients find that it's linked with improved nutritional outcomes, lower healthcare costs, and improved current and long-term health. And nutrition incentives, as I'm sure you're familiar with, or what we call double up bucks, those provided via GUSNIP are far more effective and productive. And um, would your agency be willing to discuss how Congress might work together to actually expand those programs? Absolutely. We, you know, we're, we're excited about those programs, and we appreciate the money that came from the American Rescue Plan to do so, to expand the programs. Thank you. Okay, now on to some of my questions for Oregon. Revitalizing rural America is of particular importance to Oregon's sixth district, my, my district, and since taking office, I've consistently heard from rural towns and communities, as well as local producers and landowners that all have a similar message. They're finding it really hard to access the resources the federal government has to offer, and really because they may not have the wherewithal to complete complex grant applications or follow up with reporting requirements. Unfortunately, the Rural Partners Network, which was established to help communities with precisely this problem, has not yet expanded to Oregon. And that's part of the reason that I intend to soon introduce the Rural Partnership and Prosperity Act, which was introduced over on the Senate side by Senators Casey and Fisher. The legislation would build on the Rural Partners Network via project and technical assistance grants. Putting that all aside for right now, though, could you just speak to the genesis of the Rural Partners Network and why it's so critical to provide that technical assistance to our rural communities so they can actually access programs intended precisely for them? You know, that program is really designed and specifically focused on persistently poor areas of the country, areas that have had a high poverty rate for decades. Uh, and it's designed to provide sort of intense care, uh, intensive care, uh, and, and a coordinated uh, federal government response to the persistent poverty. Uh, we've asked for additional resources from Congress to expand that program. To date, you all have not provided us those additional resources. Uh, having said that, uh, as, a, as a second wave of, of effort, we are expanding significantly the technical assistance grants that we are providing with some of our programs. In other words, we're creating, uh, setting aside resources to create technical assistance for those communities that need that. Uh, so that we're trying to expand it that way. We're using cooperative agreements. The other issue that we face is the match requirement. Oftentimes, uh, uh, communities would love to be able to participate, but they get discouraged because of the match requirement. So we're looking at ways in which we can distinguish between communities that are capable of making the match and those that aren't. Thank you. The Inflation Reduction Act included $100 million for wood innovation grants. Communities throughout Oregon have benefited from these grants, and I've introduced bipartisan legislation um, to actually increase access to the program. Can you speak to how these grants can help develop markets for forest products, as well as providing your overall evaluation of the success of the program? Well, it identifies uh, uh, ways in which uh, wood products can be used in creative ways. I think it's one of the reasons, uh, one of the reasons we've seen an expansion of the of the uh, cross laminated timber or mass timber effort. Uh, it started with a grant from one of those programs, and now we have over several several hundred, if not thou over a thousand. Uh, of these tall buildings now being constructed in the United States. Uh, so we give these grants in order to identify uh, market opportunities in order to be able to showcase how wood can be used creatively. Uh, and we're seeing a, a pretty uh, robust interest in these innovation uh, projects. We're making grants every year, uh, and we're seeing uh, an uptick, if you will, of interest in wood and wood products. Thank you. And as the ranking member on the Forestry Subcommittee, I'm particularly concerned by the dangers posed by increasingly intense wildfire events. And um, as was mentioned just several years ago in 2020, my state had its most destru destructive and deadly wildfire season ever. And I fear unless dramatic investments are made in prevention and mitigation, um, we will see another catastrophic fire season in Oregon and across the West. 
As you know, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act provided significant resources in the form of both new authority and new funding to the Forest Service. Can you speak to how these authorities are better enabling the agency to implement the 10-year strategy to address the wildfire crisis? We've been able to, to target and be able to get adequate resources to remove hazardous fuel from uh, uh, fire sheds and from landscapes that we know have high risk potential. No, Thank I'm, you. There's Thank a you. much more extensive answer to that, but that's the best I can do in five Thank seconds. you, and that's my time. I yield back. General Lee yields back. I uh, now please recognize uh, also from Oregon uh, the Congresswoman Chavez de Reamer for five minutes of questioning. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Good to see you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, and thank you for coming to testify today. I know it's been a long day. I've heard from an alarming number of constituents concerned about illegal vehicular camping occurring with the Deschutes County National Forest in my district. These activities are not only taken away from vital public resources from my constituents, but also leading to lasting environmental damage. Around Phil's Trailhead and along China Hat Road, there have been numerous reports of unsanctioned bonfires, trash dumping and burning, drug usage, dumping of human waste, trespassing onto adjacent private property, as well as violent crime throughout. Not only is there a concern that this is, there is no concrete plan of action to address these concerns, but also I am told that local volunteer organizations that are trying to work with the Forest Service will no longer be deployed due to safety concerns. Do you believe the current, the current citation system is effective or are stronger enforcement mechanisms needed to ensure that those that are trespassing will be held accountable and stop the damage from getting worse? Well, I think we need to look into that particular uh, set of issues. I'm more than happy to do that. Uh, thanks for bringing it to our attention. Uh, if there needs to be stronger enforcement, uh, we'll also obviously take a look at that. But in the meantime, let's figure out what we can do with this specific concern that you've expressed. So you'll commit to work with my office and the local agencies sure. uh, to find the solutions that are workable for, for us sure. both. Thank you. I would also like to note that in my office is aware of the Northwest Forest Plan Federal Advisory Committee planning session that recently happened in Eugene, Oregon. The FAC was established to bring in different perspectives to amend the National Forest Plan. I would hope that our office would be seen as a partner in any discussions involving our Northwest forest areas and will be involved in any future correspondence. Uh, but moving on, it was recently discovered that a Chinese billionaire, now I know my colleague uh, mentioned these about owning uh, uh, foreign ownership of U.S. farmland. After an $85 million purchase and nearly 200,000 acres of timberland in Oregon went unchecked for nearly 10 years, ownership of U.S. farmland by foreign adversaries not only makes U.S. farmers and ranchers uneasy about our nation's food security, but it also poses serious concerns about the ability for the next generation of farmers to access land and begin farming and ranching for themselves. I heard your answer previously, but Mr. Secretary, do you believe that there are effective enforcement mechanisms existing within the USDA currently to ensure foreign land ownership does not go unchecked, or are more enforcement abilities needed within the USDA or another agency? More is needed, uh, because right now we have a self-reporting system. There are over 3,000 county recorder offices in the country. It is very difficult for USDA to monitor all 3,000 county recorder offices for deeds that are being filed. So I think there is a need for a conversation about precisely how far folks want to go to be able to know what's trans what, what transactions are taking place. Do you want a public database where every transaction of real estate in this country will be funneled into a single database that the federal government will have access to? Well, certainly I'm to go unchecked, and in this particular case, uh, the purchaser was tied to the Chinese Communist Party, and that's why I question that. So I do hope that we can move further on this issue. I have a specific letter in uh, to your office asking that, so let's move on. Uh, I want to highlight that in Oregon, wheat growers rely heavily on utilizing the Columbia Snake River system. And as 90% of Oregon wheat is exported and over 60% of all U.S. wheat is transported through the river systems to markets overseas. This transportation method not only is safe and efficient, but it also is cost effective. Mr. Secretary, if the lower Snake River dams were to be breached and we lose this valuable transportation system, do you believe we will be able to continue to transport this volume of wheat to meet the global market demands? You know, I, I think Congress has the, the ability to determine whether or not a dam is going to be breached. And so you would obviously have the ability to stop that if there was a problem with agriculture. But do you believe that if this transportation is so valuable, 
It, it Would is, we be able to continue to transport the wheat volume if those lower snake dams were removed? Well, I, I would assume that you wouldn't let that happen. Uh, I'm, I won't have time for this next question on some labor questions, so I'll submit it for the record, uh, Mr. Chairman, and with that, I'll yield back my time. Gentlelady yields back. Um, now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Jackson, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Thompson. Great to see you again, and glad we've reconvened. Uh, once again, uh, Secretary Vilsack, I am honored to call you the Secretary of Agriculture. I can rest well knowing there's something in Washington that's working exceedingly well and that's your advocacy on behalf of all of Americans and our food security. Specifically, I'd like to ask you about research has shown that individuals in rural areas and small towns participate in SNAP at higher rates than individuals in urban areas. Additionally, USDA's Economic Research Service recently found that SNAP benefit spending disproportionately increased economic outputs in rural areas when compared to SNAP economic outputs in urban areas. Can you address the misconception that SNAP is a program predominantly utilized in cities and elaborate on how SNAP supports rural communities and combats food insecurity in rural areas? You know, Congressman, I think there are, there are a lot of misconceptions about SNAP. Um, and I think it stems from what, who people think are on SNAP. I think people find it surprising that a significant number of people on SNAP are actually working. I think most people uh, outside of those of us who know about the program think that it's all about people that aren't working. In fact, it's people that are working. I think there are the belief that there are a lot of folks who are uh, able-bodied and, and, and uh, uh, should, be, uh, should be working. The reality is that's a relatively small percentage of the SNAP population. I don't think people realize that senior citizens are a population in SNAP. People with people with disabilities are, are in SNAP. Working families are in SNAP, and a lot of children are involved in that SNAP program. So I think it starts and begins with the un misunderstanding about who's receiving the benefits of SNAP, and then from that you can you begin to you begin to think that that must be an urban centric group of people, but it's absolutely not. It's across the country. It's wherever poverty is, and poverty is everywhere. And so a follow-up question on that. You've heard of the practice of corporations actually steering people to these benefits on SNAP. Could you elaborate on that? There have been in the past companies that have suggested or have encouraged or have made available information about programs. I don't know if, if they are aggressively suggesting people sign up but making them aware of. Um, and I think that's part of the challenge. I mean, it's a balance. Uh, so can we conclude that there's a struggle for American workers and food insecurity is a major issue well, within there's, the country. There's no doubt that there are many, many, many working poor, working poor with the emphasis on working, people who are working a part-time job, multiple part-time jobs, or a full-time job at a minimum wage. You know, if you, if you know this, if you raise the minimum wage, you would, reduce, you would reduce the SNAP population by a significant amount. A follow-up question um, regarding the economic benefits of SNAP. The USDA has been very successful in getting more small businesses to participate in SNAP. Is there anything Congress needs to do to support this work? Can you elaborate more on how SNAP is benefiting our farmers, retailers, and the overall economy in addition to servicing low-income households? Well, the reality is if people have the ability to buy more product at a grocery store, they're going to do it. And when they do it, it means that everybody in that supply chain from the person who stocked it to the person who packaged it, who processed it, who produced it, who transported it, those jobs are all connected in, in event. And if you look at some of the major retailers, you'll find that a significant percentage of their business is SNAP oriented. So if you take SNAP and you reduce it or you eliminate it, you're obviously gonna impact not just the poor families that are receiving it, but you're also gonna impact all those people whose jobs are somewhat dependent on it. Um, is there any other comments that you care to make before I yield back my time, Mr. Secretary? <laughs> there are a lot of comments I'd like to make, but I think I'll just pass. <laughs> well, I'd like to say once again, uh, Mr. Silsack, thank you for your many, many years of service and your knowledge, and uh, let it be recorded that you've gone through this committee numerous times. You've taken all these questions really without notes, and uh, you've been here for three hours. You've gone without lunch 
once again as you fight for American families. And thank you for your service again. Mr. Chairman Thompson, I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. Uh, now I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Lamalfa for, Lamalfa for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Secretary, for your time and effort here today and what you do. Um, I, I can't let, let that dam removal bit uh, in, the, in the system that uh, Mr. Reamer was talking about go by. Yes, that would be very devastating for the shipping of crops in that area, as it's been devastating in my Northern California area with the removal of the Klamath dams partly underway now and the filth and stink and stench and muck that is moving down the Klamath River ostensibly to be helping fish. The wildlife that has been wiped out there, fish, you, you see hundreds of dead fish in the photos and deer that have been trapped out there, the fishing game had to shoot, all sorts of things going on with that. And then on, also on the hit list, and that's devastating agriculture in the Klamath Basin, as well as the water taken away from the Scott and Shasta rivers down below. Also the Eel River, where there's a dam slated to, on the hit list there that will devastate part of wine country. So dam removal is not something that Congress controls, otherwise we would have put a stop to that. It's a runaway uh, agencies and environmental groups. So the, uh, the issue with uh, forestry in my district in the West, we've suffered the campfire a few years ago. You know, 85 people lost their lives in Paradise area. And then the Dixie fire a couple years later, a million acre fire, in addition to the many hundreds of thousands of acres of fire, individual 100,000 acre fires. As you know, in the whole West, it's millions per year. So the issue comes down to what is Forest Service doing and the other entities, but we'll talk about Forest Service on federal lands to get the job done. I know they, a couple years ago, put out a, a concept of uh, 20 million by over 10 years of uh, forest treatment. Well, they have about 200 million acres in their purview. So that would mean uh, uh, 2 million acres per year over 200 million acres, that would take 100 years to cover that if, if they were actually doing that. So we've, we've given tools in past farm bills and are trying to enhance that in this current farm bill with more categorical exclusions to help move the ball. But they haven't taken advantage of as of As of recently, they only put a handful of them out to uh, move that. We have good demonstrations. We had a Tahoe project some years ago that uh, when wildfire hit that, the fire basically stopped where that treatment had happened. Other areas where treatment had happened on private lands. So. Secretary, what can we do to get the Forest Service to act and stop the lengthy delays in the project planning process and use these categorical exclusions as we're trying to advance more so in the Farm Bill and make larger, larger areas, 10,000, 15,000 acres, which you know, is a drop in the bucket on the millions of acres? Well, first of all, Congressman, 85% of the work that's being done is being done under the CE effort. So we are utilizing that tool on our ongoing regular, consistent basis. Well, that's good, but 85% of how much? Well, 85%, well, last year I think we did 4.2 million acres. Uh, and it, it, not every acre of land obviously is the same, so what we've been able to do is identify where the risks are the highest. We've established a number of uh, about 250 priority water sh uh, fire sheds where we are pr providing resources for treatment because we see that as the highest risk. Uh, and each year we're making, making the mark or meeting the mark that we set for, uh, for, for treatment. And then we're following up in areas that have been devastated in the past with reforestation efforts. But uh, so, part of the problem is that uh, in certain situations, burned acres are counted as treatment. And so no, when you're looking at the overall volume that we have to do, we have millions of acres we have to get done. And Chip, what I'm getting at is we have to have the private sector. We have to use all possible tools. Uh, good neighbor authority. We need tribes. We need local governments. We need cooperation and all not of just being done. slow. All, all of those tools are being used in a very extensive way. But to the volume, I'm talking, you know, pace and scale. We've got to scale it up dramatically or we're going to keep burying millions. Let me shift quickly to uh, the uh, climate smart. Um, I'm looking at some of the figures on that. First of all, on, on the goals, what, what are we hoping to reach? That's a five-year program, right? Correct. Okay, and it was funded by the IRA, right? No, it's funded by... Well, there's a kick-in of money towards that from the IRA, right? No. CCC, all right, thank you. But there is an influx of dollars to the... Anyway, let me, let me what I'm getting at. Uh, I see the stated goal of 60 million metric tons of CO2. What, what's our baseline? What, what percent of the atmosphere right now is CO2? 
I don't know what the percent is. Uh, the idea here is, isn't so much the specific amount, it's learning what works and what doesn't work so that we can make sure that in the future we are using resources, conservation resources in the most effective well, Okay, tell me this then, because farmers are gonna have to change practices to per participate and they could be frozen out no, no, no. if everybody's doing this. I, I'm a farmer in my real life too. I farm rice and so basically if CO2 tie up means no-till, I do not have that as an option, whereas a neighboring crop might have no-till as an option, I don't. So we're gonna be left behind. The farmers like the current conservation programs that are out there, EQIP and the others, but this new one here is gonna require them to jump through hoops in order to maybe be competitive or not. So just can you just close on that and I'll, I'll yield? Uh, can I? Go ahead. Um, do you want me to respond? Please, please, uh, Secretary. It's voluntary. Uh, it basically creates an opportunity for us to learn what works and what doesn't work. And it doesn't necessarily put people at a, at a competitive disadvantage at all, uh, because you also have the regular conservation programs that are, that are utilizing. And, and it's not requiring them to go through a series of hoops. It's re and in some cases, it's actually paying them for what they're already doing. But the idea here is to measure, monitor, and verify the results so that we know what works and what doesn't work so that we don't invest in what doesn't work. Okay, the CO2 number is 0.04% in the atmosphere. I yield back, okay. thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Sorensen, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As the only meteorologist in Congress, I, I knew the answer to that. I couldn't help you, Mr. Secretary, sorry. <laughs> um, but thank you for taking the time. I know it's been a, a long day. And um, as a meteorologist who worked in Western Illinois for so long, I tracked many of the storms that went over Mount Pleasant, Iowa. So um, I, I did wanna talk about um, what producers back home are talking about. Um, they've underscored the need for regionally specific data to help them identify the right conservation practices uh, for them that will improve soil health, build resilience, and sequester more carbon. Um, quite simply being smart with respect to uh, changing climate. Uh, my bar bipartisan bill advancing the research on climate impacts act or arachi will help the usda develop a standardized methodology to monitor and inventory regional soil carbon it also establishes a national soil carbon network so that farmers can access local data without disclosing proprietary information to determine which practices work best to improve soil health of the $20 billion in Inflation Reduction Act conservation funding, $300 million is designated to improve soil carbon measurement. So could you provide details on how the $300 million has been spent thus far to address soil carbon MMRV? Uh, it's been set up uh, in, a, uh, in a multitude of ways, uh, Congressman. Uh, to establish basically not only soil carbon uh, monitoring network, which is a series of pilots, a series of locations across the country where we can do exactly what you're asking us to do to learn regionally what the differences might be. We're also setting up a greenhouse gas emission network to do the same, uh, same similar work. We're gonna take information, try to figure out are there better ways to manage the data better ways to use technology, better ways to use artificial intelligence and so forth to be able to analyze the information. Um, and from that, we want to be able to convert that into better tools and models for, for producers across the country to be able to utilize so that they have a better sense of, for their farm, for their operation, what works and what doesn't work. So there's a, a, a rather coordinated effort within USDA in a, a number of mission areas to essentially use these resources to get data, to analyze the data, and convert it into meaningful tools for producers. I want to turn to the interest in solar uh, for just a moment on agriculture land specifically, or agrivoltaics. Um, this is rapidly increasing as we strive to achieve our renewable energy goals. However, I represent some of the most fertile land in the world. Um, I have producers today that say, what are we supposed to do when we have an offer for $1,200 an acre for, for solar on our, on our farms? Mr. Secretary, can you elaborate on some of the reasons why it's essential that we develop sound regional guidance that identifies the best practices for where we put solar in agriculture? Well, I think it, it, 
it's an opportunity for non-productive land to be more productive. And so identifying where that is uh, and encouraging the location. One of the things we're doing with our PACE and New Era program was to have a series of listening sessions to address this issue of where does it make sense uh, to have large scale uh, solar operations and where doesn't it make sense so that people are sensitive to this. I think it's also a, an issue of technology. What we're learning now is that people are beginning to look at a different configuration of solar farms so that you could essentially have a solar farm right. and a livestock operation simultaneously. So I think there's a combination of things that we need to be doing here. There's so much ahead and the all of, of the above approach is important. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I wanna conclude with this. Today there's a significant concern uh, regarding the impact that proposed cuts uh, by the House GOP to the IRA cons conservation funding and thrifty food pr plan reevaluation will have on both small town businesses and our farm families. To my colleagues and my families back home, rating programs that invest in high demand conservation and nutrition initiatives like SNAP do not achieve a bipartisan farm bill but instead they hurt the people who are struggling today. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has committed to finding billions of dollars outside of the Senate Agriculture Committee's jurisdiction to help us pass a bipartisan farm bill in the Senate. I urge my colleagues to bring this. Working families across our country depend on it. Family farmers depend on it. Kids depend on it. And Mr. Secretary, it's my hope that we can get a bipartisan farm bill across the finish line because it is that important. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, now recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, um, the Chiefs King of Congress, Mr. Van Orden. That is correct. Days. Write that down, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for coming. It's been a very long day. And uh, so what I'd like to do is I just, I, I'm a freshman, so you know I'm at the, the tail end of everything. So I just solicited a bunch of my constituents and so they're good. these questions are coming directly from my constituents. The, the first one's gonna come from Organic Valley, which is headquartered in Lafarge, Wisconsin. It is not some uh, left coast thing. That is from the middle of my district. It's awesome. And, and here's what they, they wanna ask you. Um, Secretary Vilsack, dairy is an economic engine for the upper Midwest and provides bountiful nutrition for millions of Americans. We're very glad that the House has passed the Whole Milk for Healthy Kids Act, which is awesome. We need more milk options for schools and uh, uh, making sure that they can have whole milk if they choose to. I'm really interested in solving the problems and leveraging private industry to make investments in dairy. One of the efforts USDA offers is the Dairy Business Innovation Initiative, and these initiatives convene farmers, industrial partners, academia to tackle production, processing, marketing, at the marketing needs of the dairy industry specific to each initiative's coverage area. Focused on enhancing the capacity and vitality of the dairy industry, the programs offer grants to industry participants. We'd like to know how strong is the demand for the DBIs, and can you tell us how many projects are funded? That's the first part. How many applications are received? The second part. How much funding is requested by companies and farmers applying? and how we are measuring the effectiveness of each DBI. I think I understand the question. Yep. And if I don't, and I don't answer it, uh, we'll be glad to get the answer. Very well. I believe there are four of these in the country. Yep. Uh, we allocated $20 million to each of the four, yep. and they make decisions based on where those resources need to be allocated. Okay. So that they would have the information in terms of the number of grants and specific uh, 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 investments. So okay. we, we don't control, once we give the resources to the Innovation Center, it's the Innovation Center that makes the determination. So if we could get that information from these guys later, or if you could help us do that, I'd appreciate it greatly. Here's the next one. We've heard from our uh, organic dairy farmers and organic milk buyers that the federal milk marketing orders offer no benefit or value for organic milk and have no bearing on day-to-day -day organic milk prices. The most recent FMMO hearings that concluded this past month did not review a proposal to exempt organic milk from pooling obligations, leaving hundreds of organic farmers frustrated and disappointed. Is the USDA willing to hear a proposal and establish a hearing on the role of organic milk in the federal milk marketing orders? I mean, the challenge is that uh, is the underpinning of a milk marketing order is participation by dairy producers. Um, and I think it's a complicated question they're asking. 
that would require us to kind of think about ways in which it wouldn't necessarily compromise or jeopardize the, the traditional dairy producer uh, if we were to set up a separate uh, program. Uh, we'll see what happens with the, fil uh, the uh, federal milk marketing order hearing that just concluded. Yep. Over 12,000 pages of transcript now being reviewed. Uh, and sir, I, I've got a couple more for the guys. So, um, this is from our hog producers. Um, they are losing an average of $30 per head due to high input costs. What can the USDA do to support our hog producers to ensure that they can pass on these operations to the next generation? We, we continue to purchase, purchase pork uh, through our surplus programs. We continue to promote pork exports. I mean, that's two ways of, of providing assistance and help. Okay. And then where do you stand on Prop 12 in California? Where do I stand on it? What are your thoughts? I know it went to the Supreme Court and said Congress should act. I agree with the Supreme Court. We should be acting. I, I, the problem is that if essentially every state can do this, and I think it's chaotic. It's going to be chaotic. Okay. Um, and then uh, the Wisconsin Farm Bureau would like uh, us to highlight the change in dairy pricing for me has negatively affected dairy farmers across the country, and Wisconsin is losing about one dairy farm a day. Many of my constituents and are asking the USDA to use their emergency powers to change the dairy pricing formula from the average of to the higher of. Uh, no one's testified in opposition to changing this formula. The USDA is considering making the change through the FMMO hearing process that just concluded. We talked about that. Unfortunately, they're, they're on step five of 12 in the process. Dairy farmers can't wait till 2025. Do you support accelerating this process? You know, that, I, I'm not prepared to answer that question because I, I, I need to have a better understanding of exactly what you're asking. Okay. What I would do is give you this, uh, which will uh, provide you the, some information on how we're helping the dairy industry. Okay. Uh, the pretty significant amount of help that we are in. Well, we thank are. you, sir. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, I have several more questions I'd like to enter for the record. They're coming from our corn growers. Without objection. All right. Thank you very much, sir. And I yield back. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Uh, now, please recognize the general lady from Michigan. Um, I have to say, an early co-sponsor of Whole Milk for Healthy Kids, Congresswoman Slotkin, for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you're almost done. You're getting down to the dregs of us here, so um, uh, almost, almost out. Um, Mr. Secretary, you've answered it in a couple different ways, but just to put a sharper point on it, um, uh, my my questions have to do with this concept of foreign ownership of American uh, land, farmland. Last time you were here in March, I asked you about this. You, you were um, you pushed back that you know for in a state like Michigan, majority of foreign land is owned by the Canadians by far, the Dutch, you know, folks who are friends. Um, but since then, the GAO and others have come out. I think you've heard a bipartisan concern about adversarial states, a very small handful of states who we could have a potential problem with down the road. Um, myself and Representative Feenstra from this committee put together um, something that we tried to make real, um, which is that um, when a foreign entity from an adversarial country tries to buy farmland, they would just go through a national security review. This is exactly what happens if farmland right now wants to be sold to a foreign country of any kind next to a military base. I'm from the Department of Defense. So we have a process, but it's just very limited. Um, how do you think about a process where it wouldn't, we wouldn't be clamping down and saying no unilaterally, but there would be a national security review of the sale of foreign farm, foreign, to foreigners of farmland? Yeah, we, uh, I've suggested that USDA ought to be part of the CFIUS process, which is a, an extension of your question. I think that would be fine. Okay, and a part of that bill is giving you a seat at the table on CFIUS, which is our longstanding uh, process. Uh, I, I think it would be great um, if there was a bill that you liked, um, and then we could push forward, since I do think it's a bipartisan issue. Um, the second question, you know, from Michigan, we're, our, our tagline now is we are um, the most diverse agricultural state in the country with regular access to water, right? That's our little, that's our dig at California. Um, and um, um, and it, because of that, you know that we have cherry farmers, stone fruit, fruit farmers, asparagus, mint. We have a ton of smaller farmers, not monocropping. Um, and the number one issue they raise with me when I sit with them is the cost, reliability, and availability of labor, right? Our kids don't go and work on farms anymore in the summer in the same ways. 
Um, so getting that H2A program um, uh, is a vital for our farmers. Um, and they keep talking to me about the mandatory increases in the wages for those coming to work on their farms. Not that they don't want people to make decent wages, but how are we asking them to increase year over year when their profits aren't going up, right? Just kind of basic bake sale math. Um, we've talked with the Secretary of Labor about this, but can you confirm, do you have any tools in your toolkit as the Secretary of Agriculture that would be able to provide waivers, for instance, for our smallest farms, for little guys who just can't afford these increases? Uh, we don't have that, but what we did do is create this farm uh, labor stabilization pilot with $63 million from the American Rescue Plan and put it out there for producers of all kinds and all sizes in all states. Uh, we got over 300 applications uh, for assistance, and we're in the process of trying to figure out among those 300 uh, operations who, who is going to get uh, resources. And what, what struck me in connection with this was that most of the people applying wanted to have a higher threshold in terms of wage levels, in terms of health care, in terms of housing for their, for their employees. Uh, we, we expected them to go in sort of the base level where the cost would be significantly less, but we had more applications at the higher level, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, but that program is closed, right? There's not a relief program for current small there, farmers. We, we, don't have, we don't have anything available uh, okay. as you suggested. It's just hard as someone who is in the executive branch and a national security person to understand that there's literally no special authority to make very very rare decisions for the Secretary of Agriculture, the Secretary of Labor, um, all these folks, it, 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 you can understand how farmers feel like it's a bureaucratic answer that, well, we can't do anything, we can't do anything. Are you sure there is not a special authority that you have for waivers or to do something more on this issue? Have you looked at every legal possibility? I have. Okay. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you why it's frustrating to have these questions asked. Yeah because you all had the ability to get this solved. And farmers had the ability to get this solved by supporting the Farm Worker Modernization Act, which would have capped yep. a level, but it didn't get through. Why didn't it get through? Politics. Yeah, and I'm a co-sponsor of that bill. Okay, well, thank you for your attention to the issue and thanks for being here. I yield back. The general lady, and for the record, it did pass out of the House. I know it did, with a bipartisan oh. vote. <laughs> bipartisan vote, and it had a majority of members in the and Senate. And it got hung up in the Senate. On Frustrating. First, unfortunately, some of the, the more difficult points, or just a few, were not addressed in the Senate. Now, please recognize a gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Miller, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Ranking Member, Mr. Secretary, it's good to see you again. I remember uh, the first comments you gave me, that I'm always the last, usually the last person to go here, is you're a very patient young man. Well, I got to tell you, Mr. Secretary, you're a very patient secretary, uh, <laughs> so thank you. Um, agriculture is one of Ohio's largest industries, and our state ranks ninth in the nation in the number of farms. However, I've heard firsthand from farmers and livestock producers in my congressional district and through local leaders in my agriculture advisory council key concerns impacting farm economies throughout the Northeast Ohio region. More troubling is the U.S. Department of Agriculture's most recent farm income forecast released just last week, indicating a 25.5% decrease in farm income from 23, and I know that was touched on earlier. Major priorities I've heard resound from our region's farmers include strengthening the farm safety net, ensuring viable access to risk management tools, incentive-based conservation initiatives, innovative technology, research, expanding biofuels, trade market promotion, safeguarding animal health, USDA meat inspection partnerships, robust career technical education, including training tools to lift the underserved and key areas to strengthen Ohio's farm economy. I have several questions, including the rising agricultural trade deficit of $30 billion and loss of trade opportunities expanding crop markets through sustainable aviational fuels, including my bipartisan bicameral Farm to Fly Act and critical Greek modeling updates. And on behalf of the Ohio Department of Agriculture, concerns related to cost share partnerships and meat inspections. If we are not able uh, to cover all of my questions today, which I, I know that we're not, uh, I'm going to submit them. And I, I, I would respectfully ask if you guys could uh, give us a response in writing. So, uh, trade. While international trade is critical to Ohio and United States agricultural producers, USDA's most recent outlook for the U.S. agricultural trade signaled the agricultural trade deficit nearly doubled last year, rising to $30 billion. 
Straining the ability of the U.S. producers to meet global food demands, the USDA report detailed trade losses is driven by reductions in grain and feed, livestock, poultry, and dairy exports. For this reason, I am working with several of my colleagues, including Representatives Duarte, Craig, and Feenstra, on a letter to you and Ambassador <coughs> Tai, seeking U.S. strong leadership in global agricultural trade. Mr. Secretary, finally, I get to the question. Uh, I'm out of breath. So, Mr. Secretary, for roughly 60 years, the U.S. ran an agricultural trade surplus. Well, that is no longer the case, and over 30 major U.S. farm organizations through the President's Export Council have called to expand export market opportunities for United States food and agriculture. Can you please detail your plans to address this trade deficit and empower American producers to remain leaders in the global trade market? Uh, we recently announced our uh, regional agriculture promotion program designed to expand opportunities in some of the lesser known market opportunities which we think will allow us to diversify so we're no longer as uh, t totally reliant on China. Uh, the reality is when the Chinese economy suffers, uh, basically uh, exports suffer. Uh, when, we're, when our economy is stronger than any other economy in the, in, in the industrialized world, uh, our consumers are able to purchase more, world's consumers are able to purchase less, that impacts exports. Um, the fact that we, for too many years, ignored our infrastructure needs, allowed our competitors to catch up with us. Now we're trying to address the infrastructure needs. That's also part of it. But we did put this uh, RAP program together in an effort to try to invest in more presence, more trade missions, more promotions, more ability to get the word out about U.S. products. Uh, I think we will be cost competitive, and I think you're going to continue to see uh, an uptick in exports. Uh, we did have record years in exports the last couple of years, uh, and I expect and anticipate that we will get uh, we will get that surplus back. But it's going to take a day, a year or two. Yeah, and, and thank you for that detailed answer. And I know you look at this through this lens, and I'm speculating, so I shouldn't speak for you or anybody else. But uh, with trade comes national security implications in terms of strengthening our, our relationships with foreign countries. And all I ask is that we continue to explore any of those opportunities as the world is how it is right now and looking to strengthen our relationships with just people around the globe I think is extremely beneficial. Uh, I'm just going to go right into what I just talked about earlier about agriculture and meat inspection cost share. I'm just going to go right to the question, Mr. Secretary. Given the critical nature of broadening meat inspection capabilities, which I understand has been a priority to this administration, what options is USDA considering providing the maximum 50 percent reimbursement to state meat inspection programs? Well, if we have a budget, we're in a position to do more. So well, pass the budget. I'm going to go ahead and say it's going to be an impossible task right now. Okay. Uh, second, um, actually, we're out of time, Mr. Secretary. I have the questions. I'll submit them to you. Thank you for your time and thank you for your patience. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Now I recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Molinaro, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, I was uh, happy to have you visit the uh, east part of upstate New York's 19th Congressional District. I'd welcome you back to the west part of upstate New York's 19th Congressional District. Cornell, Ithaca, and uh, a lot of rural communities would, uh, would love to have you uh, visit. Um, you know, I, I come from a local government background, um, and uh, I continue to hear uh, from uh, municipal uh, leaders and community leaders uh, about the lack of access to technical assistance for rural development grants through the USDA. You kind of addressed this, I, I think, in a good-natured way. I'd like to return to the, the question, though. Uh, by nature, rural, rural de development grants are intended to support rural communities. And of course, in many cases, they don't have the technical expertise or the staff uh, or even the time to uh, fulfill uh, those uh, grant application requirements. So right now, the USDA, as you know, continues to announce uh, new pools of funding. Uh, available for everything from energy uh, to infrastructure, manufacturing, and beyond. Uh, but the fundamental problem still exists. I think you recognize this. Small municipalities and farmers don't have the capacity to access, access uh, these programs. And uh, sadly, uh, funding is being distributed unevenly and in many ways inefficiently. Um, could you uh, discuss with us uh, why, would, why would USDA uh, uh, announce uh, new initiatives, some authorized, some not, uh, without having the capacity to assist uh, uh, farmers and municipalities, and, and how might that be rem remedied? Well, with due respect, Congressman, I don't think that's accurate. Uh, I think we have invested in expanded, uh, through expanded cooperative agreements and contracts with a number of organizations and entities that are helping farmers and all, of, all across the country being able to access programs and assist, uh, assist them in, in basically applying for uh, programs. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't think that this is anecdotal. It's certainly not in New York. Uh, farmers have consistently seen uh, the inability to access that technical assistance. We, and while, 
we, we've got literally over 100 organizations that we're contracting with on the NRCS, 30 organizations that we're contracting with with uh, FSA. Uh, so the, the assistance is there and the help is there. Uh, we're also, uh, as part of a, a number of the new initiatives, we have uh, set aside, as I said earlier, a series of resources to be able to provide for technical assistance. And plus, as I'm a, I was a mayor of a small town, so I, I, I came from a local government background also. And what I do know is that many, many states have regional economic development uh, uh, councils, councils of government, basically that basically provide that service. I, I'm surprised that New York doesn't have those kinds of uh, regional uh, local government assistant programs to basically help with the grant writing. Have you, I mean, I don't know if, uh, I can't imagine that New York doesn't have those. New York programs. does not have an institution for municipal assistance when it comes to grant writing, but I'm, I'm, I'm heartened to hear that, that you don't believe there's, a, there's additional need to meet, that, to meet those, uh, those, those new initiatives. Uh, I just would say again that, that without question farmers and communities have consistently said this uh, to me, certainly now in this role, but uh, I experienced it as a county executive and village mayor myself. Um, but um, uh, we're, we've all, I, let me should also say we're, we're simplifying the process. We've cut the application process, for example, for loans in half. We've created a loan assistance program. We're using technology in our website to maybe make it a little bit easier. So we have simplified the program. I appreciate that. Uh, I would uh, encourage uh, then uh, the continued earnest look at making those uh, greater efficiencies and uh, certainly we'll communicate uh, where we think in the state, uh, certainly in New York, there, there, there are some concerns. I, I did want to ask uh, at least one other question, uh, one area of obvious concern for us uh, in upstate New York is, as it relates uh, to our dairy farms and fair uh, milk pricing. Uh, with the uh, recent conclusion of the FMM, excuse me, FMMO hearing, farmers are anxiously waiting for a final determination from the USDA, uh, with some optimism that, class, uh, that the class one mover will be restored to the higher of the pricing system. Can you um, provide to us any insight as to the next steps for the USDA uh, and uh, estimated timeline for a decision announcement? Uh, an analysis of over 12,000 pages of transcript, uh, hundreds of exhibits uh, needs to be analyzed and reviewed by, uh, by their folks at USDA and the economists and so forth at USDA. That's going to take some time, but our expectation is that we're going to try to get this done this year. So your estimation is sometime is within the next uh, uh, 10, 10 to 11 months? Uh, sooner than that, probably. Okay. Uh, we'd, uh, I, I certainly would follow up uh, as uh, it's of, uh, of concern to, to obviously many farmers across America, but, but upstate New York struggling uh, in this space as well. Uh, with that, uh, I'll submit some additional questions, Mr. Secretary. Again, uh, we have an open invitation to, uh, to visit the west end of uh, upstate New York. Uh, uh, the folks at Cornell would love to see you. Thank you. Gentleman yells back. Now, please recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Congresswoman Kamek, for five minutes of questioning. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for coming before the committee. I'll jump right into it. As my, my colleagues and I here on this committee have repeatedly said, food security is national security. And it's important that we do everything we can to support and protect American grown products. Now, as you know, unfair competition from foreign imports is a growing problem for our producers. And specifically in Florida, without seasonal or perishable protections, this is a growing concern. We know that Mexico has unfair schemes targeting Florida producers specifically. And I know that many of my colleagues have raised similar issues on everything from peaches and honey and apple juice from China to seafood from Russia, all of which is ending up in American schools. So specifically, what is USDA doing to ensure that American grown pro uh, products are being served in American schools? And is there a requirement for American grown products to be used in schools? Uh, there there is a requirement that, uh, that food that we purchase has to be produced and processed and, uh, and everything aspect of it being done in the U.S. Okay. Now, what are you doing to ensure that that is in fact happening? Because as I've just laid out, we're finding products from all over the world, from Russia and China, et cetera, in, in, in our school systems. Uh, well, if you want to give us information about the specific schools, we'll be more than happy to take a look at, at that specific uh, circumstance, uh, you know, we, we have a process in which we, uh, through our food and nutrition service, uh, ensure, do the best we can uh, to ensure that the purchases mm -hmm. that are being made are consistent with uh, the rules and regulations of FNS. So I'll tell you what, by the end of the quarter, you and I can have a conversation and I'll make sure my team gets the data to yours and we can go through that. 
Right. I, I'd be very interested in the, the names of the school districts that, you, that, uh, that you've alluded to so that we could take a, a deeper dive into that, that okay. particular area. Perfect. Now, um, moving on, according to FSA staff, as of February 9th, there are currently 1,550 applications for ECP assistance with the USDA that are either approved and not paid, not approved, or still pending in the wake of Hurricanes Ian and Idalia. Now, you and I have chatted about this on, offline, uh, but it's been a year and a half since Hurricane Ian and six months since Idalia. While the local FSA staff has been very helpful, the few that we have, and we know that that is also an issue, the ability to process these applications in the aftermath, it's simply put just inadequate, and it's unacceptable. Mr. Secretary, can you explain the delays in our producers getting the assistance when they need it the most? Uh, I, we are doing the very level best we can to get the resources out. I mean, I know that you wanted to uh, ensure that uh, the state would be allowed to do this block grant process. And you know what? If you authorize it, if the Congress creates the opportunity for this, we'll be more than happy to, to utilize that program. But in the meantime, we, we are doing the best we can with the resources that we have. Well, and I will say there is certain flexibilities um, and liberties that you as secretary can take to make programs a little bit more flexible and get the money out the door faster. So I would encourage you to utilize that authority. Um, in your written testimony, you mentioned that the Biden administration's historic investments have allowed USDA the opportunity to ensure small and mid-sized producers get a fair shake. Those are your words. However, other agencies in this administration are proposing burdensome regulations, and if finalized, and some of them already have been, that will regulate these very producers that you're saying that you want to protect, it's going to regulate them out of business. Some examples of the regulations include Waters of the U.S., or WOTUS as we call it, uh, the affluent limitation guidelines and standards for meat and poultry products, animal waste, air emissions reporting, uh, the politicization of uh, crop protection tools, the SEC climate disclosure rule, or just a few. Um, heck, I had the administrator of the EPA tell me to my face, point blank, that he had no idea what contour terracing was or vegeta vegetative filter strips were. And yet his agency is mandating them for the producers that we're here to try to protect and support. So Mr. Secretary, from my vantage point, it appears as though other agencies in this administra administration are playing in USDA's sandbox, and they're wanting to dictate what producers grow and how they do it. So instead of advocating for farmers and ranchers as intended, USDA is laser focused on expanding and funding policies related to what they believe to be climate smart. Now, you've testified multiple times, including before this very committee, that you don't want other agencies to tell you how to do your job. Yet at every other opportunity, other agencies are telling our farmers and ranchers how to do theirs. So you end your written testimony asking if we are okay losing another 400,000 family farms in the next 30 years. However, overregulation by the other agencies in this administration outside of the USDA are exactly they're on the path to do exactly what your your testimony is outlining. So instead of idly standing by, I would encourage and implore you to take a very active role within this administration of which you serve to advocate for farmers and ranchers, not only in your department, but across the other agencies that are pushing our producers out of business. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'm over my time. I yield back. General Lee's time has expired. <coughs> Seeing no other uh, questions to uh, be asked by members uh, <coughs> before we <coughs> join today, adjourn today, I want to uh, offer my closing comments. Uh, 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 Ranking Member Scott had an unavoidable conflict and uh, was not able to be here for, uh, um, <coughs> for his closing comments. Um, <coughs> first, uh, Mr. Secretary, I want to uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, uh, you're Quite frankly, the mastery of the tremendous width and breadth of the issues of agriculture, which is um, uh, the industry itself, it's so complex. Uh, there's so much there, and and I, you know, you're <coughs> to be uh, commended and appreciated for your mastery of that information. I think we we share the same goal um, that at the end of the day we want a highly effective farm bill. Uh, I think the case has been made for that. You've made the case for that. 
uh, every member on this committee I talk with makes the, the case for that. Um, and, and I think we have worked together to achieve, uh, from a policy perspective, uh, that, uh, that end goal. Uh, where, we, uh, where we disagree, perhaps, is quite frankly, we, we, have, to, we have to find a way to pay for it. Um, and so uh, it's, uh, it's kind of a pipe dream to, um, and it would be a shame, the, the good bipartisan work that we've done. Um, I want to thank our members for participation. We had almost everyone. Uh, <coughs> um, and thank our staffs for uh, uh, doing such a great job of, uh, of putting this together. I do question whoever's in charge of the heat in the room. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm about frostbite here. So uh, um, the... Uh, uh, as, a, as I close, <coughs> there are a few points I, I want to make. I, I heard a number of times about, quote, the inability to pass a farm bill. Um, and I just have to say that agriculture policy, the agriculture industry, takes teamwork. Um, and we all need to be working as a team. Um, and quite frankly, there's a, probably a lot of reasons why we haven't got, got a farm bill done, let alone the, the fact that this farm bill needs to pass... Uh, has to be uh, the Senate has to take action and reconcile. That's hanging out there, and I, I don't, I, I don't know how soon they're going to be ready. Um, <coughs> but that said, you know we need. We're still waiting on USDA technical assistance. We have at least a dozen uh, requests that have been submitted at least six months ago. Uh, we're still waiting on um, now, and we've gotten great technical assistance, but we still they're still pending. Uh, from USDA, and we need to have that technical assistance to make sure that we're on track with, with great policy, highly effective policy. Where uh, CBO has come along, but, but uh, there still needs, they still have their work that they need to complete. Um, and, and by law, we can't really proceed uh, without them. And then, quite frankly, we have a syndrome that's going on in this committee, and, and I would say in all the, in key, and, uh, uh, in the executive branch, we have funding denial, um, and I'll come back to that. Uh, we, uh, for the record, this committee has not been idle. Each one of, uh, each member here has been invited to the countryside to hear from the very people that we're <coughs> charged to represent. And I've been very appreciative and thankful for the bipartisan participation um, that we have done over the past uh, three years. Um, Thousands of miles, uh, meetings, roundtables, uh, visits on, as was illustrated today, on farms, seeing agriculture in action. Um, and that's how you build a great farm bill. You make it tripartisan. It's, it's Democrats, Republicans, and quite frankly, the industry. And those are the voices that we have brought to the table. Um, we've actively engaged uh, our members in a bipartisan way of actually actively engaged in roundtables and discussions to build a bipartisan product uh, when it comes to policy. We've also heard uh, uh, today a lot of cherry-picked data points, and there's a lot of data out there to pick from. I get that. But attempts, <coughs> attempts to paint the farm economy as positive. Uh, the department's own analysis shows a very different story. And when you spend time with as many different farmers and ranchers, key stakeholders in rural America, it's a different story today. They're struggling. Um, I've also gathered this administration continues to demonize farmers, frankly, of all sizes, <coughs> in cases where they do not subscribe to a far-left climate agenda. Now, I think hopefully everybody in this room and, mo and most people watching in uh, know that I'm, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that our, our farmers and ranchers, quite frankly, are climate champions. Um, I, we don't give them credit for what they do already. And I'm all in favor of in knowing that American agriculture can be defined as science, technology, and innovation. It is not static. It's dynamic, and we will move it forward. And we'll move it forward with this farm bill. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, the, uh, uh, but the fact is uh, that, uh, you know, to, to do that, there, there, there are good ways to do that, and then there's ways that really aren't helping uh, the American farmer. Uh, <clears throat> instead, this administration is embracing continued inflation, uh, record costs for production, and, and I, I appreciate there are some of the things we've talked about have come down a little bit, but they are not down to where they were 
uh, to that in past years. Uh, and really the destruction, what leads to the destruction of the agricultural landscape. You know, that's, that's, I guess that's a complex way of saying the loss of those family farms that we've all noted that have gone out of business and the threats to lose more in the future. I also uh, heard that a historically uneventful market basket update has been uh, proudly manipulated to solely allow Democrats to increase the welfare state. And the recently submitted chart for the record from my colleague is disingenuous. Uh, using a distortion of CBO's data really is partisanship at best. Uh, for those who will take the time, uh, and it's not like there hasn't been ample opportunity to read uh, the proposal. By the way, the only credible proposal is put forward for funding this farm bill, which includes you know, being prescriptive, uh, providing Article I authority in, in terms of, and not in an abusive way, of, of, of how a future thrifty food plan is, um, is evaluated. Um, I heard so many times the word cuts when it comes to that proposal for, <coughs> for being prescriptive of the thrifty food plan. What's disingenuous is, is the, the leading factor in terms of hunger for many families uh, that are struggling really in poverty um, is uh, the cost of living, the impact of inflation and just other factors you know, supply chain disruptions, things that would drive up the, the, the cost of living. Cost of living adjustments is not being taken away in this proposal. So, and if it's, that's the primary driver of increased costs and, and financial burden on these families, it is disingenuous, and that's being nice. I can think of a few other words of, of saying that this, the, our proposal uh, makes uh, cuts. Um, and a lot, of, uh, a lot of talk about USDA's climate smart pilot, none of, uh, which quite frankly would be better done uh, not by using CCC, which should be there to directly help our farmers in, uh, who are challenged financially. I would say that fits much better under the re uh, what's been rolled out by, by USDA uh, under research. And, and, and I think there's a, well, I'm pretty confident there's a bipartisan consensus we need to invest more in research. I mean, we're still way ahead of our competitors around the world, but they're spending more on an annual basis, and they'll soon catch us. And that's not where we want to be with American agriculture. But so I would, I would say a, a better route would have been to work with us uh, through the research title. Um, the uh, um, uh, the um, uh, quite frankly, it's a unilateral insertion of USDA into the private marketplace costing billions in taxpayer dollars with zero metrics for success and zero transparency and a self-imposed fiscal cliff. Uh, uh, and that includes the IRA monies. 2031, whatever's not spent, and I, we hope it's all spent in an accountable way as an investment, not just to get it out the door, all those remaining dollars go away. Uh, the proposal we put on the table means that by rolling it into the farm bill base, uh, that money for conservation would be there for farm bills in 2050 and 2055. Um, the, uh, the, the, you know, the, it, it would continue to grow and, and increase investments. Um, also frustrated by the fact that, uh, of the lack of an answer, but and we'll follow up personally with you on this. Um, um, when asked about the Sustains Act, you talked about the interest. Well, we know there's interest because that's how we built that piece of legislation that President Biden signed, and now it's 14 months ago. Um, and if we're really serious about getting investments into conservation, then we would want to bring the private sector to the table, and I think we'll come in a big way, but that's not going to happen until the regulations for implementation is written. And um, in 14 months, at a time where we all know that conservation is so important, it is too long. To my friends on the other side of the aisle, unfortunately, uh, your leadership has been hesitant to share with you how my proposed funding framework <coughs> will actually help meet your priorities. For example, the number, your number one priority is to reduce hunger. I would agree, that's, that's incredibly important. Um, and the proposal, which I'd Freely admit is a budget gimmick. I don't understand how CBO gets $30 billion out of, uh, out of this. 
uh, but it allows us to provide SNAP to populations. We could actually expand SNAP to populations that for decades uh, have had limited or no access to SNAP. So we actually can increase access to people that have not been eligible for it. Um, and quite frankly, we maintain it once again, the cost of living adjustments, uh, which means we're not cutting benefits. Uh, there's no intent to cut benefits. Uh, I think that's exactly what reducing hunger means, ex uh, those expansion. Uh, and to do that and to be able to have that kind of a pay for. Um, and also what seems to, no to not be translating is that to, if we put this in place, the next administration, and there will be at some point a future administration that may be more inclined, I hope not, because I'm a big supporter, as you know, of the nutrition title, that may be inclined to decimate individual SNAP benefits, our proposal for funding would prevent that from occurring because it would be prescriptive, staying within the lines. Now we have almost unanimous support for the doubling of MAP and FMD, market access for, your, for our constituents, uh, directed by Congress instead of the whims of any administration. All members appreciate the depth and breadth of conservation programs and we will reinvest the IRA to continue the great work of our original conservationists, the farmer, uh, but we want to do that for more than a 10-year window. Uh, research and scholarships are a given. Dollars will be made available to ensure our institutions have the tools to thrive. So the list goes on and on. I would like to insert into the record a list of Democratic priorities um, that I have here somewhere. Here it is. Um, uh, sent to me by the New Dem Coalition is just one example of the litany of requests that we're <coughs> trying to accommodate. This is a list of 125 bills or priorities, and it does carry a significant price tag, billions of dollars, and it will require the ability to move mandatory dollars into our current baseline. So, uh, so which is it? You know, do we, uh, you know, for, e for all my colleagues, do you want to, uh, do you want your priorities funded or not? We need to be at the table, not just on building great policy, which I think we've done over the past number of years. Um, we gotta be at the, pol at the table figuring out um, how we fund those, because without the funding, they're, they're not gonna be a reality. The funding framework I propose is very thoughtful, balanced, and will not disrupt existing programs or benefits. I would argue in the long run, they're actually gonna be beneficial uh, for ex uh, expanding um, the, um, uh, the benefits uh, that we see under these programs. And uh, the leadership of each and every person uh, uh, and your leadership says that these will not work. Uh, well, your leadership says that these will not work. So, uh, so quite frankly, send me your realistic pay-fors. Because blaming the speaker does not offer a real solution for f farmers, small or large, or rural America. And with that... Um, under the rules of the committee, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days to receive additional materials and supplemental written responses from the witnesses to any question posed by a member. This hearing of the Committee on Agriculture is adjourned.